Um, so good morning, and uh, especially a good morning to all the students who are presenting their honors thesis this morning. I, I want to congratulate you, uh, especially on doing independent research in such an extraordinarily unusual uh, year. And it was such a pleasure yesterday to see some of the talks and the exceptional quality, as always, and upholding that quality under under these circumstances. Um, I just want to give a, well, yeah, we'll switch to that in a moment, but just first, I just want to give a special thanks to Sophia and Anna and for overseeing the Honor Symposium, um, not just this year, but for several years now, uh, to all of the advisors, for, to each of you, I want to just thank on their, on your behalf, your advisors who have uh, helped you through in the last four years, to the mentors, the faculty who've uh, supported the projects, I'm very grateful, and then most of all, to you all, and in addition to congratulations and appreciation for the work you did, uh, con that congratulations as well on your graduation. And I know we'll have to do that online as well. Uh, I do hope that you have a chance, if you're in the Bay Area and in the mood to walk across the stage at the Greek Theater, they're actually asking, they're asking deans and senior leadership to sign up for slots. So I'll be there Monday afternoon putting scrolls on the table as students walk by, but of course we couldn't coordinate it so that we could do it at the same time as students from the college. Um, so again, thank you all, really nice to be here. And before we continue, we'll go to the next slide. I do wanna start and offer a land acknowledgement and on behalf of the college, uh, we recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Huchin, the ancestral and unceded land of the Chochenyu Ohlone, the successors of the historic and sovereign Verona band of, the, of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Ohlone people. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land, and that includes its use for research and student learning. So again, thank you very much, and I'll turn it over to Sophia. Thank you, Akali. It's always a pleasure to have you open the festivities because you set the stage and you acknowledge the ex excellent teamwork that everybody uh, working together puts this all into an excellent uh, research showcasing. And I hope people attending, family and friends, realize that so much work was put into this. Um, and But the center of all of this is your, your students. Um, I would like to thank Anna, especially, for spearheading this, this program. Uh, it brings together people from a lot of departments and lots of majors but research is like where such different research is being done and yet there's common themes as you will see today um, I'm really trying to put do page down sorry about that <laughs> um, so I would like to give you just some background so that you know that you are indeed standing on shoulders of giants here um, Professor Tassio Malis uh, devised the honors program in 1993-1994 academic year and he presented all the logistics of what he envisioned. So you all went through the program and for those that don't know, the students enroll in two courses, one each semester, four unit courses. This is a maximum of units that people take classes at Berkeley at. So this is a serious course load where they work on their independent research project and under the guidance of mentors, typically professors, graduate students, or uh, other affiliates, sometimes not even at Berkeley. The whole purpose of this is facilitate research. It's not bureaucracy. So if you have something that you like to work with, we make it happen. As you will see, we have mentors coming from outside our college and they show up. Um, it was first instituted in 1995 with one student. <laughs> Today, I have to tell you that we are 63 in the spring of uh, 2021, which is spectacular. One of the requirements of this program is to present your work in a symposium. And typically we would gather in Morgan Hall, um, which is a room in the bottom where everybody comes and presents it in person. So we cannot do that this year, but we'll mimic the whole experience today online. And maybe some people can participate that otherwise could not be in person at Berkeley. Um, just to give you an idea of the progress, we now hold the symposia. These presenters have opportunities to present in the spring in light blue, and then in the fall in dark blue started in 2005. And you guys are the yellow bar. So you did not set the record. The record was set in 2020, but we didn't run the symposium in 2020. We just couldn't make it happen. It was just too crazy and we didn't even know how to do it well with the pandemic. It was just, remember last year, 
ah. So those guys did not have a chance to do what you did this year. So I, I'm very sorry for them it, to, to miss this opportunity to not only present, but had some feedback and stand on your feet and answer some cool questions that are typically asked. So we are 63 this year. And um, all these 63 students have the following benefits. You will have honors in your major at graduation. Um, the, the students that in the opinion of the judges that I will uh, introduce in a little bit, um, presents, uh, develops, and also narrows down a research question and a method in a very convincing way will be judged according to some numeric scores. We total up the scores along criteria among two judges. Whoever has the most points in all that tallying wins a Mellis medal. Last, uh, Yesterday, the Mellis Medal for the Social Sciences Group that happened in the afternoonish part of Thursday was awarded to Yi Yoon Moon from the Environmental Economics and Policy major. And uh, today, you are all eligible for the Biological Sciences Mellis Medal with the group that presented in the morning from yesterday. Vincent, you are in the house, and as is Chloe, I assume somewhere, <laughs> but I see Vincent in my screen. So thank you to Chloe. There she is. <laughs> Thank you to Vincent, thank you to Lynn that's going to come in the afternoon, and thank you to Ellen and Leila that were the judges yesterday. Again, thank you for all you do to allow students to be also given some feedback, which they do typically give you some feedback. And if you want to see that individual feedback, let us know and we can then email you uh, some of the suggestions that they give. So what honor student are you? What number? The first student yesterday. Uh, that was uh, Rachel Perrin, was number 777. The last student today, which is, I should remember this, but I'm totally blanking now, is number 822. So the last one, the one that's presenting last today, plus the 18 students from the Environmental Science uh, Honors Program. And, uh, no, sorry, they're in the same honors program, but they presented in their own symposium. That makes 840. That's what we're at um, in the honors um, uh, in, in our college for spring 2021. So these are you. <laughs> Thank you for sending me your photos. It's an amazing uh, collection of talent. And I'm, we are all very proud of you. And the first person to present today, where is Rachel? Uh, Waldo, <laughs> there is Rachel over here. And then comes Nicholas. And so the last person today is Alejandra Tian Smith. And then after Gloria, these are the envi env environmental sciences majors. And Yoon was the winner yesterday of the Mellis Medal in the social scientists. So social sciences. All right. Uh, one last thing, and I tried to find. I have one, but I couldn't find. I think my Giardini Hall move. That's where my commencement regalia is. So I couldn't find my courts. When you receive honors from CNR, if we were in person. We will be in Morgan Hall and your advisor, mentor or graduate student that's uh, mostly work with you would be holding the honors cords. These are it. And afterwards they would come up, give you the cords, you would hang them around your neck and, and then that's what you would wear at graduation. Um, they are being mailed to you and hopefully they come before you can walk the stage if you are in person here um, uh, at Cal. Otherwise, uh, when you have them, put on the robe, take a photo and email us and say you got it and, and keep in touch. We, we love to hear from you. Anyway, uh, keeping us in time, thank you to all the faculty mentors and especially the ones that are here um, supporting your students. The ones that are not here, shame on you. I'm kidding. Everybody's super busy. Uh, you can watch later. This is being recorded and will be on YouTube. Uh, thank you, Anna. Again, Without you, nothing would be possible. And without further ado, I will unshare my screen and ask our first presenter, uh, Rachel, to set the stage with a fantastic, um, oh, logistic wise. Presenters will have 10 minutes. If I see you're almost close to the end of your slides because I have your slides, I will let you go a little over because I know you're about to conclude but at the cost that you will not have as many questions asked and feedback. So um, try to keep it within 10 minutes because then we'll open it up to questions and allow for the transition. Um, one advantage of allowing questions is the judges may ask qu clarifying questions. Um, we will also make some signals to you. If you see us saying like this, it doesn't mean 
anything other than you have five minutes. And then two, if you're about to go over, we, we, uh, we, we say, please stop. Last resort, Anna or I will unmute and really try to stop you, but we would not like to do that. I think you can keep time. Anyway, uh, sometimes look at the chat, um, even when you're talking and you think you've been talking for a while because Anna and I may be sending you a private message saying, we will stop you from talking right now if you don't stop talking, okay? <laughs> Anything um, you want to add, Anna, please? No, we're just excited to see everyone and thank you, Rachel, for being the first person to go today. And right on time, nine o'clock, Rachel, you have the floor. All right, thank you, Sophia and Dean Ackerley for that introduction. I will now share my screen. Sorry, let me make sure. Okay. All right, so today I'm going to be talking about my honors thesis project, which was evaluating the role of motility genes in the tomato phylosphere, as well as methods development for further study. Um, so some background on this subject, uh, microbial communities are essential to the survival of their respective hosts. For plant hosts, you have two main microbial communities. There is the rhizosphere or the soil microbiome, which is mostly composed of microorganisms that fix nitrogen and acquire nutrients. And then there's the phylosphere, which represents the microbes living on the aerial surfaces of the plant or anything above the soil. And the microbiome is mostly composed of microorganisms that can help the plant, uh, can help protect the plant against disease. So the key question here is how much do phylosphere bacteria rely on motility for their survival through wind precipitation and desiccation? Uh, this morning, I remembered that my grandma would be watching this. So I was trying to think of analogies to help her understand this presentation better. So along the way, I'm actually gonna be making some comparisons and analogies to the way that humans move from place to place. So hopefully that is helpful for everyone. Um, to talk about what the literature says so far about phylosphere motility, um, express motility actually has not been shown in phylosphere bacteria up to this point. Um, and this makes sense because it is widely known that the production of flagella or these little squiggly arms that bacteria have um, they're pretty costly to produce, they take a lot of energy. So some papers have suspected that phylosphere commensal bacteria or beneficial bacteria suppress um, FLG22, which is an epitope that triggers plant immune response. Um, and there's a recent review paper that discusses how phylosphere commensal bacteria might express FLG22 to purposely trigger the plant immune system. So you have one paper that's like, oh, FLG22 is not expressed because it'll trigger the plant immune response and overwhelm the plant. And then there are other papers who say, well, no, they might actually express it to purposely trigger that immune system. So there's this kind of difference in consensus here. Um, a good news is that phylosur pathogens or disease causing bacteria have been repeatedly shown to express motility genes after producing a biosurfactant or a chemical that makes it easier to move on the leaf. Um, however, flagellar genes in commensal or beneficial bacteria have not been manipulated experimentally to confirm the effects on phylosphere survival. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to get through a lot of the experimentation of my project due to technical difficulties and COVID-19 uh, time restrictions. So I'm gonna use this time to talk about arguments for motility on the leaf and against motility on the leaf. So arguments for motility being important on the leaf, uh, phylosphere pathogens rely on motility for virulence, especially pseudomonads. So pseudomonas syringae, um, a pathogen that causes bacterial spec on tomato, which is a disease on tomato, you can see in the upper right corner. Um, flagellar motility confers epiphytic fitness advantages upon Pseudomonas syringae, and quorum sensing regulates motility as well. Um, so quorum sensing, I feel like a great analogy for this, is um, 
a lot of the seniors here today are going to be graduating and then subsequently moving to a different place. We all know that after four years, so a certain time point, uh, we all collectively, you know, signal to each other like, hey, we're graduating and we move to a different place. So quorum sensing is a signaling mechanism where bacteria collectively signal to each other to do things like move or create a biofilm, uh, which is something that protects the bacterial po uh, population from drying out. Um, so in a different experiment, it was shown that a non-motile mutant of Pseudomonas ringae was more easily killed by UV radiation on leaves than the motile uh, wild type. So that means that apparently if this bacteria can't move, it can be killed by the sun more easily. Um, and motility is also not purely utilized for movement, right? Like not everyone of us moves apartments or moves to houses to move, sometimes we move to settle down, right? So it's important to think about how motility can contribute to biofilm formation, which enhances adhesion and protects from elements. Um, but the other side of the coin is that motility may not be important at all for the leaf. Um, like I said in the beginning, motility is very costly to uh, produce in bacteria and adhesion or sticking to the leaf might be more important. Similarly, we don't really want to live in apartments for the rest of our lives, unless you're a New Yorker, maybe. Um, we all want to settle down in a house someday, right? So metabolism in a nutrient poor area, such as a leaf, uh, might be more important. The top of the leaf surface doesn't have that many nutrients. So bacteria might be more focused on uh, being able to just survive. Um, Motility has proved necessary in the soil. Um, so you can see how like such a difference in environment, soil versus leaf, could explain why motility genes aren't as expressed in leaf bacteria. Um, a more detailed point is that iron-based motility or for mediated motility is present in the soil. And um, as you might expect, the leaf doesn't possess nearly as much iron. Uh, so that kind of motility may not be present on the leaf and other nutrients necessary for motility may not be present either. So I also wanted to use this lens to interpret previous data. So in a previous experiment, I applied different concentration, um, different concentrations of a subset of our synthetic microbial community to the top or bottom side of a tomato leaf um, to see what their abundance would look like after 24 hours since the top and bottom sides of the leaf actually have pretty different environments. So I think the most interesting result here is that the low bottom and low top treatments showed different, uh, sorry, showed similar concentrations after, um, sorry, 48 hours on the leaf. And by low bottom, I mean low concentration of bacteria on the bottom surface of the leaf. So how can motility or lack thereof have played a role in these results? Um, so to tell you a little more about leaf anatomy, you have your top side, which is waxy. Um, it has smaller pores. It's pretty nutrient poor. And then you have your bottom side, which has larger pores or the stoma. Um, and there's just more places for microbes to reside there. Again, quorum sensing could play a role in population growth and adhesion or motility. So there could be a population threshold that triggers increase in reproduction. So maybe, um, these two on the right are the same because they don't, they haven't reached that population threshold yet. And maybe at a point up here or something, you get exponential growth and then you see differences in the population uh, in the high concentration treatments. So after population increase, what could contribute to sustained microbial abundance? It could be motility for biofilm formation uh, which would increase adhesion or sticking to the leaf, um, or it could be nutrient consumption, like I mentioned before. So what I did do in my experiment and what I planned to complete was the deletion of flea A, which is a flagellar gene, by uh, the lambda recombinase system. So I was supposed to transform the PUCP18 red S plasmid into one of our commensals or one of our bacteria called Erwinia tasmaniensis. And then I was also supposed to construct a PCR fragment with the canamycin resistance gene in the middle and then um, around it is actually the surrounding DNA 
around uh, the flea A gene. So with those two things inside this bacterial cell, hopefully what happens is something called homologous recombination. So the genes transcribed from this plasmid um, are actually from a, a bacteriophage or a virus that infects bacteria. And what it can do is recognize, oh, this area is the same as this area. And I can cut this out and replace this gene with that. So then your resulting uh, cell is actually a flea A knockout mutant. And instead of the flagellar gene that allows the bacteria to move, you have antibacterial resistance in, uh, sorry, antibiotic resistance instead, uh, which means that you can see this mutant growing on a plate with antibiotics. So after that, what you would do is challenge the mutant against a pathogen, uh, for example, Pseudomonas syringae in vitro in the lab and in planta on the plant. And you would, I would hopefully use spray inoculation on three to four week old tomato plants and then collect samples after 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, and one week. Um, and then I would measure the abundance of bacteria at each of these time points using digital droplet PCR, which is a common quantification that the Coscello lab uses. So what I've been able to do so far is transform the lambda red recombinase system into Erwinia tasmaniensis. So if we go back, I was able to get this circular thing into this cell, but unfortunately I wasn't able to finish anything after that. Um, this plasmid was provided courtesy of Dr. Lawrence Romney at Harvard. And what they did in their paper in 2008 is uh, transform the system into Pseudomonas aeruginosa, which is a common lung pathogen. And they used it to knock out several genes successfully. So I tried to replicate their method. Um, in a future experiment, someone could complete this protocol, construct a mutant and evaluate the effects of motility loss on phylosphere survival and disease protectiveness. And it may be worth characterizing uh, motile or movable phylosphere commensals um, they could be better competitors against motile phylosphere pathogens. So that is it for me. And I wanted to thank first and foremost, Dr. Stephen Lindau and the Lindau Lab. Um, Steve really like provided the groundwork for this research. He's heavily cited in my thesis because he uh, did most of the work on motility and phylosphere pathogens. I also wanna thank uh, Dr. Britt Koskella and the Coskello Lab. Um, thank you, Britt, for being a mentor to me for the last three years, and Elijah Melferber, my grad student mentor for the last three years. I would not be here um, without your guidance for the last three years. And then I also wanted to thank Dr. Lawrence Rami and the Rami Lab for providing the plasmids needed for this experiment. And then as well as the Plant Microbial Biology Department, Integrative Biology Department, Harvard Department of Microbiology and Molecular Genetics. Um, I also wanted to thank the sponsor program for undergraduate research at Rouser College or SPUR for funding this. And last but not least, or not last but not least, I also wanna thank the Rouser Honors Program uh, for giving me this opportunity. And then last but not least, my family for supporting me through everything. Um, yeah, so thank you. I, I will take questions now. Hi, Rachel. We have time for two very quick questions. Go, Vincent, you have your raised hand. Hi, great presentation. Um, I was wondering, even with the Lambda Red recombination system, is there a chance your resistance just gets integrated randomly? And how would you actually test for that? So that after you... Yeah, so after um, the mutant is constructed, I would make sure to sequence it to make sure that the um, mutation happened in the right place um, with the right flanking regions. Got it, thanks. Rachel, that was awesome. I have another quick question for you. If you or someone else was able to make the knockout line successfully, what pathogens would you be most interested in following up on first for comparing survival against? Yeah, so definitely Pseudomonas syringae, just because that's the pathogen of interest um, in the lab, but it would also be good to test on things like bean leaf pathogens or other uh, plant pathogens, just because plant disease becomes ever more prevalent uh, in today's society, unfortunately. 
Steve, you want to add something? All right, Rachel has really been a trooper in this whole project. It's technically a very challenging one. And uh, Rachel has really made great, great steps in bringing this tool to the lab. So she's, even though she wasn't able to complete everything and COVID really messed up her ability to get into the lab so much, I think it's a real, a real sign of a good scientist is she can work through problems that you see in the lab. And Rachel was a real trooper and, and really made great project. And I'm sure that in another couple of weeks, she would have had what she needed. Well, thank you, Steve, for all the support you give our students and especially uh, Rachel. Nicholas, you have the floor for your thesis. Well done, Rachel. And welcome, Grandma. I hope you followed everything Rachel said. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Sophia. All right. Uh, my name is Nick Blanade, and uh, my project is titled Mancinita Drinking Habits, the uh, Change in Water Use of Mancinita Reef Sprouts Post Fire. So what is Manzanita? Uh, Manzanita is an iconic shrub that's typically found in chaparral communities across California. Um, and the specific Manzanita that I studied, Arctostaphylos glandulosa, has a ligner tuber that allows it to re-sprout post-fire along with um, cores or ligno or sorry, along with roots that it can extend up to nine feet deep in soil and weathered bedrock. So I was initially really interested in the re-sprouting mechanism because it's super cool. Um, essentially, the lignotuber stores non-structural carbohydrates that are mobilized post-disturbance that help manzanita grow really quickly um, after fire. However, uh, when I was doing some background research, um, I discovered that, re that it's actually unknown whether re-sprouts use different water sources um, or if the lignotuber potentially serves as a water storage. Um, so I decided to pursue that. Um, in terms of figuring out uh, what the water sources, what, is, what the water sources that a plant uses are, um, we have to look into isotopes, um, or specifically the isotopes in water. Now, um, isotopes are uh, atoms that have the same number of protons but different numbers of neutrons. Like for example, oxygen sixteen has sixteen neutrons, and oxygen eighteen has eighteen neutrons. Um, and the ratios of these isotopes in nature is known, um, or it can be. Uh, expressed in delta notation or delta 18 for oxygen and delta D for uh, for hydrogen. Um, and these ratios will actually change when water undergoes a transport process. So some like evaporation or precipitation. Um, this means that different water resources or different water sources will have very specific delta D and delta 18 and delta 18 O's, which when we compare them to a plant's delta D and delta 18 O, we can actually figure out which water sources a plant specifically use. Um, now, this is pretty important um, to figure out for specifically glandulosa because wildfires are becoming more severe and frequent. Um, and because water or fires, uh, wildfires can alter the water availability in soil, um, it, it, this could potentially affect the resprouting mechanism um, of these manzanita. Uh, all right. So I initially came in with two questions. Um, the first was do resprouts and non resprouts use the same water resources? which I hypothesize that they do. Um, and to figure this out, I would have to determine if the tissue samples of the resprouts and non-resprouts have different um, isotopic ratios. Uh, meanwhile, I also asked if lignotubers can serve as water storage, which I hypothesize that they do. And to figure this out, I had to determine if the burls and the twigs have different um, delta D and delta A, T, N, O. So I sampled uh, eight glandulosa cores, twigs, and leaves at a, at a single site in Pepperwood Preserve, along with soil and source waters. Um, at three different times. So once during the dry season, before rain, once during the rain season or directly after a rain event, and then once several weeks after another rain event in the spring. Um, I also uh, sampled nine resprouting plants and seven resprouting plants, or seven non-resprouting plants. Um, now in the field, I, as we can see on the left, I collected the lignotuber cores, which is something to note is that they are pretty wet, which I found very interesting. Um, on the right, we can actually see where my site is specifically in Pepperwood, um, which is right on the edge, um, pretty close to a private, some private land. Um, after I collected all of my samples, I had to run them through the uh, water extraction line in the uh, stable isotope lab in VLSB. Um, this is probably the nerdiest lab looking setup ever. So um, that's, that was pretty cool to work with. Um, I also decided to do uh, a little bit of pilot data analysis uh, with the carbon and nitrogen isotopes in the leaves. So on the right, we can see um, me packing up leaves uh, in tiny little tin capsules. 
Um, in terms of the results of my project, first, when we look at the cores and the, the isotopic composition of the cores and the twigs, we see that um, there are a couple of significant differences, at least for the delta, the delta D or delta 2H um, in between the cores and the twigs. Um, however, this was only during the dry season and during the wet and spring seasons, um, we, could, we see that there's actually uh, less difference or there is no significant difference. Afterwards, when we look at the resprouts and the non-resprouts and their cores, um, we see that there really is no significant difference at all. Maybe a slight difference in the dry season for the Delta 2 H, but um, not enough to really make it significant. Um, and then we, we also look at the resprouts and the non-resprouts or and the and the their twigs specifically, that's where we see a little bit more interest, something a little more interesting, where there is a significant difference in the dry season, a, a very significant difference between the twigs. Um, I also decided to plot my samples in dual isotope space, which means that um, plotting oxygen on the x-axis and hydrogen on the y-axis. And what we see here is that um, the the twigs and the non the twig like resprouts and non-resprouts are following an evaporation uh, an evaporation line. They're placed underneath what we call the local meteoric water line, which essentially means that um, that there, there's some sort of evaporative effect in the water that they're using. Uh, this is pretty similar to, so the, to the soil samples that I collected, which hints that they might be using some soil. Um, it's similar with the cores, um, but the line is not as, as straight as the, uh, as the twigs, um, which makes it a little bit messier to interpret. Now, um, in terms of how do all of these plots work with interpreting the data? Um, at first, it looks like that while the water sources might be different between resprouts and non-resprouts, um, as we saw in some of the box plots, it's difficult to tell which specific water sources they use. Um, the, while the dual isotope plots can like help us sort of interpret and maybe think they might be using soil, there's a lot of confounding factors that could actually, um, that actually could mess this up. The first being that uh, there are several source waters that I didn't measure. Um, as I mentioned previously, uh, Arctostaphylos glandulosa can use rock moisture or it can, its roots can extend up to nine feet deep which means that it can actually potentially access rock moisture um, in weathered bedrock. And then it can also potentially use fog. There is fog at Pepperwood, which I did not sample um, in the time for this, in time for this project. Um, then at the same time, there's also potential for evaporation in the twig samples themselves. Um, some of the samples were not fully superized in the resprouts, which just means that there's still a little bit of photosynthetic tissue um, and photosynthesis can dramatically alter the uh, isotopic ratios that we see. Um, now, in terms of whether uh, in terms of whether our, the glandulosa or lignotubers can serve as potential water storage, um, it looks like that there was no significant difference differences between the cores and the twigs, um, which means that they probably don't store water. And the differences that we did see in the dry season for the delta D could also again come from this evaporative effect in some of the resprouting twig samples. Um, so then I also decided to plot um, the, or figure out the delta 13C and delta 15N of the leaves. And this was sort of more pilot data, but I got some really interesting results for this. Um, so as we see, the, um, oh, sorry, the, the non-resprouts actually were far more enriched in carbon, um, in the carbon isotope, while the resprouts were far more enriched in the nitrogen isotope. Now, what does this mean? Um, the carbon isotope can be used essentially with the with a delta 13C, um, the less neg the more negative the value or the lower the value, that means that the plants are discriminating more against the 13 carbon isotope, which just means that they're still moderate or more open and can be used to imply that there's actually more photosynthesis happening. Um, it can also be used to infer the water use efficiency of a plant um, with more positive values being more efficient. So what we see is that um, the non-resprouts are slightly more water efficient than the um, than the resprouts. Then we also saw a difference with the delta 15N. Um, and what this means is that the resprouts are probably accessing soil layers enriched with nitrogen post fire, um, which can happen fire fire enriches the nitrogen pools in the soil layers. Um, and that the non resprouts are probably obtaining nitrogen from other less enriched sources, which might be either deeper or they're using nitrogen that might be stored in their lignotuber. So in conclusion, uh, it looks like the resprouts probably use different water resources, but it's still unsure what exact water resources they're using. Um, and there's still several other factors that could be confounding confounding the, the results. Um, it also looks like lignotubers tubers don't store water long term, although there might be potential for some for some short term storage. 
Um, and finally, the cores and twigs have different carbon and nitrogen isotope and, uh, isotopic composition, which has implications for the nutrient storage and usage post-fire. Um, in the future, uh, I would like to perform more replication to like for like ratify these results. So with more plants and more sites, along with incorporating a wider temporal scale, so sample over one or several years, along with capturing all of the water resources. So fog, which I actually very recently collected, and also rock moisture. And uh, that is my presentation. Thank you. Well done, Nicholas. We have time for a couple of questions before we transition to Nicole. Um, Don't be shy. This is Steve Lindau. I have a question for you. Um, how will the uh, amount of uh, annual precipitation influence your results? I'm guessing that a lot of your work was done more recently when it was relatively dry. Is the uh, abundance of recent rainfall and all going to be a complicating factor in some of your work? Or will it tend to make your differences bigger or smaller than what you might have seen? Um, that is definitely, uh, def it could definitely be a factor. Um, I, in my thesis, I actually discuss a little bit more in depth about how I think that these plants might be accessing rock moisture, which is a water source that can actually um, stay, it doesn't actually need a ton of rain to fill up and like the reservoirs to fill up long term. So that's why I think it might not be such a huge factor specifically for Manzanita, which I think is pretty cool. Um, that they can use, that they can access like this different water source that helps them stay alive in, in serious trout uh, scenarios. But in terms of um, the uh, like their like the soil, the water in the soil, that will definitely affect that um, and alter some of the uh, potentially alter some of the results that we see. Hi, great presentation. Um, I have a really naive question since I don't work on this. Why are there isotopic differences between different water sources? Like where, where does that come from? Um, so uh, that comes from transport processes like evaporation or precipitation. So like when water evaporates, for example, um, the lighter isotope actually evaporates quicker than the heavier isotope. So um, like if I go back to the, to the method slide, you can see um, we actually have in this slide, uh, you can see that the water is actually slightly, um, or it's it's depleted of the heavier isotope of oxygen 18 no, that's why it's a negative value. Um, and then when it rains, for example, when it precipitates, the heavier isotope precipitates more than the lighter isotope. So then we see that our rain is actually slightly more, slightly less negative than the clouds that head further inland. Um, and that's why you can really tell very specifically what water what um, water sources a plant is using because of like these isotopic ratios in the uh, in the water sources. Awesome, thanks. Well done, Thank Nicholas. You. Did anyone have another question? Sorry, I I spoke over anyone. Hope not. I will give the floor to Nicole Shu, and um, I believe. Your mentor may be in the house, Mackenzie Kirshner Smith. Welcome and thank you for all your support as well as all the mentors. I'll give the floor to you now, Nicole. Had to happen, Nicole. You're muted. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank that you. was our first of the day. <laughs> Great. Um, hi everyone, my name is Nicole and today I'll be presenting my study on evaluating the tarsa metatarsus as a metric for species identification, um, in other words, a 2D geometric morph metrics comparison of extant bird and Hesperonotiformes. So Hesperonotiformes is um, a bird of extinct lineage that has commonly been identified to the species level based on a single bone in its fossil. Uh, the tarsa metatarsus. That is, uh, that's this bone over here in the fossil or this bone over here in the modern dog. Uh, this is a highly preserved bone since these fossil birds were foot, foot, flightless foot propelled divers. And it's also a highly functional bone used in both locomotion and foot propelled diving. However, I thought that this high functionality could potentially mean that this bone might display more traits of convergent evolution rather than taxonomic signal. So the question I wanted to ask is, is the tarsa metatarsus actually reliable for species determination? I tackled this question using geometric morph metrics to test for inter and intraspecies variation. I used extant birds to compare to the extinct birds. 
Loons and greaves are historically the analogs of these fossil birds. This traditional view was established by Marsh in 1880 based on qualitative observations of the skeletal structure. However, more recently in 2018, Bell et al. discovered that these fossils are actually much more morphologically similar, similar to cormorants and diving ducks, and in fact did not overlap much in morphospace with loons or greaves. This study was intended to be supplemental to a study done by Kirshner Smith in 2015, which determined that there was a lot of intraspecific variation in loons and greaves, and that the tarsus and metatarsus was not good for species determination. By adding cormorants and diving ducks to the analysis, we'll be able to address Bell et al.'s recent proposal and take the traditional and contemporary analogs of these fossils to produce a more complete picture of the tarsus and metatarsus' species signal. So what exactly is geometric morph metrics? Geometric morph metrics, or GM for short, gives a quantitative comparison of shapes for, by accounting for geometrical relationship across these shapes. Modern morph metrics considers shapes as a whole and considers all the geometrical relationships of the input data, meaning that the information of changes between points is preserved. For 2D geometric morph metrics, points are placed on surfaces to mark the change in shape. I conducted GM analysis on 2D images of 36 modern specimens and 25 fossil specimens. Photographs like this one on the left were taken of MVV specimens, while screenshots like this one on the right were taken of extant birds from the Smithsonian <coughs> and fossils from the Yale Peabody Museum. The two main GM approaches in use were both utilized in the study. Landmark analysis is um, demonstrated here on the left and was used on the dorsal, medial, and lateral view. It uses landmarks, which are discrete homologous structures, such as this tubercle or foramina here, and semi-landmarks, which are sliding distance-related points that track curved geometry, like on this groove here. Outline analysis, demonstrated here on the right, was used on the plantar, distal, and proximal views. Here, a closed polygon is created by a continuous curve formed by semi-landmarks to get a best fit. So once all the shape data is collected, it's subjected to some GM calculations. The first step is Procresti's superimposition. This takes all the shape data inputted and removes aspects of size, such as rotation or scale, thus creating an average shape. Over here, um, this shape on a flat grid is the average shape produced of the proximal end of the tarsa metatarsa. So after Procresti's was run, I ran a principal component analysis, or PCA. This meant that the variance shown by each specimen in comparison to the average shape is calculated. A percentage is then given to every change in shape, which are then numbered in order of increasing significance. So here I gave two examples of how these specific specimens vary from the average shape. That type of variance, such as the pinching in these areas, is then given a percentage. Finally, I ran an analysis of variance or an ANOVA. This uh, compares two groups and produces a p-value that indicates if the results are statistically significant. I ran the most important principal component um, against species, which indicates if the p-value is lower than 0.05, the variation is statistically significant and was likely caused by species differences. After all the calculations are finished, a PC morphospace is then produced. A PC morphospace plots the two most significant PCA results on each axis with the average shape in the middle of the graph. Closer points on the graph indicate that those individual specimens are more similar to each other in shape, while further points on the graph indicate that they're more varied in shape. The polygon formed by those points then represents the morphospace or where members of that species would theoretically fall. To help you guys visualize this, um, here's the average shape of uh, the bone at zero, zero, and here are some examples of the variation you would see in the specimens as you move across the graph. So since the PCA is a comparison analysis, including or excluding specimens will change the shape at the morphospaces. These are my results for the plantar view, and um, I wanna take a closer look at each graph. So over here, you can see that the diving ducks and greaves morphospaces have some overlap and that there's an insignificant p-value of over 0.05, indicating that there is no species signal for this bone. The grouping of loons Specimens does have a statistically significant p-value of under 0.05. You can see that there's no graphical morphospace overlap. However, it can also be graphically seen that some individuals settle closer to other species rather than their own. For example, this G. pacifica specimen settles a lot closer in shape to this G. immer specimen rather than other specimens of its own species. 
So although the grouping in the loons show the strongest grouping of all my samples, I would still consider it a weak grouping. Now for the cormorants, we can see that this group over here, the flightless cormorant falls very far from the other species, and that the initial p-value for this group is below 0.05, indicating that species variability is significant. However, visually that seems a bit odd because of this large amount of overlap happening between these two flighted birds. So to further test this, I ran a PCA and a NOVA without the flightless cormorant and got this insignificant p-value of above 0.05. This indicates that although all these birds are in the same genera, it seems that maybe a lifestyle signal of flighted versus non-flighted could be stronger than a species signal. Uh, moving up just slightly in taxonomic classification, I also ran PCA for the extant and extinct birds separately. In the plot of all the extinct birds, you can see that the unknown species polygon overlaps a lot with the regalis polygon, and that the named species generally fall around the plot and are very scattered. So uh, this combined with this high p-value does indicate a weak species signal. And finally, this PC morphous space over here includes only the extant birds. Each polygon again indicates a species, but in this case, the fill color indicates a family. So you can see that there's a lot of grouping by family on this graph, but there also is a lot of species overlap. The species level p-value does indicate statistical significance, but running an ANOVA at the family level gives me the exact same value. And since each cluster of species is within the same family, this indicates that the grouping is influenced by interfamilial variation rather than interspecies variation. So different views or different analysis techniques cannot be overlapped and or compared on the same graph. So I basically ended up with six different sets of graphs. Here in summary, I wanted to show everybody the overall result for all of the specimens, which generally gives similar results to the last extant bird morphospace I showed. The main thing to note is that you can see the families, again, indicated by fill color, generally grouping together. And most of the time you can see species indicated by their point and line color overlapping. And although the shapes kind of vary from graph to graph, generally we can see that the inter and intra specific interactions are mostly consistent across different views. It's also important to note that this green group here, or the um, fossils, mostly falls separate from the extant birds. This reflects the fact that there's no true modern analog for these extinct birds, and that we simply need to use the most morphologically similar species. So this study has concluded that overall, the Tarsometas tarsus morphospace demonstrates strong family level signals and weak species level signals. It also demonstrates high intraspecific variation and low interspecific variation. Because of that, when it comes to conventionally naming a species, it may be best not to rely on the morphology of single bones, in this case, the Tarsometatarsus. This work supports Kirshner Smith's 2015 study, and by adding cormorants and diving ducks to this analysis, the study is supplemental to and bolsters that work, while also addressing the proposals of Bell et al. Again, because Hesperornis has no true modern analog, it's important to include both traditional and contemporary modern analogs in this analysis. The results are consistent with what I expected, since the tarsometatarsus is a functional structure in these diving birds, and therefore it will display more traits of convergent rather than divergent morphology. Since the tarsometatarsus is needed for locomotion, it actually may be reasonable to infer that this bone could indicate the niche that this bird lives in, or something about the bird's lifestyle, rather than its own taxonomy. And that's where I'll conclude my presentation for today. Um, thank you all for listening, and great special thanks and acknowledgments to Mackenzie, Dr. Bowie, Dr. Gillespie, and everybody else who helped me on this project. Um, yeah, and I'll open up to questions now. Well done. And there are two questions at least, so go ahead, unmute, please. I can go first. Um, Rachel, or the Nicole, that was awesome. <laughs> Thank um, you. I was kind of curious for all the species that are still alive and that mm -hmm. really we have genetic data for, does your GM analysis kind of accurately reflect the evolutionary relationship between families? Can you? Yeah, can you predict one from the data that you have or are those kind of divergent from each other? Um, you can't really overlap those. It, theoretically, it should somewhat show 
phylogenetic relationships, like you could see that families were grouping in general, in general terms. But because this is mostly based on like shape data rather than any like true phylogenetic data, it's pretty hard to like form a tree with this information. Though it would be really cool if I had time and resources to get a genetic um, tree and just kind of compare them for sure. Yeah, I had two uh, more technical questions. So sure. for the bone landmark identification, was that done manually or was there some sort of segmentation involved there? And also, yeah. I really liked how you showed the different views. So can you make like a 3D model of each bone and do your PCA analysis on that instead? Because I think that would be super cool. Definitely. Yeah. So um, all the landmark was done manually by hand. I'm not sure how familiar you are with R, but I used a package called Stereomorph, and um, it pretty much was just me at my computer clicking at the points, um, identifying the tubercles, the foramina, etc. cetera. Um, it is pretty imp important that it, I did it all, so that's consistent from bone to bone, and if it wasn't just one person doing it, say I had a lot more samples that everybody on the team is very familiar with um, where exactly these points need to go, which is why we try to use homologous structures um, for landmark data so that it's like the tubercle isn't moving, it's a set point on each bone. Um, for your second question about 3D, um, yeah, so geometric morphometrics can be used on both 2D and 3D images. Um, this project was actually initially planned for a 3D project because the Kirshner Smith 2015 study was done on 3D um, scans, uh, surface scans. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get lab access until Li Kai Shing to get to the CT scanner. And um, there are a lot of papers that say uh, 2D and 3D um, GM is are compare do give comparable results. So we felt that doing six images, um, six views of a single bone would give a uh, strong enough data for this project instead of doing a 3D model. Awesome, thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know Mackenzie in, is in the house. So uh, first of all, thank you. And do you want to ask anything to your mentee? Or share some words of wisdom? <laughs> You may be on mute. All right. <laughs> so well, again, I, I really want to thank Mackenzie for all her help for sure. And um, shout out to my mom who's in attendance today. Happy Mother's Day, mom. Oh, very cool. Sorry, I've been having Zoom uh, <laughs> issues lately with audio and video. If I turn my video on, my whole Zoom will crash. So. Uh, can people hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I didn't have any questions for Nicole. I thought she did a great job. Uh, this, this was based on work that I did in my master's degree. And um, I think it's a great expansion of what I was doing. And hopefully someday we can still get the stuff that she worked on scanned and do a 3D analysis in addition. I think that would be really cool. For sure. Yeah, let's do that. Um, without further ado, congratulations, Nicole, and welcome Sarah Ampelur, who will have the floor and present her work. Yes, let me just share my screen. Perfect. You have the floor. Okay. Can you see that? Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sarah Ampelur, and today I will be discussing my research investigating the role of DNMT3A on intramuscular insulin resistance. Before I start, I'd like to thank my PI, Dr. Sona Kang, and Sneha Villavalam for their help and guidance throughout the years that I've been working in the Kang lab and especially through this past year. Today, I will discuss three things. First, an introduction of the relevant topic material. Second, the results of the experiments. And lastly, a discussion of those results. More and more people every day around the world are developing metabolic disorders that are associated with insulin resistance, like type 2 diabetes mellitus. It is important to understand the molecular mechanisms that are causing insulin resistance in order to develop new treatment options to help the rising amount of people that are afflicted by these disorders. Insulin plays a major role in regulating glucose homeostasis, and the diagram on the left reflects this to its simplest form. 
When you have high blood sugar, the beta cells of the pancreas will produce and release insulin, which causes cells in the skeletal muscle, liver, and fat to respond by translocating GLUT4 receptors from internal stores to the outer cellular membrane, where it can be stored within tissue as glycogen, transformed to triglycerides, or oxidized for energy. And this helps to lower the plasma glucose levels to the normal bounds. And in the reverse case, if you have low blood sugar, insulin is not produced and other pathways are activated to help raise blood sugar. Insulin resistance occurs over time and due to a variety of complex factors, which researchers are still figuring out today. But what we do know is that cells in the skeletal muscle, liver, and fat will not respond to insulin as well, so more and more insulin is necessary to uptake the same amount of glucose. At a certain point, the cells will become exhausted and unable to maintain this high level of insulin production, so glucose levels will be too high, which has a lot of implications on your body, and you can develop organ damage, cardiovascular problems, and even death if it's uncontrolled. There's increasing evidence that epigenetic modifications play a role in metabolic disorders, and these effects can be passed down through generations. In a previous study by the Kang lab, DNMT3A was found to mediate insulin resistance in adipose tissue, so we wanted to focus on potential effects on skeletal muscle for this study. DNMT3A can add or remove a methyl group from the fifth position of cytosine residues that are commonly found in CPG islands of the DNA. The addition of a methyl group causes DNA to become tightly wound, preventing transcription factors from accessing the DNA, so there would be no gene product. And when the methyl group is removed, the DNA is less tightly bound and the gene will be expressed. DNMT3A can methylate target genes in response to environmental factors and stressors. One of those stressors in the context of metabolic disorders is a high fat diet, which is correlated with insulin resistance. The identification of these target genes can help provide targets for drug therapies in treating these disorders. We know that DNMT3A mediates insulin resistance in fat cells, which respond to insulin signaling in the same manner as skeletal muscle. So we want to know if it also plays a role in the skeletal muscle response, and if so, which genes are targets of DNMT3A. To carry out this project, we used a previously generated muscle-specific DNMT3A knockout mice line, so they did not have DNMT3A in their skeletal muscle. And this allowed us to observe any differences between the knockout and wild type mice that may be caused by the lack of skeletal muscle DNMT3A. There were two cohorts of mice. One was fed a typical chow diet and the other was fed a high fat diet to create conditions that can lead to insulin resistance and metabolic disorder. To start, we conducted an insulin tolerance test to determine if there were any phenotypic differences in glucose uptake in response to insulin signaling. The knockout mice on a chow diet had an overall significantly reduced ability to respond to insulin and lower blood glucose levels as much as the wild type mice. And this is seen in figures 1A and B. In the mice fed a high fat diet from 30 minutes and on post glucose Post insulin injection, the knockout mice were ineffective and slower at lowering glucose levels, showing signs of insulin resistance, which you can see in figures 1C and 1D. When comparing knockout mice, those on a high fat diet had higher levels of glucose than those on a chow diet, um, suggesting that these environmental stressors of a high fat diet does promote insulin resistant effects. The result of this ITT confirmed that the absence of DNMT3A in the skeletal muscle impacts the cell's ability to uptake glucose in response to insulin, supporting my hypothesis that DNMT3A plays a role in intramuscular insulin resistance. Next, we conducted a glucose tolerance test to determine if there were differences in the ability to uptake excess glucose when we did not externally administer insulin. I expected that the knockout mice would not be able to decrease blood glucose levels at the same rate as the wild type mice. However, the results showed that at seven weeks, there was no significant difference in the internal insulin signaling and response. Repeating the GTT after several more weeks would provide a more comprehensive understanding of the development of insulin resistance. 
Overall, these GTT results revealed that there were no significant differences in internal insulin response in these mice at week seven, even though the ITT data showed that there was a degree of insulin resistant effects in the knockout mice. To determine if there were any genes that were differentially expressed between the wild type and knockout mice, we extracted and sequenced RNA, which reflects the level of gene expression. This heat map shows that when comparing wild type and knockout mice, 26 genes were upregulated without the presence of GNMT3A and four genes were downregulated. We analyze the identity and known action of these genes and think that CCL21C is a potential key genetic target of DNMT3A for intramuscular insulin resistance. CCL21C is a ligand for CCR7, which brings T cells to tissues at sites of chronic inflammation, which is associated with the development of insulin resistance, obesity, and metabolic disorder. By preventing the expression of CCL21C, DNMT3A may be able to provide a protective role against the development of intramuscular insulin resistance. In conclusion, through the results of this study, we determined that the methylation of target genes by DNMT3A plays a role in the development of intramuscular insulin resistance, and CCL21C is a potential key target of DNMT3A. In the future, we would like to repeat the RNA sequencing on mice fed a high fat diet after several more weeks to determine if there were any changes in fold expression levels of certain genes. We would like to confirm if CCL21C is a key target of DNMT3A by measuring levels of mRNA expression, checking interactions with DNA and the protein, and seeing if removing CCL21C in a knockdown can rescue cells from insulin resistance. We can also analyze other genes identified in the RNA sequencing, and lastly, apply the study's genetic data to human cells and consider if there are any viable targets for treating insulin resistance and associated disorders. Thank you so much for your time, um, and let me know if you have any questions. Well done, Sarah, and um, I see that your mentor is in the house. <laughs> Welcome. And if you want to unmute and say a couple of words and any questions, just also feel free to unmute. Sarah, that was very comprehensive. Um, have you guys had a chance to look to see if the RNA levels that you're seeing are actually reflective of the protein levels that exist in cells? Or is all that's been done so far just the, the RNA-seq analysis? Yeah, so they did the RNA analysis and found that there were differences in the protein level. So it was upregulated in the knockout mice. Um, so it is reflective of what is actually happening in within the cells. Mm -hmm. I'm still puzzling over the glucose and insulin resistance test results. Mm -hmm. So I thought I might just ask you, what, what do you think might explain the, the difference? Yeah, I think that at this point, at seven weeks, the mice are still young, so the insulin resistant effects may have not fully developed yet. So with when we have like the glucose tolerance test, we provide like a lot of excess glucose, whereas in the insulin tolerance test, you provide excess insulin. So I think there's some molecular mechanism that's happening that we haven't figured out that is um, mediating the full development of insulin resistance. And so... Um, yeah, that's why I would want to repeat the GTT after the mice are a little bit older and allow for any insulin resistance to further develop, because we did see that there were um, RNA, I mean, sorry, differential gene expression in the RNA-seq, so it does exist. Um, so just repeating that in maybe other mice or um, just altering like the weak um, would provide some different results in the GTT. Great, thanks. Again, uh, thank you, Sarah, for an excellent presentation and very, very uh, well done uh, honors thesis and congratulations to everybody that's gone this far. And then I welcome Sam um, to get ready. Um, you are here, great. 
feel free to share your screen. And we're running a little ahead of time. So if you just want to see if everything's working fine, we're, we don't we don't have to rush. Great, yeah. Um, I think uh, you may want to put that in the presentation mode first before you share. Uh, okay. According, according to our expert in the house, Jerry. <laughs> uh, Jet, sorry, it was Jet that came up with this. Okay, presentation mode before. That's what I've. It's okay, you can always just change it after. Okay. How's that? Awesome. Perfect. All right, just let me know when I should start. You have the floor, Sam. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Sam Rosenbaum, and my thesis is on quantifying variation in juvenile size of endangered coho salmon and threatened sea lead trout across a diverse watershed. And um, I'm advised and mentored by Dr. Stephanie Carlson and Rachel Ryan. So we wanted to quantify juvenile size across a diverse watershed because habitat diversity leads to variation in juvenile size, which influences survival, ultimately contributing to population diversity and stability within um, imperiled populations of Samanids. And so our study site was Logner's Creek watershed in Marin County, California, which happens to support one of the southernmost wild populations of coho salmon and steelhead trout. And so um, Considering the uh, federally listed status of these fish, we wanted to use a non-invasive method to characterize, to characterize juvenile size. And um, if you can see my cursor, so this um, map right here is a map of the Lagunese watershed with the orange dots highlighting our 11 sampling sites. And then um, down here, you can see kind of where the watershed fits in with the rest of the Bay Area. And um, down here is just a little, that, that is a juvenile coho salmon, um, tiny, tiny guy, probably in between, I would say like 40 and 50 millimeters. Um, <clears throat> and so, yeah, the objective of the study was we wanted to explore how size trajectories across the summer differed, one, across our sites, and then two, between sites located in main stem versus tributary habitat which, and I'm, I'm going to explain kind of what those differences are in the next slide. Um, but yeah, for now, the central question that I want everybody to think about is which environmental variables are most explaining variation in juvenile salmonid size? And so the five variables that I was looking at were water temperature, canopy cover, stream type, large woody debris, and month. And so again, we just wanted to see which of these variables were explaining the size variation between these two um, populations of salmonids. So a little bit more about um, main stem versus tributary habitats. So we, we felt it was important to group our sites by stream type in order to um, best reflect the similar summer environmental conditions um, that vary between these two streams, stream types. And so, um, for those of you that might not know, a main stem refers to like the central uh, drainage channel of a watershed that eventually flows into the ocean, whereas the tributaries of um, a watershed refer to the smaller creeks and streams that um, don't flow into the ocean themselves, but meet back into the main stem. And so if you take a look at um, this figure to the right, you can see some of the differences that um, are going on in between these two stream types. So in blue is a, um, shows Lagunitas Creek, which is the main stem of this watershed, where in orange is Olima Creek, which is one of the prominent um, salmonid bearing tributaries in the system. And so you can see throughout the summer, the, um, the mean daily discharge, um, which just is a, is a measure of flow, is significantly different between these two stream types with um, Lagunitas having much greater um, discharge all throughout the summer. And so we, we hypothesize that these um, differences in flow and um, resulting differences in temperature would lead to um, different variations in juvenile size. So that was one thing that was important for us to explore. So a little bit about our methods. So we collected underwater footage of juvenile salmonids from 33 pools across our 11 sites within the watershed during the summer of 2020. And so sampling was performed uh, during three discrete periods. So the first sampling period was in June, 
The next one was in a combined period of July and August, and our third and final was during September. And um, so once we collected all of our videos, length analysis was subsequently conducted using a 3D videogrammetry software called VidSync, which is a really cool piece of technology that basically um, would allow us so we would have two GoPros in the pools um, taking videos of the fish for like 30 minutes at a time. And then after um, we were done uh, videoing the fish, we would take a gridded plate and dip it into the water in front of you of the cameras. And so then I was able to go back in, um, download the videos, upload it to the software, and then I could calibrate um, the, the um, images or the, the frames with the gridded plate um, to the videos in order to make uh, calibrate it to be 3D. And so then we could take these accurate and precise measurements shown, shown here um, of the juvenile salmonids. And yeah, so I would take what is called like a fork length measurement, which is basically just from the tip of the snout to the fork of the tail. And I would take three to five measurements of each fish that came into view and then average those. Um, yeah, and then so for our analyses, we did all of our um, visualizations and modeling in our studio. And so we used um, linear mixed effect models to try and figure out what was explaining variation in size. And so I tested um, four different models, the same four models for both species. And so the first one, um, the explanatory variables were water temperature and stream type interacting with month. And the next one was water temperature plus stream type interacting with month plus canopy cover. The third one was just stream type interacting with month. And then the final one was water temperature plus uh, large woody debris. And so <clears throat> to determine um, which was the best fit model, we use AIC model selection criteria. And so then to the left, you can see the outputs that we got based on um, AIC for each, uh, each species, the models that we tested. And so we found um, COHO1 was the best fitting model for our COHO data. Um, and, and by the way, just to back up a little bit, so AIC, you want the, the lowest AIC represents the best fit model. So that's why COHO1 is the best fit model for this data. Whereas for the steelhead data, we had a different model, steelhead two, um, representing the best fit model for, for that data set. And so, yeah, just to reiterate, so that COHO1 model, which was the best fit model, carried 65% of the cumulative water weight uh, model weight and included the variables water temperature, stream type, and month. Whereas um, for the steelhead data, the best fit model um, carried a 90% of the cumulative model weight and included the same variables as the coho data with the addition of canopy cover. Um, and so I thought this was really interesting because um, we actually found the majority of steelhead that um, we recorded were in the tributaries. And um, which, like I mentioned earlier, have lower flow and kind of less ideal um, summer rearing conditions for this for the fish. And so I think um, why canopy cover might have been included um, in this model is because it added um, like significant habitat complexity, inputting nutrients and adding shade to these um, habitats that might be less favorable um, otherwise. <laughs> Yeah, and so um, kind of visually what all of our data looked like um, between the two stream types by species over the summer season is this plot here. So I know that there is a lot going on, but what I would like to draw all of your attention to is if you just look at the main, main stem stream type throughout the three time periods, we see the same trend emerging where coho salmon are um, on average have greater sizes than the steelhead present in the, in the main stem streams. Um, and then the second trend that I would like to draw your attention to is actually that there is that we're seeing larger sizes of fish throughout the summer. So um, this is suggesting positive growth to us, which is a really good thing to see um, in the system because unfortunately, oftentimes the summer can be such a ecologically stressful time period for these juvenile fish that they can actually lose weight. And so we're not seeing that trend, which is a good thing considering the imperiled status of these fish. <laughs> Yeah, and so um, just to wrap up, um, we're seeing overall larger sizes of fish, both coho and sealhead in the main stem, which is suggesting to us that there are likely greater foraging opportunities and or um, lower metabolic stress in these systems when compared to the tributary habitats. 
And so what we think that is uh, likely a function of is there being greater drift foraging opportunities in the main stem. And so drift foraging is the primary mechanism for these juvenile fish to feed, which just refers to macroinvertebrates falling into the stream and drifting down to the head of the pool where these fish are waiting. And so if you take a look at this figure, similar to the one I showed earlier, but this one is showing percent change of flow throughout the summer. And so the same, the same trend is really show, emerging here, showing that um, Lagunitas in blue, which is the main stem, has um, significantly less percent change of flow throughout the summer. And so what, what I'm getting at here is the tributaries lose so much of their flow during by the end of the summer that these pools containing salmonids become functionally disconnected from one another, which just reduces the amount of drift foraging possible for these fish, which is why we think that there are smaller sizes um, in the tributaries when compared to the main stem. And yeah, so I, what I just wanna leave everybody with is that by quantifying juvenile size across diverse habitats, this kind of allows for evolutionary enlightened management practices, which we hope will promote resilience and stability in these imperiled populations. And yeah, I would just, I would like to give like a huge thank you to Dr. Stephanie Carlson and Rachel Ryan for their support in this project and for just being amazing mentors to me for really the past two years. Yeah, thanks, thanks everyone for listening. Well done, uh, Sam. I know you controlled for month. I was wondering if uh, the growth of these juveniles is also affected by the typical summer that used to be the summer now moving to other months, um, just in terms of uh, temperature of the water or anything that could be related to climate change. Did you uh, think about that as well? Um, okay, wait, so let me see if I'm getting, are you, you're wondering but you're controlling for months. So anything that happens every month would probably be controlling for that. Um, like a typical January effect on growth or February is, is taken care of. But I was just wondering if in general, this is coming from someone that studies changes in temperature, maybe the water temperature also affects the growth ability of these juveniles. And if you think about whether that's an issue or maybe not, feel free to defer. This is coming from a social scientist that knows very little about biological sciences. No, no, I, I think you're um, absolutely right that that temperature has a lot to do um, with the growth of these fish. It's, it's interesting because there is a balance. Um, on one hand, having higher temperatures allows their metabolic rates to speed up so we can sometimes see faster growth if there's plenty of food, like the drift foraging opportunities as I mentioned earlier, but um, yeah, so the caveat is having that colder water allows them to, um, when they're stressed in, in um, isolated pools, that allows them to kind of store their um, nutrients better, if that makes sense. But, but yes, yeah, so during the summer, it is generally, it can be a limiting factor having high temperatures for sure. Sam, I have a question. Um, so it seems like you're able to go through and figure out factors that affected diversity in, in juvenile size, were you able to go and see if there's any correlation with juvenile size diversity and like population health or survival rates for these fish or population size, et cetera? Yeah, yeah. So that, um, I mean, that's not something that I directly am able to really like speak to in my project. But there, it's like wi pretty widely accepted, um, something that Dr. Carlson talks a lot about. And I know um, her, like PhD, her previous PhD mentors touched a lot on this um, idea called the portfolio effect in, um, in Salmonage, which just refers to having like a bunch of life history and genetic diversity um, in different populations does lead to the overall stability of um, populations for sure. Does that make sense? Yep, that was great. I have a quick question as well. Um, I liked how you went through and explained which models fit your variance data best. I was wondering if like, did you ever go through and rank the parameters to see which ones explain the most variance in both species and are they the same? Um, um, so for instance, like month is most important in variance for the coho and the, the steelhead, I, I think, or something like this. Um, yeah, so um, we did test the same models for both species. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you were asking. And then, um, 
Yeah, wait, sorry. Was, was that what you were wondering? Um, more like, um, so just taking those parameters individually. So forgetting about the models for now, but like mm -hmm. did the same parameters, were the same parameters important for this different, the two different um, fish species, basically? Um, that's a good question. I didn't test them individually. What I did is I like hypothesized which um, groups of factors I thought would explain the most variation and then just tested those um, and didn't do it in isolation of each factor. But I would, I would have a feeling that um, I think they would likely be the same for both species. Gotcha. Thank you. Great job, Sam, and congratulations on honors from our college. Thank and you so much. I hope you uh, can share some of your plans. What are, what are you going to do next post-graduation? I'm, um, I'm actually really excited to say that I'm going to be pursuing a master's in the fall um, in fisheries at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. Very good. Congratulations. They're lucky to have you. Thank you so much. Appreciate Take it. the bears. Go bears. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so next we have Jet that is ready to go, right? Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Thanks, Sophia. Like, let me share my screen. He's going to share his screen, and you have the floor. Oh, cool. Thank you so much. Hi, everyone. I'm Jet. Um, I'm a senior graduating in microbial biology, and I'm also a member of the Banfield Lab. And today I want to talk about how I used CRISPR-Cas systems to identify and characterize phage infecting ultra-small bacteria. So the ultra-small bacteria I'm talking about are called candidate phyla radiation bacteria or CPR bacteria. Um, and they're super fascinating. So to illustrate their significance on the screen, I have Laura Hugg's new tree of life. Um, and this represents all the diversity on the planet. And you have eukaryotes, archaea, bacteria. And you have this really big purple branch um, and this whole purple branch are CPR bacteria, and they're estimated to comprise between 25 and 50% of all diversity on the planet. Aside from their diversity, um, they also live these really interesting life cycles, or lifestyles, sorry, um, being about one tenth the size of other bacteria. So they're thought to be episymbionts, meaning that they live on the cell surface of larger bacteria and parasitize off of their metabolisms. So in this image I have right here in the, in the red circle, you have a larger rod shaped bacteria. And then where that arrow is pointing at that small gray fleck, and that's a CPR bacteria living on the surface of a larger bacteria. Aside from those facts though, um, these are like highly enigmatic bacteria and not much is known about them or their CRISPR systems or the relationship to these guys. And these are bacteriophages, essentially viruses that infect bacteria. And so we can use CRISPR-Cas systems to establish relationships between phage and CPR bacteria. And I think right now the term CRISPR-Cas system is synonymous with gene editing, but they're also found naturally in bacterial genomes as a host uh, immune response against phage. Um, the way they operate is they contain these small little DNA fragments called spacers that can pair with phage genomes and they allow the Cas system to splice up the phage genome before they have a chance to damage the cell. And so knowing the way that the, the CRISPR-Cas systems operate with phage, um, we can establish relation, this relationship that if a bacteria has a CRISPR-Cas system and a spacer that matches with the phage genome, we can say that that phage potentially infects that bacteria. So knowing that relationship, we devised this workflow for this study in which I started with a database of high quality CPR genomes. I searched within those genomes for CRISPR-Cas systems. I extracted the spacers from those CRISPR-Cas systems, and then I matched them to large phage databases to predict phage that potentially infect these CPR bacteria. So before I jump into uh, the results here, I also just wanna give a little bit more context about the, the CPR database we used. So we started with 864 CPR genomes, and they're comprised of three different lineages of CPR bacteria. You have Sicari bacteria, Gracilli bacteria, and Ascondida bacteria. And we specifically chose these three different lineages because they're found in a wide variety of different environments. So from those genomes, we identified 118 complete CRISPR-Cas systems and 74 genomes. And if you look at this swarm plot I have here, uh, on the x-axis, I have the three different lineages of CPR bacteria. And then each point represents the complete CRISPR-Cas system we found. Uh, we found two different types, type two and type five CRISPR-Cas systems. And here I've plotted them based on the number of spacers 
in each CRISPR-Cas system. And the reason we're interested in the number of spacers is because the more spacers a CRISPR-Cas system has, potentially the more phage infect that bacteria. Uh, oops, one second. Oh yeah, and then uh, the way we defined a complete CRISPR-Cas system uh, was to search for a full suite of Cas proteins and also a high confidence spacer array. So after we identified those CRISPR-Cas systems, I extracted spacers and I um, blasted or matched them to large phage databases. And fortunately we found uh, 529 phage that putatively infect these CPR bacteria. So here's another swarm plot in which I have the three different lineages uh, on the x-axis. And then each point now represents uh, a phage that we found that perhaps infects these CPR bacteria. And I plotted them based on the phage genome size. And out of those 529 phage, um, I've, we identified 36 that appear to be fully circularized or complete phage genomes and not fragmented in any way. So after, uh, after identifying those phage, we were interested in characterizing them. And one of the characteristics we looked at was alternative coding. And we found some phage that appear to be alternatively coded compared to their CPR hosts. Um, and so to explain alternative coding, where I'm gonna be talking specifically about the translation step of the central dogma where you go from mRNA to protein. So here's a standard codon table in which you're going from codon to amino acid. And this is a table that's typically used for bacteria and archaea. Um, but there's also these alternative codon tables that have changes. And so for this one, uh, for example, code 25, there's only one change, but it's a pretty significant one. And that's a change from a stop codon to a glycine. And that can really have a profound impact on the way we predict translation from mRNA to protein. And, and the fact that we found um, these phage that are potentially alternatively coded compared to their CPR hosts is really fascinating when you consider the phage life cycle in which it's thought that phage use host machinery to replicate. And so, um, you know, knowing that there's perhaps some of these phage that are alternatively coded compared to their CPR hosts, it raises this really interesting question of how are these phage replicating using host machinery if they're alternatively coded? So the last thing we also looked at was the host range of these potentially CPR infecting phage. And so on the screen, I have the previous workflow I described. And to examine the host range, we took a two-pronged approach in which I first uh, compiled a database uh, of different bacteria across, across all bacteria or a wide array of bacteria. I searched for CRISPR-Cas systems within those genomes, extracted spacers, matched them to the CPR infecting phage. And then I also looked at comprehensive spacer databases from a wide, a wide variety of different bacteria. And I matched those to the CPR infecting phage. And uh, we found this, we found several instances in which some Sicari bacteria seemed to be infected by phage that also infected actinomyces, which is a known host of Sicari bacteria. And we also found some phage that appeared to infect Gracilli bacteria and also Fusobacteria, which is um, a proposed host for CPR bacteria. And so this, uh, you know, these findings, if, if they can be validated, may describe the sort of relationship I've drawn here in which you have CPR bacteria that are living on the cell surface of other bacteria, parasitizing off their metabolism. Then you also have phage that potentially co-infect both the CPR bacteria and the larger bacteria. So just to summarize what I've talked about, um, you have CPR bacteria, which are ultra small bacteria that may comprise up to 50% of all diversity on the planet. In those CPR bacteria, we identified type two and type five CRISPR-Cas systems. And using those CRISPR-Cas systems, we were able to identify phage that potentially infect those CPR bacteria, some of which appeared to be alternatively coded compared to their CPR hosts. And we also looked at this linkage between CPR bacteria, their bacterial hosts, and phage that potentially co-infect both of them. Um, and that relationship, you know, if it can be validated, adds more complexity as we and as science tries, tries to decipher uh, microbial community dynamics. Finally, I just wanna give uh, a huge thank you to Professor Banfield for all of her support and guidance, um, as well as uh, Alex Jaffe for his tremendous mentorship and just everyone else in the lab for being really welcoming and super supportive. Uh, thank you guys so much for listening and I really appreciate your time. Well done, Jed. And I think you have thank a you. couple of uh, uh, fans in the house. I know Alex is here. 
and probably even more people. Feel free to unmute and ask questions. Sorry, my avocado tree is going crazy and avocados are falling. <laughs> it's... Um, that's a great presentation. I was wondering, so how, presumably you're looking at reference genomes to um, identify the CRISPR arrays and um, these things are probably evolving really fast. So um, how, yeah, I, I really just know nothing about like computation and identifying these arrays. So how confident would you be that if a sequence matched some phage, like whenever the bacterium was first sequenced, that um, it's still being infected by this phage today, I guess? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and one thing we are looking at um, are the metagenomic assemblies themselves. And so sort of to explain that, essentially we're taking a sample from an environment and we're sequencing all of the DNA within that sample. And then within that sample, we're looking for phage that may be actively infecting those CPR bacteria. So that's sort of one way to look for the active infections you're talking about. Um, and that's something that we're definitely going to be looking into within the next you know, couple months. I have kind of an extension of Vincent's question. Are yeah. the bacteria under selective pressure, like in terms of being able to replicate their genome that they can only accommodate so many sequences at a time? Like is, is that a pressure that's acting on them or are you likely getting kind of archaic sequences that are hanging around but no longer represent a, a threat to the bacteria that are preserved there? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's a really interesting one because I think there definitely is a pressure to um, you know, minimize the genome, especially in CPR, because they live this tiny lifestyle, lifestyle in which they live on the surface. Um, but at the same time, you do see sometimes a lot of these like sort of dead CRISPR systems that are no longer functioning. Um, they may be missing cast proteins or they may be missing an array. And so you get this whole mix um, just from what I've seen of you know, active CRISPR systems and some that may be defunct. But I do believe that there is pressure to remove that, especially in CPR bacteria. Excellent job, Jed. Do you have any plans to announce post-graduation? Hey, uh, that's a really interesting question. You know, uh, I, I, you know, I'm fortunate enough, I, I have this fellowship lined up for the summer and I'm excited to pursue that. Um, that's gonna be in New York. And then after that, you know, I'm hoping to, to potentially start applying to different PhD programs or maybe work for a couple of years as a research assistant. So I have to solidify my plans, but you know, the future's looking good. I'm happy to hear that and hope you, you finish strong in the last finals next week, as long as everybody and congratulations on honors from our college. Thank you so much. Um, next, I invite Anvita Kulsrecha, uh to uh, share her screen and we have her um, both her mentors in the house. So Professor Mershand and Professor Shankman, thank you for attending. You have the floor, take it over. Thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen. Okay. And don't worry if it doesn't work, you'll just tell me to flip slides, okay? <laughs> okay, sure. Um, can you see the slide set? Okay, awesome. So good morning, everyone. And thank you, Anna and Sophia, for organizing the symposium and giving us a chance to present our research. My project focuses on assessing the necessity and sufficiency of short sequence motifs in sorting of microRNAs 2 to 3 and 190 into exosomes in HEK293T cells. This project could not be possible without the support of my research advisor, Professor Randy Shekman, my mentor, Dr. Liang Ma, and my RCNR sponsoring faculty, Professor Sabiha Merchant. Without further ado, let me give you a short background about this research and how we identified these short, se short sequence motifs. So as you can see in this image, um, the image on the left, um, these are um, exosomes, which are a subclass of extracellular vesicles, which are 30 to 100 nanometers in size and are involved in cell-cell signaling. These are thought to be derived from the multivesicular bodies as shown in the image, but some evidence also suggests similar vesicles bud directly from the plasma membrane. Many studies have reported the presence of RNAs, like small non-coding RNA and microRNAs in the exosomes. Once exosomes are released from the donor cells, 
They travel throughout the body before releasing their contents into a recipient cell. As microRNAs have been shown to regulate gene expression, this raises the possibility that microRNAs packaged in exosomes may be controlling gene expression in target cells. Most of the studies evaluating the role of microRNAs have heavily relied on isolation techniques, which do not take into consideration other vesicles from cellular debris. Therefore, it is really hard to find out which forms of RNA are present and even more challenging to identify which microRNAs are specifically secreted in the exosome. As per current evidence, RNA profiles of cells are very different from that of exosomes. Thus, it is reasonable to say that the process of RNA capture happens through a selective sorting mechanism and likely involves specific interactions with RNA binding proteins. In order to identify characteristics of microRNA packaged into exosomes, a former graduate student in our lab, Matt, conducted microRNA sorting experiments using systematic evolution of ligands by exponential enrichment or the SELEX approach and cell-free system, as you can see in the diagram on the right. MicroRNAs are more likely to have characteristic sequence motifs rather than structural motifs due to their small size. As shown in the image, this approach involves mixing of purified protein with a large randomized pool of nucleic acid, followed by removing unbound nucleic acids and then regenerating a template library. This whole cycle is repeated multiple times to enrich very few sequences with high affinities. So using a cell-free packaging assay, he devised an exoselex approach which is a SELECT-like strategy to identify specific primary sequence exosome sorting motifs. The program involved searching for all reads within a library for subsequences or KMERs of varying length K. Through visual inspection of the most enriched KMERs, he found that cytosine-rich sequences became specifically enriched. Further analysis identified a single highly statistically significant cytosine-rich motif, AUCCC, as shown in the top image. Similarly, he also analyzed the data sets to find KMERs that were highly selected against to find a specific motif linked to exclusion from exosomes. A highly significant guanine-rich motif, GUUGG, was reported as a negative sorting motif. Among the set of microRNAs tested for enrichment, microRNA223 was found to be highly abundant in exosomes and at a significantly low level in the cell. At the same time, microRNA190 was neither enriched in the exosomes nor in the cells. Using results from this exoselects, microRNA223 was found to contain an ACCC motif, while microRNA190 contained a UUGG motif near the 3 dash end. Next, looking at the complete sequence of these microRNAs, it is clear that they have very similar motifs on the 5 dash end. Hence, it suggests that the difference in their packaging efficiency is due to these sorting motifs present at the 3 dash end. To test this, Mutants for both microRNA 223 and 190 were created, where the former contained a negative motif or UUGG sequence, while the latter had a positive motif or 8CCC at the 3 dash end, as shown in the top image. In vitro packaging assay revealed that microRNA 223 wild type and microRNA 190 mutant have a higher efficiency of packaging into exosomes. This raises the research question that I am trying to explore, that is, do these short sequence motifs govern microRNA sorting into exosomes in HEK293T cells as it does in a cell free system? To test my hypothesis, I first started by generating microRNA mutant plasmids using mutation PCR, which will be used for transfection into the cells. Next, I generated standard curves for each of the microRNAs using serial dilutions to get their linear range in order to get a sense of microRNA detection. Overexpressing microRNAs in the cells helped to identify which microRNAs were being expressed in the cells. This was followed by transient transfection of HEK293T cells with microRNAs and exosomes were purified at about 75% confluency. MicroRNA was extracted and quantified using TACMAN assay to find out the packaging efficiency in the exosomes. Once the results were verified, the next step was to generate stable cells and use those for further experimentation. Let's look at the findings now. First, serial dilution of microRNA223 wild type or mutant and microRNA190 wild type or mutant resulted in a linear relationship between the log of concentration measured in molars and the average CT value obtained through qPCR. Broadly, for all the four microRNAs being tested, there is an inverse relationship between concentration and the CT value. However, once the average CT value reached above 30, 
the curve does not seem to follow the linear trend. This suggests that for both microRNAs, CT values above 30 to 32 may not be accurate for microRNA detection. Next, I tested for the enrichment of microRNAs into the exosomes. As shown in the graph, microRNA223 wild type was highly enriched in the exosomes as compared to microRNA223 mutant. The y-axis shows exosomal fold change relative to the cell. MicroRNA-190 wild type was not enriched in the exosomes as compared to MicroRNA-190 mutant. If you recall, this graph is very similar to what we saw in the beginning as a result of in vitro packaging assay. Hence, MicroRNAs containing the pos positive sorting motif were more enriched in the exosomes as compared to the ones containing negative motif. Another thing to notice is the difference in fold change between microRNA-223 wild type and microRNA-190 mutant, and that is because of the high expression of microRNA-223 wild type in the exosomes. Finally, once the enrichment of microRNAs into the exosomes was verified, stable HEK293T cell lines using GFP-labeled microRNAs were generated, which can be used for further experimentation and test for enrichment. Based on the purity and concentration of microRNA, four clones were selected and quantified for each of the microRNAs. The clones which seem to have similar expression levels can be used for the next steps. So just to summarize the conclusions from this experiment, we find that absolute quantification of microRNAs using serial dilutions generated the standard curve to verify linear trend. In accordance with our hypothesis, ACCC motif or the positive sorting motif present at the 3-N of microRNA-223 wild type provides exosome sorting signal, while UUGG or the negative motif at 3-N of microRNA-190 wild type serves as a cellular retention signal in HEK293 T cells. Furthermore, based on our experiments with mutants, the 3 cytosine rich positive sorting motif is necessary and sufficient for packaging of microRNAs into the exosomes. Moving forward, the next steps would be to quantify exosomal microRNAs isolated from the stable cell lines and to identify any proteins that may be associated with the sorting mechanism. The findings from this research can have wide implications in therapeutics where specific microRNAs containing positive sorting motifs can be artificially synthesized to serve as a method of drug delivery. Thank you so much for listening, and I'm open to taking any questions. Thank you so much. Very, very well done presentation. Feel free to unmute and ask questions, please. Um, that was very clear and an exciting project. I was wondering if your stable cell lines behave as you would expect, what would you do after that to verify that the yes. motif is doing something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I guess the next steps for that is, as you saw in the graphs for the stable cell lines, we did see, because we selected four clones, we did see some variation in the expression. So I guess the first step would be to optimize for the best clone, which has like similar levels across um, like different clones. And once we verify um, the result with the stable cell lines, the next step would be to identify if there is any um, protein that is involved in the interaction between this sequence motif and um, which, which basically permits it to enter the exosomes. So it serves as a signal for it to enter into the exosomes. Awesome, thanks. Thank you. Anvita, how do you plan to probe which RNA binding proteins might be kind of catalyzing this or carrying out this delivery? Do you expect them to be right. in the exosomes or do you think it's gonna be a drop off and release kind of, kind of thing? Yeah. So I think um, like from the previous research that has been conducted in our lab, um, we have identified this protein called YBX1, which is also involved in sorting um, exosome sorting mechanism, the microRNA sorting mechanism into the exosomes. And so I guess the next step to actually identify if there are any proteins involved would be to do um, an immunoprecipitation assay. And then um, if we do find some sort of promising data, then we would have to identify what protein is, what protein, what protein it is. And so for that, we would probably do mass spec. Excellent. I know both your mentors are here. If they want to say a couple of words or share some words of wisdom, please unmute. Welcome to the symposium. 
Yes, uh, terrific job on Vita. Let, let me um, give a, a slightly broader introduction to Anvita. Anvita, uh, we, we first met when she was in my freshman seminar class now four years ago uh, in her first year at Cal. And uh, she was uh, an exceptional student then. And uh, we spoke at length about the subject of not only the course, but also of my research. And so uh, in her next year, when she had the time, she uh, joined the lab. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that was then interrupted by the pandemic, but um, she kept in touch. She attended our group meetings online, even though it was uh, so many hours different back to her home in Delhi, where she remained during the pandemic. And um, now she's returned to complete her work um, uh, with, you know, unfortunate uh, the unfortunate pandemic really hitting Delhi particularly very hard. So it's been a stressful time for her, but I'm very proud of what she's accomplished. So congratulations on Vita. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. All right. Um, if there are no other questions, we will take a break and we will convene at 10 50-ish to start sharp with Alexis Brown at 1052. And I thank all the presenters, all the mentors that attended and um, see you in a little bit. And congratulations uh, once again, Anvita. Bye, good job, Anvita. Bye. Oh, Sabita, you still talk. Good, very good. Thank you. All right, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, we have Alexis. Brown presenting her work and you have the floor for 10 minutes. If you go a little bit over and you're about to conclude, I'll let you conclude. Otherwise you will sacrifice some time for questions, but uh, you have the floor, Alexis, take it over. All right. Good morning, everyone. My name is Alexis and I will be presenting on the metabolic effects of synthetic glucocorticoid dexamethasone on arsenic exposure in vivo. And before I begin this presentation, I would like to give a huge thank you to my faculty advisor, Dr. Martin Smith, for giving me the opportunity to participate in research in his lab since January of 2020. And I would also like to thank my mentor, Dr. Amanda Keller, for her constant patience and compassion with me throughout this process. So just to begin, I'm going to give some background. So glucocorticoids are steroids hormones that are widely used for treatment of inflammation, autoimmune diseases, and cancer. And glucocorticoids bind to the glucocorticoid receptor, which belongs to the nuclear receptor family of transcription factors, which are activated by ligands and they regulate gene expression by interacting with specific DNA sequences upstream of their target genes. There's a very important balance that is needed between these short and long-term effects of stress hormones. Short-term effects can be beneficial, but long-term effects can have detrimental impacts such as insulin resistance, hypertriglyceridemia, and muscle atrophy. And a very common glucocorticoid is cortisol in humans or corticosterone in rodents. And there are synthetic forms of glucocorticoid such as dexamethasone, and they are often used for medical treatments due to their anti-inflammatory and immunosuppressant effects. Dexamethasone has been used for treatment to alleviate symptoms of COVID, so you may have heard of it. Inorganic arsenic and its metabolites are highly toxic, and they are found in the drinking water of at least 50 countries in the world and can cause a wide variety of impacts on human health. And recent research has revealed that arsenic can actually act as an endocrine disruptor. Specifically, Specifically, it can disrupt the glucocorticoid complex and lead to the decreased expression of glucocorticoid activated hepatic genes. It has the ability to alter the ligand glucocorticoid receptor complex and thus disrupts its ability to interact with various DNA response elements downstream and thus prevents the complex's ability to induce transcriptional activity. Despite this knowledge, the broader glucocorticoid-related transcriptional impacts of arsenic in different cell contexts and tissues are unknown, which leads me to the purpose of the study. So we expect that arsenic with synthetic glucocorticoid dexamethasone will lead to increased circulating corticosterone, disrupted glucose and insulin homeostasis, and altered body composition because of the interaction that arsenic has with 
the glucocorticoid receptor. So next to go over some methods. So we selected wild type C7B16J male mice because this particular species of mice is a well-accepted model of arsenic toxicity and metabolic processes. The mice were divided into three different groups, which you can see on this dosage matrix that I have displayed on the slide. Following a seven day acclimation period, these mice were administered either 100 parts per billion or 1000 parts per billion of sodium beta arsenide in autoclaved water. And after six weeks of arsenic exposure, one group of mice from each arsenic dosage and one set of control mice were administered the same base dosage of two milligrams per kilogram of dexamethasone via autoclaved water for seven days. There was a control no dex group, which is C and D, a control plus dex group, which is CD, a low arsenic no dex, which is AL, a low arsenic plus dex, which is ALD, a high arsenic no dex, which is AH, and a high arsenic plus dex AHD group. All mice underwent a 16-hour fasted glucose tolerance test, or GTT, during the seventh week of arsenic exposure and one week of dexamethasone. And the purpose of this test was to evaluate the body's ability to regulate glucose metabolism. And three days later, the mice underwent an insulin tolerance test, otherwise known as an ITT, designed to determine how sensitive insulin receptors are in various tissues throughout the body. And this particular test measures changes in blood glucose levels before and after insulin administration. And insulin resistance and glucose intolerance are very common features of metabolic dysfunction, which is why these particular tests were so important in this experiment. In addition, we conducted a homeostatic model assessment for insulin resistance, known as a HOMA IR, which measures insulin sensitivity by taking into account the relationship between glucose and insulin. In addition, liver and serum triglycerides were measured by cutting and centrifuging the mice livers. So next to go over to some results that we had, in order to examine if arsenic and dexamethasone affect body weight, body composition was measured after seven weeks of arsenic exposure. And despite there being no differences in food or water consumption or body weight, there was significant differences in body fat percentage between the null group and all treatment groups. Mice treated with dexamethasone showed an increase in body fat percentage compared to their non-treated counterparts. The largest increase was seen in the dex treated groups with no difference seen with arsenic exposure. And in the absence of dex, arsenic exposure linearly increases body fat. In addition, brown adipose tissue increased twofold in dex treated groups compared to the null group. And this increase was not seen in the arsenic treated groups without dex. The dosage of arsenic administered also did not appear to have an effect on brown adipose tissue percentage. And to determine the effects of arsenic on the glucocorticoid receptor, the insulin response was measured by an ITT. The graph on the left illustrates the change in level of plasma glucose levels following insulin injection with all of the dexamethasone treated groups showing significantly impaired insulin response compared to the non-treated groups. The high arsenic with no dex or high arsenic with dex group, sorry, showed the most significant insulin resistance demonstrated by a lack of change in the blood glucose levels over 120 minutes. And the control with DEX and low arsenic with DEX groups also showed insulin resistance, but it was not as severe as the high arsenic with DEX group. As you can see from the graph on the right, the area under the curve for the DEX administered group was significantly higher than the control groups and arsenic exposure only groups as well. And this particular graph displays the HOMA IR levels and the various control and exposure groups. And as you can see, the DEX administered mice in the control, low arsenic and high arsenic groups all have a higher HOMA IR score, which indicates a higher level of insulin resistance. And to determine if arsenic increases circulating glucocorticoids, corticosterone, which is the male or the, the mouse form of cortisol was measured every four hours over a 24 hour period. As expected, the DEX null cohorts had an appropriate corticosterone rhythm with increased levels between 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., which is in line with the light and dark cycles in the animal housing facility. This trend was lost among the three cohorts that are 
treated with dexamethasone. There was a severe decrease in circulating corticosterone in the dex treated cohorts, and the level of circulating corticosterone during the light cycle period is significantly different for the dex treated cohorts compared to the null control group. There was no difference between the arsenic with dex treated mice in comparison to the dex only treatment group. Triglycerides were also measured in the plasma and liver in order to determine whether arsenic impairs triglyceride processing, and we observed no differences in the liver triglycerides between the DEX versus no DEX treatment group. We did find no effect also between the low dose, low dose arsenic group and the mean level of triglycerides and the levels of plasma triglyceride between high dose arsenic and null treatment groups was just shy of significant, indicating a possible link between circulating triglycerides and arsenic exposure because there was no correlation seen in the lower dosage groups. In conclusion, chronic intake of arsenic is associated with an increased risk of cancer, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and studies suggest that increased health risks as uh, levels of five to 10 parts per billion can exist. So our mice were administered far higher levels than this. So this indicates that there is a huge impact that arsenic can have on health. We found that dexamethasone and arsenic altered body fat composition, fat percentage, insulin resistance, and levels of corticosterone. And arsenic may have a role in selectively inhibiting glucocorticoid receptor mediated transcription, which is associated with altered nuclear hormone function. And future studies centered around this topic could elucidate how arsenic affects circulating triglycerides. And that concludes my presentation. I will take any questions that you may have regarding this topic. Excellent presentation, Alexis. And um, please feel to unmute and ask questions. I was just curious if you knew how arsenic um, affected glutocorticoid receptor. Um, like molecularly to uh, affect yeah. transcription. So there's a there's not like a solid theory about it. There's several sort of theories that are out there right now, but essentially it acts downstream by kind of inhibiting like DNA response elements and things like that is like the main theory right now, but there's they're not really sure. So that's another reason why this topic needs to be further studied. You might have mentioned this at the beginning, but how did the levels of arsenic that you're using in your water to treat the mice compare to levels that are found in like contaminated drinking water? Yeah, so we did a thousand parts per billion and a hundred parts per billion and levels as low as five to 10 parts per billion can have negative health effects, but the levels of arsenic throughout the world in water specifically kind of varies based off of what country you're in, but it definitely is around the level of like five to 10 parts per billion. So there are negative health effects that exist due to this. All right, uh, we are right on time, but before we go, Alexis, um, what are your plans for the post-graduation? Anything exciting on the horizon? Um, I'm going to be um, being a medical scribe um, before tra trying to apply to med school. So I'm going to do that for the next year or so. Yeah. Well, congratulations and good luck on the, your four upcoming finals. I'm sure you I appreciate it. Thank you so much. All. <laughs> yeah, that's the plan. <laughs> all right, thank you. All right. So, Canon, I have great news. Look who's in the house uh, beside your... Uh, family and friends with lots of last names similar to yours. We have Bree and we have Rebecca. Canon, yeah. you're on the floor. Awesome. Okay, so I'll just make sure this screen sharing is working. Uh, there we go. Share. And it should be in presenter mode now. Yeah, okay. Cool. Well, everyone, um, it's really great to be here. My name is Canyon Pearson, and my talk is called Holy Toxic Toads, Batman, a review of chemical defense in Harlequin frogs. And I know it's often said that explaining the joke kills the joke, but for those who don't get the reference, Harley Quinn is one of Batman's many nemeses, and like these toads, she is both brightly colored and very deadly. So 
Uh, before I begin, I'd like to give a quick shout out to my mentor for this project, Dr. Rebecca Tarvin, and my sponsor, Dr. Brie Rosenblum. Uh, this really wouldn't have been possible in any shape or form without the both of them. All right, so harlequin toads are in the genus Adelopus, and they're brilliantly colored and they're often quite deadly. And their skin contains a blend of toxins that's unique to their taxon. They're found throughout Central America and the, mostly the Northern regions of South America. And they used to be really plentiful in those areas. And since the eighties, they have declined precipitously uh, due to a variety of factors like habitat loss and probably the chytrid fungus. So with this in mind, I sought to review the existing literature on Adelopus poisons. And I intended to clarify what is and is not known about their chemical ecology, investigate geographic and phylogenetic patterns of the poison composition and provide a methodological framework for future research. There are two main classes of poisons in Adelopus. You have guanidinium alkaloids on the left and you have bufodienolides on the right. And guanidinium alkaloids are famously found in pufferfish, uh, specifically the poison tetrodotoxin. And when pufferfish is prepared incorrectly, it can kill the diner. Uh, and it basically paralyzes your muscles while you're still conscious and you lose the ability to breathe and suffocate. Um, pretty nasty stuff. It does that by blocking voltage-gated sodium channels. Bufodienolides, on the other hand, are classic toad toxins found throughout the genus, throughout the group of true toads, Bufonidae, not a genus. <laughs> They're cardiac glycosides and they affect how your heart functions. It causes it to slow, sputter, and eventually stop beating. Um, and these two toxins have different biogenetic sources in Adelopus. Guanidinium alkaloids are from an exogenous source. At this point, we think it's probably from a microbi microbe that lives on the skin of the frogs. Bufodienolides are endogenously produced by the frogs themselves. Most of the research on Adelopus has focused on guanidinium alkaloids, and I'll be bringing up a lot of different toxin names during this presentation. Uh, Terecotoxin, tetrodotoxin, zetecotoxin, all of those are specifically guanidinium alkaloids. All right, so this slide summarizes kind of the current knowledge of toxin composition per species of Adelopus. And there's a lot going on in this table. My apologies for that. But there's a couple of main takeaways. First, only 15 Adelopus have been assessed for toxicity and or toxin composition. There are around 100 species of Adelopus. So that's approximately like 85% haven't even been investigated. And second, there's a pretty large variation in the amount of investigation each species have received. Uh, for instance, a species like Adelopus certus right at the top has only been looked at once by one paper. And a species like Adelopus satechi has been, you know, researched many, many times. And then if you take a look at the IUCN ratings on the right, you can see that most of these species are pretty much on the brink of extinction. Uh, some are likely already extinct. We just aren't sure yet. Um, and another interesting note is that the only definite sources of satechitoxin is Adelopus zetechi and one population of Adelopus varius. And Adelopus zetechi hasn't been seen in the wild since 2009. It's unknown if captive frogs possess these toxins, they likely do not. Um, and synthesis of zetechi toxin is not currently possible. So this kind of raises the idea of not just an endangered group of frogs, but endangered chemicals themselves, if they're only found in this one, in this these few taxa. Um, and that's just a toxin we know about. There's all sorts of unidentified toxins in Adelopus, some of which are chemically or functionally unique, and we just don't understand them at all at this point. So this is a kind of, on the left, you see a map of the genus range for all of Adelopus. Uh, and on the right are all the places that have been sampled uh, for toxic frogs. And the size of the circle represents how toxic the frogs are at that location. Um, and so a lot of the dots overlap but you can kind of tell from this map that uh, Central America has been more densely sampled than pretty much any other region in the Adelopus range. And another takeaway is that there's a huge range in toxicities in this genus. Uh, it looks like the most toxic frogs are found in Central America and this region in Venezuela. Conversely, the frogs of the stretch of the Andes, uh, like the Northern Andes and it, through the Guyanian shield are very weakly toxic for the most part. Unfortunately, the sampling uh, of Adelopus is just too sparse to really know if this is a significant pattern or this is just a matter of the specific populations or frogs that we have tested. All right, so these maps show the different toxins that have been found in different spots of Adelopus, specifically like 
the individual toxins themselves. Map A, uh, the blue circles are tetrodotoxin and the red and the black circles are two other analogs of tetrodotoxin. And as you can see, there's a lot of bullseyes on this map. And that's because these two other toxins likely exist in equilibrium with tetrodotoxin in water. Uh, so it's just a matter of chemical equilibrium here and that's why you often find them all in the same frog. So map B and C uh, are two other guanidinium alkaloids and they're chemically quite unique. Uh, B is toxin, which is an analog of tetrodotoxin as well. And C is the tecotoxin. Uh, and you can see here that kind of these different types of guanidinium alkaloids are once again concentrated in Central America. Uh, and in the case of B and C, they're concentrated in different species. And then D are the bufidienolides, which I brought up in the beginning. Uh, we only see them in these four regions currently, but they've been found in every Atalopus species where they've actually been tested for. Uh, and so it's probably likely that they're found throughout the entire genus range. All right, so to investigate the phylogenetic patterns and toxin composition, I generated this phylogeny from 16S mitochondrial sequences found in GenBank. And the phylogeny largely matches earlier molecular phylogenies published for this genus. And it's subclades and subclades found here uh, in Adelopus largely correspond with the geographic ranges of member species. And right at the bottom here, that's the Central American subclade. And you can see that the toxin diversity in Adelopus is really concentrated in Central America. Uh, that clade colonized from South America at least 4 million years ago. Um, and several members of these species live really close together or even have their ranges overlap. And it suggests there's some sort of strong effect, either environmental or genetic, that's causing this really like strong turnover in this really relatively small region of the genus range. Um, and because we think guanidinium alkaloids come from symbiotic bacteria, these patterns may be reflective of the ability of the frogs to sequester specific toxin types, or possibly even the biogeography of the bacteria themselves. We just don't know at this point. But again, if you look at all the species in red, those just haven't been tested. There's huge gaps in sampling, particularly in the entire Amazonian Guyanian clade. It's very possible that there's unidentified toxins there as well. All right, so I'm gonna pivot a little bit and talk about the progression of methods used to detect and quantify toxins within Adelopus. Um, we don't have time to go into details. I know there's a lot of different names on this slide, but it's worth noting that we've gotten progressively better at detecting trace analogs in these frogs of really low levels of toxins. And we require much smaller samples than we used to, to actually find these toxins. We used, it used to be a matter of killing hundreds of frogs, getting all their skins together in a big vat, concentrating that down, uh, a whole deal. Nowadays, um, this hasn't actually been done in Adelopus yet, but you can take a skin punch from a single frog without killing it and just do your assessment there. Uh, so that, that's a pretty promising uh, avenue for the future research without harming the population of endangered species like these. And another thing that's worth noting is that uh, Bufidienolides, like I said, have largely been overlooked. And a large part of that is the extraction method used in these studies. Uh, Bufidienolides and guanidinium alkaloids have very different solubilities. So Bufidienolides aren't water soluble, guanidinium alkaloids are. Uh, and so generally when a study is looking for one, it necessarily excludes the other. Uh, and people have just so far decided that guanidinium alkaloids were more interesting. And then one last thing of interest, is that nowadays we can do these chemical analyses on museum specimens stored in ethanol specifically, uh, which kind of provides hope that maybe we could assess even species that have gone extinct, so long as we still have at least a couple of specimens uh, in a museum like the MVC. All right, so metadata is all that information which provides context and enables reuse of data sets. And unfortunately, metadata reporting in Adelopus has been really uneven. Um, many of these studies just don't give specific details on the time and place of where specimens were collected. Uh, this really limits the ability to use statistical method to answer questions uh, like the relative importance of phylogeny versus geography and determining toxin composition uh, or how toxin composition varies with elevation, et cetera. Um, and this graph illustrates the concept of informational entropy, which is basically the idea that metadata is lost over time if it's not published in an easily accessible place uh, as records get moved and as researchers die and all those sad things. Um, so I wanna propose just in, for future uh, research into wild caught amphibians that we include specific location, description of location, date of sampling and accession information for the specimens collected 
uh, just that way uh, future researchers can really capitalize on that data without it being sadly lost. All right, so in conclusion, outside of Central America, Adelopis are poorly sampled, both geographically and phylogenetically for toxin presence and identification. The phylogeny of Adelopis mirrors the geographical distribution of the species, which makes it difficult to parse the genetic and environmental effects on toxin composition. But once again, we saw that really strong turnover across the small area in Central America. So it suggests there's some sort of strong factor that's causing that. And more research is urgent given the precarious state of the taxon and the possibility of toxins that could be lost. Um, and then future research needs to incorporate minimally invasive methods and thorough metadata reporting. And one last thing that's not on the slide is we don't have information for the ecological, ecological context for Adelopus poisons. Uh, so we just don't really, like presumably they're there to protect the frogs from predators, but we don't really understand uh, what that looks like or how many predators they necessarily had in the past. Um, so those dynamics aren't really uh, understood at this point. So I'd, I'd like to thank you all for listening. Uh, once again, thanks to Dr. Rebecca Tarvin and Dr. Bree Rosenblum for really helping me get through this project. Uh, thanks to my lab mates, Tyler Douglas, Maria Jose Navarrete, and Connor Tumulty for sitting through con countless meetings with me. And thanks to my mom and siblings who have heard the word Tarika toxin more times than they can probably count at this point. So uh, thank you very much. Yay. Very well done, Canon. And please feel free to unmute and ask uh, questions. I had a quick question to start. Um, you mentioned that it's probable that there's bacteria on the surface of these frogs that are producing the toxins. Has any work been done to see if those bacteria can be cultured in vitro or basically can you make these toxins in the absence of a frog? Not that yeah. observation, but just from like a chemical production standpoint. Exactly. Yeah. So we haven't really, the work really hasn't been done in Adelopas themselves, but in comparable amphibian systems, we have been able to do that. So like the salamanders we have in the Bay Area, Tarika, they're really poisonous. They have tetrodotoxin um, and those bacteria have been able to be cultured and they produce small amounts of tetrodotoxin. So if we were able to get the bacteria off of the skin of the Adelopas, and if the bacteria were culturable, that could be a way to uh, get a source of these chemicals. Uh, that was actually my question exactly, but I'll ask a more tangential question. How do these um, frogs have resistance to the, the toxins that are on their skin? Yeah, so um, I there's been a lot of research into toxin-carrying amphibians and how they are auto-resistant. Um, at this point, I'm blanking on whether or not that study has been done in Adelopus themselves, but in similar systems, it's often a case of target site insensitivity. Uh, so like they have the uh, sodium channels are targeted by those guanidinium alkaloids and they'll have some uh, amino acid substitutions in that which will prevent binding. Uh, and they'll often have that in specific uh, sets of those uh, toxin targets, but not in others, which allows them to still regulate themselves uh, in different tissues. That's really cool, thanks. Mentors, feel free to unmute and share some words of wisdom to Canon, and then Canon, feel free to share where what's up next. Hi, yeah, sure, I can just say, let me see, I can't see anyone. Here you go. Um, great job, Canon. It's been really fun working with you. Uh, and this project, I've learned a lot as well uh, about Adelopus and I'm really excited. Uh, we have more projects in the future thinking about culturing the bacteria. And I'll let Canon share what, what's next for him. I don't know if Bree wants to chime in too. I just wanna say triple thumbs up. It was an awesome presentation and it's such a fun project and glad to have gotten to work with you during this, this phase. So tell, tell them what you're doing next. Yeah, thanks to both of you. Um, so I'll actually be returning to Cal in the fall as a graduate student in Dr. Tarvin's lab um, through IB. Uh, so I'll be continuing to do research, hopefully. Oh, bears! Yeah, <laughs> maybe on Adelopis, maybe on Tarika, um, but definitely on some of these fascinating amphibian chemical defense systems. So how long is a typical PhD in your field? And then I can tell you how much, how long it's in our field. 
So I understand the minimum is five years, but that's really not how it works out for a lot of people. <laughs> um, I've heard anywhere from six to nine, uh, depending on the individual. Yeah. Well, way to go. <laughs> Thank you. We're lucky to keep him, right? And to all your family that's here, I was trying to promote them to panelists so they could speak and, and cheer, but feel free to... Uh, oh, see, Rebecca says six to seven point five on average. <laughs> the uh, length of the PhD. All right. Well, um, Maria, do you want to say something? Yeah, um, that I'm. Uh, hi, Ganon, and hi, everyone. I'm super happy to um, see how you concluded your research. Uh, that took you a lot of work and that I'm super happy that we are going to spend the rest, the six or 6.5 years of our <laughs> lives working together. Um, and yeah, congratulations. Thank you so much. Well, very good. I know we have uh, uh, Blake on deck <laughs> um, to start sharing his work. And so once again, congratulations, Canon, and you have the floor, Blake and, um, if you want to share your screen, uh, I'll make sure to unmute and you have the floor. So this is Blake. Here we go, Stoner Osborne. All right, hello everyone. My name is Blake. And, and your mentors in the house. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Blake, and I will be presenting my honors thesis today. It's called Modern Day Jurassic Park, Using DNA Meta Barcoding to Reconstruct Mosquito Feeding Networks Across California. All right. So remember the movie Jurassic Park. Awesome movie. But the idea here was that scientists found mosquitoes that were trapped in amber. And the idea was that these mosquitoes had gone and fed on these different dinosaurs in the Jurassic period. Then the scientists pulled out the mosquitoes, pulled out the DNA from the dinosaurs from the stomachs, and cloned the dinosaurs. Now, unfortunately, my senior thesis was not about cloning dinosaurs. I wish it were. But the scientific premise that we used here is pretty much the same. So imagine you have a mosquito. It goes out and it bites a ton of different organisms, extracts the blood. I was able to take the mosquitoes, pull the DNA out from the blood, and then reconstruct a mosquito feeding network based off of this blood. So this whole process is called DNA metabarcoding. So DNA metabarcoding is this really cool molecular technique that helps us to identify prey. So it's a little bit like shopping. Imagine you go to the grocery store, you pull out a juicy tub of strawberries, and there's this nice barcode on the side. When you go up to the cashier, they scan that barcode, and of course the register will tell you this is strawberries and this is the price for the strawberries. We can do something super, super similar with DNA. So imagine you have a mouse. It has a perfect DNA sequence that's unique to that mouse. We can then put that DNA sequence through these databases of DNA sequences, and it'll basically spit back out to you that you do in fact have a mouse. So what that process looks like is you take a mosquito, you extract the blood, you identify the DNA, put it through the databases, and then you get back out that that mosquito had eaten a mouse. So this entire process is called gut content analysis, and we do this through facilitation with this DNA meta barcoding. So now getting into my project, I was basically testing a new molecular gut content analysis method. So here's kind of how this works. When you try to blast a sequence through those databases, you have to use a specific gene. And the gene that I was using was cytochrome oxidase 1, because that's the most common gene in the database. So here's a little mouse, and this might be an imaginary DNA sequence that I drew up. It could be thousands of base pairs long, but what's going to happen in nature is a mosquito will come in and bite that mouse. It'll extract the DNA uh, in the form of blood, and then as that mosquito digests the blood meal, you start to cut up the DNA into a bunch of little pieces. So you might end up with something that's only around 240 base pairs. And what I was wondering is, can that small fragment actually go back and still match up to the organism that it came from using sequencing and DNA meta barcoding? So that was my first research question was, can this next generation sequencing and a dual indexing strategy accurately identify digested DNA from mosquito blood meals? And my hypothesis was that, yes, this would in fact work. So my next question was, can we test differences in mosquito diet across California? So I have samples from a bunch of counties in Northern California and a bunch of counties in Southern California. 
you might imagine that these are very different climates and they're gonna have different organisms in them as well. So there's gonna be different availability for these mosquitoes to feed on. So that was my second research question is, are there regional differences in diet between Northern and Southern California? And again, my hypothesis was that yes, we will see significant variation in diet. Then I looked at all the samples and I was like, well, we have 14 different species of mosquitoes. You can imagine that these different mosquitoes might actually prefer to eat different things based on what species they are and maybe even depending on what genera they are. So that was my, my third hypothesis was that these, these diets will vary significantly based off of genera and species. So I'm just gonna walk you really quickly through the research process for DNA metabarcoding. So you start with your field collection you get these mosquitoes, you label them, put them in tubes, and then it's a little gross, but you kind of pop them. They're like little blood balloons and you just get all of this blood in a tube. And then from there, you can extract the DNA out of that blood. And this gets rid of things like proteins and RNA that aren't super helpful for identification. Once you have that DNA, you can amplify it through something called polymerase chain reaction. So you just get a ton of copies of that specific DNA sequence. And then when you sequence it, you can actually get the bases out of that sequence. Once you have the bases, you can then do bioinformatics and blast it through those different databases to match them up to the prey organisms that they came from. So here's where it gets a little bit fun. I'm really excited to share these results with you because we just got them back yesterday. They're hot off the press. And I kind of want to make this a little bit interactive. So in person, I would ask you to go, ooh, when you see your favorite animal show up in this little display here. Since we can't do that, I want you to use the chat. And whenever you see your favorite animal, I just want you to type what the name of that animal is. So I'm gonna start with the mammals. These are all sequences that we found from the mosquito gut contents. So we found things like horses. We found ooh. dogs. <laughs> we found coyotes. We found deer. We found people. We found uh, rabbits, oh, cats, we saw sheep, we saw wild boars, cow, cows, um, mice, and then we also saw possums. But it doesn't stop there with just mammals. We saw a ton of different birds. We saw things like chickens, we saw pigeons, crows, owls. Uh, this is a night heron. This is a red-tailed hawk. We saw the great blue heron. We saw egrets. We saw a bird called a waxwing hummingbirds, finches, robins, we saw wrens, we saw scrub jays, and saw some things like sparrows. And here's where I think things get a little bit weird, is we also saw things like amphibians and reptiles. So we saw things like salamanders, we saw frogs, we saw snakes, and then we also saw things like lizards. So we just saw a very wide range of organisms that these mosquitoes are interacting with and feeding on. So basically, moral of the story here is that new molecular gut content analysis method totally worked. We were able to use next generation sequencing and dual indexing to match those digested DNA pieces up to the actual organism that it came from. And furthermore, the match rates were 95 to 100%. So that's an extremely high level of confidence for such a short segment of the DNA. Now, because this was so, we got these results yesterday and because of COVID, I wasn't able to actually get into the lab until January and there were multiple weeks throughout where I was actually not allowed to come in. Um, so we got a little bit behind, but the next steps for this project are we're gonna take those sequences we got, match them up to the mosquito species and location from, where, from the mosquito that ate it. And then we're gonna start to do some analysis on these mosquito networks. So the first analysis that I'm gonna kind of walk through is this degree distribution. And you can see this little diagram on the bottom. These little blue circles up top are gonna to be the mosquito species and then the prey species are on the bottom. And these brown lines are gonna be the interactions you see between them. So if this species ate a dog, for example, then that will be this line here. And you can see a lot of these different lines are gonna cross over. And so there's a lot of different things we can do with these networks to try to disentangle them and to understand what's going on with these feeding networks. We can also do analyses on generality, which is just the number of predators or parasites that are eating things. You can look at vulnerability, which is the number of prey species that a certain mosquito ate. You can look at things like asymmetry, which is like how, how much of a generalist or a specialist are these mosquitoes and what they eat. Um, and so those are gonna be the things that my research mentor and I will be working on over the summer. But why is this all important? So this work is important because it helps us to really understand interactions between different species in the wild. 
So in terms of mosquitoes, this helps us to do quite a few numbers of things. We can basically define what a species is. These definitions are constantly changing. And so kind of figuring out where mosquitoes fit into the general structure of ecosystems and what they're eating can help define what their species actually is. It can help us to understand the ecological niche that they occupy, and we can determine the conditions that they need to survive. Now, this is important because mosquitoes are the base of a lot of food chains. If you start to see uh, these mosquitoes basically go, have populations go extinct, or we start to see changes in range, we're gonna see a lot of different changes upscale in ecosystems as well. That's called trophic cascade. We can also use these methods to analyze food sources and to anticipate shifts in range under climate change. In other words, if a mosquito's prey starts to move up in elevation, you might expect that that mosquito will follow the prey. And lastly, this is all super, super important because it helps us to understand the role organisms play in their ecosystems. So thank you so much for coming. And I would like to thank a couple people in particular. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Eric Haas Stapleton and Dr. Tara Tiemen for helping me get samples from all across California. Um, I'd super, super, super like to thank my um, research mentor, Natalie Graham. She is incredible and helped me through this entire process. And love her so much. And uh, I'd also like to thank our PI, George Roderick, for supporting me and this project. Um, and I want to thank my friends, Lily, Sarah, and Miles for braving the wetlands of, of San Francisco and uh, going out and getting bitten a lot by mosquitoes while we collected them. Um, I'd like, also like to thank the Walker Fund and the Spur Grant for um, funding this project. So thank you so much for coming, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful job, Blake. It was a spectacular interactive you should definitely check the chat it was going crazy when you're showing the <laughs> george you had a question welcome oh yeah like you know um mosquitoes transmit diseases and some of these are um in some of the organisms you got um including um west nile and um there's certain kinds of encephalitis so, you know, it'd be interesting to see which mosquitoes are feeding on like crows and um, horses and, and so on. Um, and then I was wondering if you kept the DNA because, you know, maybe you could look for some of these uh, viruses in there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So that's a really good point is that these mosquitoes are zoonotic vectors. So they can actually transmit diseases from something that they ate and then transmit it to something else. So I think that is a really important implication as well. I'm not necessarily focusing on like the, the viral like aspects of that, but um, I do have the DNA sequences. So it would be a really interesting follow-up project to see if we can actually see any diseases that actually are in the DNA as well. That was super interesting. Your method slides just read like science fiction, basically. That was awesome. Um, <laughs> I was wondering if you could speak a little more to the, the double indexing strategy and then I guess more broadly, um, would there be advantages to using a more divergent gene to figure out species? Because um, I assume that um, the mitochondrial gene you're looking at is probably not very diverged between species. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the first question, let me um, see if I can get back to the slide on the dual indexing strategy, um, which was back up to here. Yeah, so this, this dual indexing strategy is kind of like a, a newer development in this uh, molecular gut content analysis stuff. But basically what we're doing is we're kind of creating like a library. Once you get all of these different DNA reads out, you can um, put like a forward primer and a reverse primer on it and then attach it to a plate so that it, you can analyze it based on like what's on that plate. So that's the dual indexing strategy. Um, and it's just a way to help us with the molecular gut content analysis. And then the second question was about the divergent genes, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the reason we use CLI here is because that is something that's very commonly used in these databases. And so there's a ton of different matches you can get out of the organisms here. Um, the divergence is really interesting. So the reason that I'm not getting back like the actual mosquito DNA itself, or maybe things like the bacteria and the microbiome, is because we are using primers that are specifically for vertebrates. So they're diverged enough so that we can basically isolate just for vertebrates and not get things like, you know, insects and arthropods and all of that. Um, so the divergence helps us in that way, but we didn't consider another gene just because this is the one that's very commonly used in these databases. Um, I think that would be an interesting follow-up is could you get more matches with a different kind of gene? The reason I 
and really happy with the COI gene is because we had that 95 to 100 percent match rate, um, which was really, really good and high confidence for a lot of things. So I, I'm pretty happy with the way that the COI gene worked out. Um, did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Like, I have a question from Alexa Gomberg. Blake, such a cool presentation. I've heard that some people are more prone to attracting mosquitoes than others. Do you think the same heterogeneity might exist in population of other species? Yeah, I think absolutely. I think um, depending on, you know, if you live near like a wetland, for example, where they breed and there's a lot of these mosquitoes, you're definitely going to be more likely to interact with them. And I think the same is true of the different organisms we saw. Um, I'm gonna go to a specific slide to kind of highlight that, but one of our sample sites, here, let's go to the bird slide. Um, one of our sample sites was actually like in the reeds in like this wetland territory. And we actually saw, it's this bird right here. Um, I think it's the, the night heron was the, those birds were all over the place in the trees when we were there. And so I'm expecting from that site, we're gonna see a lot of reeds from this bird. So there is a little bit of bias when it comes to where did you actually sample? and what the reads that you're gonna get back out are. If you're sampling in a very urban area, you might expect to see things like pets and like people a lot more than you would see these wild animals um, in their habitat. But if you're closer to a wetland, you might expect to see the herons and the egrets a little bit more. And one last point that I, I kind of forgot to say was that um, I had about 500 different sequence reads back and I would say over 65% of them were these common birds. So that kind of ties in here a little bit is that these mosquitoes, it looks like are just feeding on whatever's available. And these common birds that are kind of all over the place in urban and natural environments, those made up the majority of the reeds. All right, excellent, excellent. And feel free to continue to chat with Blake offline. Everybody was so excited about seeing all that little favorite animals. They will probably want to know more or, or email. Uh, if you are within Berkeley, just type Blake and his last name, and it's very easy to uh, find him. We are gonna invite Shreya now, um, Garg, to um, share her screen, and your mentor is in the house, so welcome, Philip, and um, we are excited to listen to your honors thesis. I forgot to ask Blake, any fun plans post-graduation? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'll be going to the University of Hawaii at Manoa next year in the fall to do a PhD in biological oceanography. So very excited <laughs> to go out there and explore the island and have some fun. Very good. Congratulations. Thank you. Shreya, you have the floor. Shreya, you have the floor. Yeah, let me share my screen. Um, yeah, can everyone see the slides? Yes. Okay, cool. So um, I will start. Um, all right, hi everyone. Um, my name is Shreya and for my project, I study susceptibilities of Ugandan plasmodium salsiparum field isolates to novel proteasome inhibitors and the influences of genotypic differences to inhibitor susceptibility. And this project was undertaken by the supervision of Phil Rosenthal at UCSF and my CNR faculty sponsor was Professor Alameda. So going into a little bit of background, um, so malaria is caused by the infectious agent plasmodium, and it's a major health problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and South America. And infections in Africa account for most cases and deaths globally. And most cases are caused by the circulation of the most deadly parasite of the five plasmodium species, plasmodium falciparum, or P. falciparum, right here on the slide. Um, current treatment recommendations by the World Health Organization are artemisinin-based combination therapies, but emerging resistance is threatening their use. So novel anti-malarials are urgently needed. So it's important to assess susceptibility of P. falciparum from these malaria endemic regions to future anti-malarials anti -malarials under study. So we assessed ex vivo susceptibilities of P. falciparum field isolates against experimental proteasome inhibitors from two districts, and they're shown on this map right here, um, Tororo District and Busia District in Eastern Uganda from 2017 to 2020. So I talked about proteasome inhibitors, but what is the proteasome? So there's a model right here of the proteasome. Um, the proteasome is a protein degradation organelle and is a promising target for new antimalarial chemotherapy. Novel proteasome inhibitors currently under development target the two catalytic active subunits of the proteasome, the beta-5 subunit right here and the beta-2 subunit. 
and mutations in these subunits could alter inhibitor um, isolate susceptibility to inhibitors. So previous studies have shown that lab strain parasites selected under proteasome drug pressure carry mutations in the catalytic beta-2 and beta-5 subunits and the structural subunit right here at the beta-6 subunit. So these mutations actually conferred resistance to several proteasome inhibitors. So I wanted to analyze these subunits for genotypic differences among the Ugandan field isolates. In this study, I looked at naturally occurring variation in field isolates, and I genotyped the beta-2, beta-5, and beta-6 subunit in these field isolates. And kind of the two questions I asked in my study were, are novel proteasome inhibitors active against field isolates? And can differences in inhibitor susceptibility be explained by genetic differences in the proteasome subunits of Ugandan field isolates? So kind of starting off, I looked at the susceptibility of Ugandan isolates to 15 proteasome inhibitors. And we studied the IC50 as an indicator of susceptibility. And this is shown right here on the y-axis in these graphs. So the IC50 is the half maximal inhibitory concentration, which is representative, re representative of the susceptibility of isolates. So this is kind of like the value where 50% of growth is inhibited. And the higher the value, the higher the concentration is needed to inhibit 50% growth. And so the titles right here um, are actually the names of compounds. And each point on the graph is one isolate. And the horizontal blue line indicates the median IC50 value for each compound. So when looking at this, I saw varied susceptibilities to all compounds. And I also noticed that a number of compounds had several isolates with IC50s higher than the median. So you can see this right here in these compounds very clearly right here as well. Um, and this indicates decreased drug susceptibility of these field isolates to proteasome inhibitors. And this might be due to genetic differences um, in these isolates. So kind of going forward, I studied the beta-5 and beta-6 subunits, and I looked at genotypic differences in the proteasome in these field isolates. So the beta-5 subunit right here, actually I've highlighted, um, is a um, proposed target of proteasome inhibitor compounds. And the beta-6 subunit right here is a structural subunit in the proteasome, and it's adjacent to the beta-5 subunit active site. And this is also shown in this model right here. So this is the beta-5 subunit, and this is the beta-6 subunit and adjacent to the active site. So these two schematics show the um, parts of the gene that I amplified by PCR. So I was able to amplify the entire gene for beta-5. And for beta-6, I focused mainly on this region right here, exon-4. So exon-4 was interesting and important because it's closely located to the catalytic site. Um, right here, you can see. And also previous studies in lab strains have shown that a mutation at position 117, shown right here, um, in the beta-6 subunit led to parasite resist resistance to the proteasome compounds through impacting the beta-5 subunit active site. So I wanted to see if any of our field isolates carried mutations um, close to this position. So I analyzed 132 field isolates and they did not carry any mutations in the beta-6 subunit. So looking at the beta-5 subunit specifically, I found three mutations in four isolates. So two of these mutations shown right here on the graph, the A142S and D150E are in the mature protein of the beta-5 subunit after autocatalytic cleavage. To kind of further see how these mutations impacted isolate susceptibility, we looked at mutant isolates um, and compared them to all compounds and compared them to tested or compared them to all tested isolates um, for these compounds. So looking specifically for this mutation, um, this mutation at position 142 in the beta-5 subunit changed from an alanine to a serine in the mutants. And um, the mutant isolate right here is in yellow, and all the other points are wildcat isolates without this mutation. So this one isolate had IC50 values for several compounds. And we see that the mutant isolate showed median or slightly decreased susceptibility. And then looking at the second mutation, um, the mutation at position 150, it changed from aspartic acid to glutamic acid in the mutants. And this mutation um, of the mutant isolate is indicated in red right here. Um, so susceptibility of the D150E mutant isolates was close to the median and within the normal active range of the compounds. So it's unlikely that the observed mutations have an impact on decreased susceptibility to these proteasome inhibitors. Moving forward, I genotyped the beta-2 subunit, which is another target of several proteasome inhibitors. In addition, previous studies have shown that the beta-2 subunit has synergy with inhibition of the beta-5 subunit, um, and the beta-2 subunit is shown right here. So I genotyped the beta-2 subunit of field isolates, and it's shown right here as a schematic. So I was able to amplify the entire gene using PCR. So overall, I observed two mutations in the beta-2 subunit, a mutation at position 214 
and a mutation at position 204. So the mutation at position 214 went from serine to fallen alanine and B mutant, and the mutation at position 204 went from isoleucine to threonine in the mutant. And then as I did for beta-5, I compared susceptibilities of these mutant isolates to all wild-type isolates right here um, for these two inhibitors, and I plotted the IC50 values on the y-axis, and again, each in individual isolate is a dot. So isolates with the S214F mutation right here, they had decreased susceptibility, so seen as a higher IC50 value, to these two MNV compounds, which are believed to inhibit the beta-2 and beta-5 subunits. So now to kind of confirm this result in the beta-2 subunit, that the S214F mutation leads to decreased susceptibility of isolates, I studied the susceptibility of these mutant field isolates to known proteasome inhibitors. So these are the names of the proteasome inhibitors. So WLL is a known beta-2 and beta-5 inhibitor, and WLW is a known beta-2 subunit inhibitor. So after culture adaptation, only the S214F mutant parasite was viable, and we were able to study the full mutant and compare it to a field isolate without the mutation and a laboratory strain W2 as a control. So we did three independently performed in vitro drug susceptibility assays, um, and each point represents one independently performed assay, and each assay had two technical replicates. So this revealed that the S214F mutant has similar susceptibility to the inhibitors as a control parasite um, without the mutation and the W2 lab strain, and you can see this here. So if the S214F mutant had an impact on isolate susceptibility, in our assays, we would have expected to see an elevated IC50 value for these mutant parasites, which would mean a decrease susceptibility. So now we kind of wanted to connect the dots between our ex vivo data and our in vitro data and what was happening in the beta-2 subunit. So we analyzed the two mutations in the beta-2 subunit to further investigate their role structurally. So we did this through a protein model. Um, so this is a protein model of the beta-2 subunit, um, and the mutations are highlighted here. So this is the mutation at position 204. Um, it went from isoleucine to threonine, and the structure is in purple. And similarly here, the mutation at position 214 went from serine to phenylalanine in the mutant. So this revealed that the mutations are actually located in this region right here, which is the C-terminal tail of the mature protein. Um, and the C-terminal tail of the beta-2 subunit wraps around another subunit in the proteasome. So it's kind of more of a structural component and not really close to the active site right here, as you can see. So these mutations wouldn't influence inhibitor binding in the active site. And this actually confirmed our previous in vitro laboratory results, that the mutations are unlikely to influence susceptibility to any beta-2 inhibitors. So overall, the, uh, we, we saw various susceptibilities of Ugandan isolates to 15 proteasome inhibitors. We identified no mutations in the beta-6 subunit Mutations in the beta-5 subunit were not associated with decreased susceptibility. Beta-2 mutants showed decreased susceptibility in ex vivo assays, but in vitro drug susceptibility assays didn't confirm this, and structural analysis confirmed the in vitro assay results um, as the mutations were in the C-terminal end. So it's unlikely that the decreased susceptibility in the beta-2 subunit, um, beta subunit mutants is caused by genetic differences. So some future directions for this project include investigating levels of proteasome expression. So this has actually been shown to lead to resistance in mammalian cells. So higher levels of proteasome expression leads to love, um, resistance in mammalian cells to proteasome inhibitors. So it would be interesting to test our isolates um, with higher IC50 values and see if they have an elevated expression of the proteasome and compare expression data to IC50 data to see if there's an association. But overall, the study indicated a very promising result in the further development of proteasome inhibitors as new antimalarial chemotherapies. And I just wanted to quickly acknowledge the members of the Rosenthal Lab at UCSF, um, Phil Rosenthal and Oriana Kreitz Feltz for all their guidance and mentorship throughout this project. I'd also like to thank Jenny Lagak and Melissa Conrad for help in the lab. I'd like to thank Roland Cooper at Dominican a University for coordination and organization of the ex vivo results from Uganda. I'd like to thank Laura Kirkman and Gang Lin at Cornell Medicine for, for, for providing us with the beta-5 inhibitors and the beta-2 structure. And I'd also like to thank my CNR faculty sponsor, Professor Almeida, and the Spur Grant for their support throughout my project. Thank you. And if you have any questions, I can take them now. Well done, uh, Shreya. We have time for one quick question. I can do it. Um, did I noticed that most of your inhibitors seem to go after the peptidase 
barrel of the proteasome. And I was wondering if there were any in development for the like regulatory subunit on top, the lid base. And if that I assume is probably more diverged between humans and falciparum, if that would be, you know, a possible avenue for drug development as well. Yeah, um, I can quickly, sorry, go back to the proteasome structure as well. Um, so yeah, so the alpha ring is mainly, it's kind of more of a regulatory um, structure of the proteasome. It decides like what goes through for degradation. And so mainly um, efforts have been focused on the catalytic subunit, so the beta-5, beta-2, and there's another subunit right here, the beta-1 subunit. Um, but in PFAL separin specifically, it's shown that the beta-2 and beta-5 subunit inhibition is like most potent in stopping parasite growth. So that's mainly been developed. All right. So, oh. I, I was just asked to unmute. This is Phil Rosenthal. Thanks, Rhea, for a great presentation. I, I just want to mention a small oversight that this work also benefited from a great group of investigators who work with us in Uganda. And I know Shreya did not mean to make that oversight. She's going to be in Uganda in a few weeks, and she will then get to know these folks. And uh, I'm sure she won't let this happen again, but we have a really nice team. The, the, um, IC50 data that she presented was, of course, done in Uganda uh, by a, a group of Ugandan investors. But very nice job, Shreya. Thank you. Oh, we wish you all the best, Shreya, and a safe trip. Thank Any you. Exciting post graduation. Yeah, so I'll be in Uganda for three months um, doing more research and working um, at specific projects further. And then hopefully I'll be back in the United States and I'll continue um, working in Phil's lab and developing further and hopefully plan to grad school later. Spectacular, congratulations. Thank you. Nikita Shigulapali, um, uh, please you have the floor and uh, tell us about your honors research. Sure, um, one second. Oops. All right, can you see my slides? Okay, perfect. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, my name is Nikita Chigulapali, and I'll be presenting my honors thesis, which explores modeling bacterial plant pathogens across temperature with a focus on Pseudomonas syringae. I want to start off by thanking Britt Koskela for being my mentor throughout this whole process, and Elijah Meckelberger, who works in the Koskela lab. Um, and also, I want to thank my CNR sponsor, Professor Hayfix Sol. And my inspiration for this study actually came from the COVID-19 pandemic and the fact that the virus jumped from bats into humans. I was curious to see if maybe climate change played a role in this jump, but only had access to plant pathogens. So I did a parallel study to see how climate change and rising temperatures affect the bacterial plant pathogen Pseudomonas syringae. Um, as you guys probably know, increasing pop pollution from human activities has caused global climate change and rise in temperatures. And according to NOAA's 2020 annual climate change report, um, the combined land and ocean temperature has increased at an average rate of 0.13 degrees Fahrenheit per decade since 1880. However, the average rate of increase since 1981 has been more than twice that rate. And these temperatures have altered host pathogen relationships to better adapt to climate change. And that's exactly what I'll be exploring in my study. One study, one previous study by Coel et al. found that increased CO2 levels led to an increase in plant biomass, which caused there to be a higher rate of disease caused by necro nec necrotrophic pathogens. So the plant biomass here is the host system and the necrotic ne necrotrophic pathogens are the pathogens. And this paper is just one example of how climate change has caused there to be a transformation in host pathogen interaction that could lead to a higher disease and infection rate of plant pathogens. Not only are the host pathogen systems changing, but also hosts on their own are adapting to thrive in higher temperatures. One example of this is in Arepidopsis ARP6 and HDA9 HDL A11 mutants, which have maximized pattern trigger immunity rather than effector trigger immunity at elevated temperatures. Um, this was found by the paper by Chang et al. 
And on the other hand, pathogens are also beginning to evolve to become more virulent and resistant to higher temperatures. And some of these are making them a lot more dangerous than they would have been regularly. An example of this can be seen in the study on the emergence of Candida auris, which is known as the superbug right now, which was originally a plant fungus, but it was found that the rise in global temperatures created thermally tolerant fungal lineages that can now penetrate the mammalian thermal restriction zone, allowing them to infect humans where they previously could not. And this was found by a study by Casa de Ball. And this is super dangerous because Candida auris is actually very resistant to all our antifungal drugs. So when it does infect humans, it's very hard for us to recover from it and treat it. And to study this, I decided to choose Pseudomonas syringae, which is an excellent, excellent system to do this. And Pseudomonas syringae is also referred to as PT23, which is what I'll be calling it throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, and it's so good because of its own temperature dependence. PT23 is a rod-shaped gram-negative bacterial plant pathogen, and it has a temperature dependence um, because the biosynthesis of the phytotoxin coronatine is temperature regulated at the transcription level, and it works optimally at 18 degrees Celsius and works less effectively at 28 degrees Celsius. Um, and if we can, therefore, if we can experimentally evolve Pseudomonas to become more resistant to increased temperatures, it may allow the synthesis of coronatine to be adapted to happen at higher temperature and allow PT23 to continue infecting plants at these higher temperatures, which could be um, definitely detrimental to our plants, especially since PT23 is known to infect tomato plants. All right, so now to go over the methods. What I did was I grew PT23 over two days at different temperatures ranging from 20 to 24 degrees to 34 degrees Celsius. I increased the temperature at two degrees Celsius inter or intervals. And I did this by growing them in a water bath. So the water bath was temperature controlled and would stay at the temperature at which I set it for two days. So I started off at 24 degrees, then went to 26, 28, 32, and then or 30, 32, and then eventually 34. And at the same time, a control set was grown at 24 degrees Celsius during the duration of the evolution. And this was also grown in water to make sure it mimicked the water bath as closely as possible. So it was grown in a beaker with water and it was covered so that there was no light flowing just as the water bath was to make sure that there was nothing that would confound the results. And the temperature was controlled with the use of a water bath, as I mentioned, and the bacteria were grown in KP liquid broth, which is just basically media or food for the bacteria. And each of the control and experimental ones were grown in six replicates so that in case anything went wrong, I would have other options. All right, and then the next thing was data collection. So all 12 replicates were grown in triplicates in 96 wall plates and tracked in a plate reader. Um, so triplicates just mean there was three versions of each of the 12 strains to see how they grew and to get better data. So first, the, first I grew the bacteria at a standard temperature of 28 degrees Celsius for 48 hours. Then I did a reading at the starting and ending temperatures of 24 degrees and 34 degrees Celsius for 24 hours. If I had more time, I would have done the readings for 48 hours because that would give me a better reading and show how the bacteria acts as it reaches its carrying capacity. But this is the data I got from the 24 hours. So this is the PT23 grown at 24 degrees Celsius. Um, if you see here, the E1, E2, through six are the experimental lines. They were the ones that the temperature was slowly increased at two degrees Celsius intervals. So they were the ones to have been evolved. And then the C one to six are the control lines which were grown at 24 degrees Celsius throughout. And that, so they shouldn't have evolved at all. And if you can see here, these four lines do represent the, the experimental lines. So it shows that they are starting to grow a little bit faster and a little bit better than the control lines. So potentially if they were grown for 48 hours, we would have seen more of a difference that was significant. But right now we saw the growth rate of the evolved line was 6.7 times 10 to the negative five. And for the control line, it was 6.71 times 10 to the negative five. And then the carrying capacity for the evolved line was 0.55. And for the control line, it was 0 
So the growth rate and carrying capacity for the evolved and for the evolved line is definitely higher than the control line. Um, it's not a significant difference, but like I said, if we grew it for 48 hours, I'm sure we would have gotten a significant difference that showed that the evolved line is going better than the control line. And this is again at 34 degrees Celsius. Also one more thing to add, it makes sense that there's not as much of a difference at 24 degrees Celsius because it is room temperature. So we wouldn't expect there to be too much of a difference because the evolved lines and the control lines should both be able to thrive at this temperature. But the fact that even at a regular temperature, the evolved lines are doing slightly better shows that they probably do have some advantages. And now at 34 degrees Celsius, the PT23, these three definitely represent evolved lines and show that they are growing way better than the control ones. So once again, if they were grown for 48 hours, we would have seen this trend to continue and it would have been um, really nice to see some significant differences. But right now, the numbers I got were at 24 degrees, they did have lower growth rates than at 34 degrees. I mean, they did have lower growth rates than at 24 degrees, um, which makes sense because this is at a higher temperature that they're not used to living in and that they're not meant to thrive in. But still, if you see here, the evolved lines have a higher growth rate of 5.43 times 10 to the negative 5 versus the control line, which only has a growth rate of 5.19. Um, and the carrying capacity of the evolved line is also higher at 0 0.77, and the control line carrying capacity is 0 0.73. And once again, the differences are not significant, but given more time, they probably would have been. And this is actually an interesting finding that I found. So I first grew them at 28 degrees Celsius to make sure that everything was okay and that they were growing fine and to make sure that I could use the plate reader to find my finding. And interestingly enough, there was some contamination in the KB that I had used at the time. So the results couldn't be used exactly to figure out if the evolved line was doing better or not. But what we found was the evolved line definitely did way better than the controlled lines here. And also not only did they do that, they also outcompeted whatever contaminant was in the bacteria or in the KB. So if you can see here, the control lines are start, starting to decline, which means that the contaminant is starting to kill them off or outgrow them. But if you can see, the experimental lines are all continuing to grow up, which means that they're doing better. And they're like a little bit more ruthless than the control lines and whatever contaminant was there. Um, so here again, the growth rate is much higher than the ones that we saw previously. And this is the carrying capacity. And this one did show a significant difference in growth rates and carrying capacities, um, which shows that if I did all of the readings for 48 hours, I would have seen the significant difference because this one is at 48 hours. Oops. All right, and here's my conclusions. So, whoops, sorry. Experimentally evolving PT23 allowed it to grow past its 28 degrees Celsius temperature threshold. And not only did the evolved PT23 grow at higher temperatures, but it also grew at a higher rate and had higher carrying capacity. And also the evolved lines have proven to be more ruthless as they outcompeted the contaminant in the 28 degrees Celsius measurement. And future work will include growing all, all of the evolved lines at the different temperatures for 48 degrees, for 48 hours and also to do a plant assay to see how the competitiveness that I found accidentally would be assessed. And also another potential study to, would be to um, do the competition assay that I just mentioned. And I just wanted to thank everyone and thank my mentors again for supporting me throughout this whole journey. Liz, do you wanna say a couple of words fast and then we can have one question really fast as well. Oh yeah, that was fantastic. And I'll just say that, you know, from inception of this idea, which was entirely Nikita's through to completion, especially under the current circumstances of the pandemic shutting things down, I'm just so impressed with the work you've managed to do here. And it's a really exciting result. And I am just so proud of you for seeing this through. And I am definitely going to make sure that someone else in the lab picks up this project because you've just opened a whole new, really exciting research avenue here. So well done, Nikita. Thank you. Do you have any idea the what the contaminant was that you've introduced? 
Um, no, we didn't actually have time to look into that, but that would have been really interesting to see. All right, Nikita, well done. Any exciting plans post-graduation? Um, I will be working in the Costello lab for the summer with an internship, and then I also plan on applying to med school at the same time. Very good, congratulations. Thank you. Um, last, I would uh, ask uh, Snia Agarwal to um, share your slides and present your work and finish our morning session on a very excellent high note. I love your background, it gives us perspective. <laughs> Thanks, um, okay. We can see your slides very well. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, hello everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'm gonna tell you about this research that um, I've been working on for a while actually since 2018. Um, and it's culminated in this honors thesis. So it's a very special project to me. Um, and this research is about herbivorous flies and how their gut microbiomes help them process plant toxins. Um, so let me start by telling you a little bit about these flies and what makes them so interesting. Um, the species is called Scaptomyza flava. Um, they're pretty closely related to Drosophila melanogaster, which many of you may be familiar with. Um, it's actually in the same clade as Drosophila, which means that um, Drosophila and Scaptomyza share this common ancestor. Um, and what makes them different is that they eat plants, which is different from Drosophila, which eats uh, microbes like yeast. So here's our friend Scaptomyza with this leaf. Um, they eat plants like watercress and mustard. Um, and if any of you have eaten mustard or any related plants like wasabi, you'll know that they can be bitter or spicy. And that's because they contain plant defense compounds that are toxic to the animals that try to eat them. Um, so watercress and mustard contain a class of compounds called glucosinolates, and um, they're converted to isothiocyanates when they're chewed or damaged. Um, the compound I'm interested in is called phenethyl isothiocyanate, and I'll be referring to it as PEIDC. Um, so Scaptomyza ingests PEIDC through two main routes. Um, one is when they're in the larval stage. Um, so the larvae, they mine their way through leaves and they eat the plant material on the way. Um, and the second is when the female flies uh, lay eggs, they scoop out little holes in the leaf, um, and then they drink the sap that comes out before they lay their egg in the hole. So the question is how these flies are resistant to this toxin um, and whether their gut microbiome has anything to do with it. So there are three main questions that we asked to address this problem. One, um, are scaptomyzas gut bacteria resistant to PEIDC? Um, and two, if they are resistant, can they actually break down the PEIDC? Because if they can break it down, then that would be useful to the fly. And third, if they can metabolize PEIDC, uh, what genes do they have that help them do that? Um, to answer the first question, I started by collecting Scaptomyza larvae and adult females um, from watercress plants in Strawberry Creek, which runs through the Berkeley campus, as many of you may know. Um, and I also use Scaptomyza um, uh, specimens from the lab, as well as some Drosophila specimens um, for controls. So I squished them up and released the gut bacteria into solution and then spread the solutions onto growth media. And then once some bacteria grew, I picked individual colonies and transferred them onto a plate with PEIDC. And I did this so that I could count exactly how many colonies I was putting on the PEIDC plate so that then I could score um, how resistant that specimen's gut microbiome was to PEIDC by calculating the fraction of the colonies that were able to resist the toxin and then grow on this plate. And then I assigned the resistance scores to these five different categories. Um, they're color coded here. So red basically means um, almost completely resistant, um, orange is very resistant, yellow is moderate and so on. Um, so there's quite a range of scores, but you can see that a large proportion of uh, these specimens um, they have uh, very res resistant microbiomes. Um, and even the, uh, the lab specimens show resistance, um, the larvae more so than the adults. 
But um, the main distinction that you can make here is between Drosophila and all these Scaptomyza specimens. Um, there are way more PEITC resistant uh, bacteria in the flies that eat plants versus those that don't. So once we knew that there were resistant bacteria in Scaptomyza's gut, we could move on to the second question. Um, so here's PEITC and one way it can be metabolized is via hydrolysis. So you have a hydrolase enzyme which converts it to this amine, and then you get these two side products, um, carbon dioxide and H2S. Um, so to know whether a particular bacterium is metabolizing PEIDC, we need to see if any of these compounds are produced when you grow the bacteria with PEIDC. Um, and H2S can actually be detected pretty easily. Um, we can use these two compounds. And when they're mixed with H2S, uh, you get this compound, which is methylene blue, which is, well, it's blue. Um, so then you can measure the absorbance of a sample um, to see how blue it is after you add these two compounds. Um, and that can be a sort of measure of how much PEIDC the bacteria could metabolize. And here's what that assay looks like, the metabolism assay. Um, each well has bacteria mixed with either PEIDC or the buffer solution as a control. And I did three replicates of each bacterium. So for example, um, here's one. There are these three wells with PEIDC and then these three wells with the buffer solution. Um, and then there were two positive controls, two different bacteria, WFL uh, 2.1 and DC 3000, which are known to metabolize PEIDC. Um, and then there are two negative controls. One is a mutant version of DC3000, and then this one is just E. coli. And then of course there were controls without any bacteria over here. Um, and here's what the absorbance data looked like. So there's definitely a lot of PEIDC metabolism going on in Scaptomyza gut microbiomes. Um, and there's a really wide range of metabolism levels. So some of them are really good at breaking down the toxin, but some of them have more like baseline activity. So that brings us to the question, how are these bacteria able to metabolize PEIDC? Um, so there's a hydrolase called SACS-A, um, which has been found in bacteria that are resistant to isothiocyanates. Um, and it's called SACS because uh, the bacteria that have it survive the extract of the Elabidopsis plant, which contains isothiocyanates. Um, and our two positive controls, um, WFL 2.1 and uh, DC3000, they both have SACS-A. Um, and in fact, the negative control that we used was a deletion mutant, so it didn't have SACSA. Um, so we sequenced the genomes of the bacteria from the metabolism assay, um, and here's what we found. So all of these marked with an asterisk, they all have SACSA. Um, so there does seem to be some correlation between having SACSA and being able to metabolize PEIDC. Um, and in fact, some of them even have multiple copies of SACSA. So this, this one had three copies and this had two. Um, and you can see that these two were really fantastic at metabolizing PEIDC. Um, but this still leaves the question of um, how were the bacteria that couldn't metabolize PEIDC still resistant um, to, to the toxin? Um, and there are other SACS genes like SACS-B and SACS-C and so on um, that could be involved in maybe like bumping out the toxin or something else. Um, so it would be interesting to search the genomes of these bacteria that were resistant but not metabolizing and see if there are any other sex genes that are present in the genomes. Um, and besides that, um, other future experiments could involve um, functional characterization of sax a So checking if sax a is necessary and sufficient for uh, PEIDC metabolism. Um, and to see if it's necessary, we would knock it out um, from a bacterium and see if that gets rid of its ability to metabolize the toxin. And to see if it's sufficient, we would express it in a bacterium that doesn't have it like E. coli and see if that gives it the ability to break down PEIDC. And then we actually wanna see the effect of PEIDC metabolism in the flies themselves. So one way we can do this is by having flies eat bacteria that can break down PEIDC and then feed them PEIDC through a capillary tube and see if that helps them survive better. And then since this research is based on this big evolutionary question of how herbivory evolves, we could do experiments um, in other animals that don't eat plants. Um, for example, C. elegans, um, a worm that eats microbes. Um, we could see um, 
if having these bacteria in their guts makes them more likely to survive plant toxins. And C. elegans is especially interesting because um, the EITC metabolizing bacteria have been isolated from their guts um, in different experiments before. So we could see if there's actually a potential fitness benefit to having these, um, even though they don't actually eat plants um, yet, or they can't eat plants in the wild. Um, so that's all I have. And I want to thank all the people on this list. Um, Rebecca and Professor Whiteman for being incredible research mentors, um, Professor Traxler for sponsoring this project, um, Jessica, Susan, Shivani, Kanagi, and Maria for working on these experiments with me and being such great collaborators, um, and everybody else at the Whiteman Lab who helps to make science exciting and inclusive. Um, thank you all so much, and if there's time, I'll take any questions. Excellent. Um, Excellent work. Uh, please unmute and ask questions from uh, Snea. Uh, I really like how you found the genetic component in the bacteria that helped it um, help the flies deal with the toxin. And I was wondering if you've looked into um, a genetic basis or an environmental basis, the flies actually, the flavor flies actually acquire the bacteria within their guts um, and whether you can comment on that. Um, yeah, I, I'm not sure about the genetic basis, but there is some evidence that they acquire these um, bacteria just from their environment, from the surfaces of leaves. Um, and there was actually a small side experiment that we did where we took um, um, samples of those watercress leaves um, in Strawberry Creek, and then um, we sampled the, the microbiome on their surface to see if they were resistant to PEIDC, and a, a, a pretty large proportion of them were. so. Um, it's possible that they're acquiring these resistant microbes just from bacteria that live on the leaf surfaces. It's really interesting for the plant if the bacteria that helped it detoxify the toxin just live right on the leaf. So if you yeah. eat it, then you're, yeah, it's really cool. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. All right, and speaking of eating, Snea, <laughs> before everybody goes off to lunch, I would like to give you an opportunity to uh, share with us whether you have any post-graduation plans. Yeah, so I'm going to take the summer off and have a real break finally, but after that, I'll be starting my PhD in Johns Hopkins in the fall. All these bears going to places, very nice. Do keep in touch and go bears. We are gonna do a break for lunch. Um, Anna, do you remember when we will reconvene? I'll let Anna that knows exactly. All right. Yeah, we'll probably come back around 12.55 and then we'll be starting with the next person at one o'clock. Sounds great. Thank you all for excellent uh, morning. Thank you, Vincent and Chloe for um, judging and listening in and your very, very constructive and also very insightful questions. Uh, we really benefit from having you as the, our judges and also contributing to the discussions. And I hope the students also appreciated all your questions. Thank you. And see you a little bit later. Thank you, Lynn, for being our judge for the afternoon. And welcome mentors, uh, especially Laurent and Britt, who are here. And if I don't see the others, apologies. but start piling in thank uh, you for inviting me sophia i always enjoy this you're very welcome um jessica you have the floor okay great thank you sophia um thank you all for coming or for coming back my name is jessica ma and i am a fourth year microbial biology major in the Coscoy lab and my project is on a protein called erap and the mechanism of its downregulation during murine cytomegalovirus infection. So, oh. cytomegalovirus is a herpes virus, and herpes virus infections are lifelong infections. Some more commonly known herpes viruses are HSV1 and HSV2 which cause cold sores and genital herpes. There's varicella zoster virus, which causes chicken pox. Um, Epstein-Barr virus causes mono, the kissing disease. 
and cytomegalovirus, which is the virus of my interest, is the leading cause of congenital defects. One in five children born with CMV will develop permanent health problems, and CMV causes 400 infant deaths annually. So it's a very serious health concern for newborns. My lab works with the mouse homologue of CMV called MCMV. And my graduate student mentor, Christy Geiger, has found that MCMV downregulates a host protein called ERAP. ERAP stands for ER aminopeptidase associated with antigen processing. And what that name means is it's a protein that resides in the ER of the cell, the endoplasmic reticulum, and it trims peptides to be presented on the surface of the cell to surveying immune cells like T cells. And the literature shows that the human cytomegalovirus also downregulates ERAP. And what my graduate student mentor has found is that downregulating ERAP alters the immune response to MCMV infected cells. So the first um, step in my project was just to replicate what my graduate student mentor has found, which is that MCMV downregulates ERAP. So I infected cells with MCMV that expressed green fluorescent protein and sorted cells into a GFP positive population, which represents infected cells and a GFP negative population, which are uninfected cells. And I lysed the cells to get the protein and did a Western blot to blot for ERAP. And what I see is that there is less ERAP in the infected cells compared to the non-infected cells as shown by this painter band. So great, I have this result and now the, to move on to the big question is what is the mechanism of ERAP downregulation? And what my graduate student mentor has found is that there is an important interactor of ERAP called ERP44. And ERP44 is a ER resident chaperone that retains ER enzymes like ERAP that lack the ER retention motif KDEL. And ERP44 exploits the ER Golgi pH gradient to bind clients in the acidic Golgi and release them into the neutral ER environment. And other literature shows that ERP44 and client interactions are also redox dependent. So our hypothesis was that MCMV targets ERP44, which leads to a loss of ERAP. Um, and so I did a Western blot of the infected and non-infected cells, just like I showed before. And what I found is that there is less ERP44 in infected cells. We also did um, a Western blot to blot for another interactor of ERP44 called ER1-alpha, and we didn't see much change. But this is promising because if ERP44 levels are decreasing, that might mean that MCMV targets ERP44, which means ERAP is not retained as much as non-infected cells. And when ERAP is not retained, it is not retained in the ER, it is secreted out of the cell. So my next step was to see whether ERAP is secreted from cells that lack ERP44. So I took the supernatant from ERP44 knockout cells and did an aminopeptidase assay which involved adding a substrate that is 
able to be cleaved by ERAP, which is an amino peptidase. This cleaving of the substrate causes a change in color and um, we can measure it by measuring the optical density. What I found is that ERP44 knockout cells have a higher ERAP activity in its supernatant, which suggests that more ERAP is being secreted out of ERP44 knockout cells. So I wanted to take this one step further and see if ERAP is secreted in MCMB infected cells. Because as I saw in my Western blot, MCMV infected cells have a lower level of ERP44. And when I did this, this is just the color change that we see when we do this experiment. When I did this, I did see there is a slightly higher ERAP activity in the supernatant of MCMV infected cells. So going on and continuing with my project, I would like to optimize this assay to see if I can see an even bigger change um, in the MCMV infected cells. Other plans that I have are to test the hypothesis of whether MCMV is altering the pH or oxidation state of the Golgi and ER, thereby preventing ERP44 from binding to ERAP because as I mentioned, ERP44 exploit, exploits the ER Golgi pH gradient. And by altering the pH or oxidation state, this could lead to ERAP secretion. So to do this, I need to measure the pH and oxidation state, and I have been generating stable cell lines expressing pH and redox probes. Uh, another task on my list is to attach a KDEL sequence, which is the ER retention motif to ERAP, and see if it is retained in the ER in ERP44 knockout cells. So just to sum up what I have seen um, in my data, I've seen that ERP44 levels are decreasing during MCMV infection and ERAP is secreted in ERP44 knockout cells. And these data could support the hypotheses that MCMV viral factors are downregulating ERAP by targeting ERP44 directly and or altering the pH or redox state of the ER causing an interference in the interaction between ERAP and ERP44. So with that, I would like to thank my lab. I would like to especially thank my PI Laurent Coscoy and my graduate student mentor, Christy Geiger, who have helped me and guided me and taught me for the past two years. I would like to thank Ellen Roby and the Roby Lab, as well as the Shastri Lab at Johns Hopkins University, and the Glonsinger Lab, and Britt Glonsinger, who is my PMB faculty mentor. And I would like to thank the Flow Cytometry Facility and Spur for funding my project. And I am happy to take any questions. Well done, Jessica. We have time for one or two quick questions and also your mentors, if they wanna unmute and say a couple of words, that would be great. I have a question actually, fantastic job, Jessica. That was really exciting um, and, and super clearly presented. My question was you looked at a couple of um, client proteins for for um, ERP44 knockout. And while ERAP went down, the other one, I don't remember the name of it, didn't seem to go down. So I was wondering if you had any ideas or hypotheses as to why that was the case. Yeah. Um, I think perhaps uh, ERP44 is more of an important interactor to ERAP. I mean, ERP44 has many clients, 
Um, and perhaps um, the other clients of ERP 44 are not too affected when uh, there is a lack of ERP 44. All right, yeah. go ahead. Yeah, I had a question as well. I mean, MCMV by, you know, what we think it's by accident downregulate ERAP. And I was wondering if you can elaborate to the outcome of this downregulation on the innate, on the immune response and how that can play a role in immune defenses. Oh, um, the immune response downregulates ERAP, you're saying? I mean, the ERAP is being done regulated in infected cells. And I was wondering if you can elaborate on how that's activated, or how, what does the effect on the immune response and if that can promote an antiviral response on that. Oh yeah, great question. So um, what we have seen is that when ERAP is downregulated, it leads to a different repertoire of peptides uh, being presented and this causes uh, a specific uh, T cell response, which um, my graduate student mentor works on. Uh, it's called a QFL response. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing job, Jessica. Thank you. Excellent job. Any uh, exciting news on postgraduate? Oh, Lynn has a question. Yeah. Unmute, please. Unmute, please, Lynn. Wonderful job, Jessica. Um, can you just tell me briefly now, I'm getting a feeling for it, but I'm the person who needs to have things explained click to me, um, how this will eventually help us reduce uh, congenital birth defects due to herpes viruses? Yeah, well, if we can if it, better understand, yes? I mean, if, if it does, yes. Please, you are going, doing well. Oh, if we can better understand, well, how CMV is interacting with the host, um, either by targeting specific proteins like ERAP or ERP44, or altering the pH or oxidation state, we can better target um, mm. these uh, interactions to mitigate the effects of CMV. All right, thank you so much. Thank We're you. running two minutes late, so I'm gonna switch to Jason and we can continue the chat with Jessica uh, in the chat or follow up with an email. Thank you so much. Jason, you have the floor. Jason Chang. OK, sounds good. Uh, yeah. Um, so my study focuses on um, looking at the bias correction for eDNA metabolic coding. And um, so conventionally, sorry. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, conventionally, what uh, metabolic coding is, you have some type of micro microbiota that you want to sample. And you basically extract DNA from that environment, and you uh, amplify uh, some sorts of universal marker of interest and you sequence it. However, um, so traditionally people like to use these type of um, uh, abundance of assigned taxon as uh, uh, a representation of what the environmental uh, composition is. However, recently there have been studies that found that um, throughout this process, there are actually many sources of error. And um, the ones that I'm focused on, focusing on in this study is uh, the technical bias. So. Uh, for, for instance, uh, here I'm showing a normal um, workflow of uh, freshwater um, environmental sample. So you could start with a uniform distribution of a TEXA1 and TEXA2. However, just simply based on uh, bias in the amplification sequencing reaction, you could get really uh, heterogeneous uh, taxonomic assignments. So um, here. Um, so this is an overview of what the study is. So first we um, mine data from um, seven, from nine literature. And um, so the top eight is what I'm referring to as global. 
uh, because they don't really use any spiking in their uh, study. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So spikings are these um, synthetically um, synthesized uh, oligonucleotide with sequence of interest. And these are usually used as calibration tool in uh, metabolical and study. So they're seeded with known proportion prior to uh, your uh, amplification process. And um, just based on the taxonomic assignment of these spikings, you can get a better sense of what the experimental dynamic is like throughout the um, metabolic coding process. So um, from here on, I'll refer to the Toulouse data set as a spiking data set because they were the only um, study that actually used spiking in their mock community. Yeah, so mock community are these simulated, um, I guess, microbial environment with um, seeded known proportion of microbes. And those are used to usually test, um, I guess, efficiency and uh, correctness of uh, taxonomic assignments pipelines. So what you get from these data set is uh, NGS, raw NGS reads of those mock communities. And also what we, what we extracted was uh, various experimental condition that were listed in the methods portion of the, the paper. So first we pre-process those data and um, on the left hand side with the NGS read, we uh, use Kraken 2 to, to get a, a raw abundance of the taxons, which were assumed to be biased based on uh, several prior studies. And um, here we extracted various features from uh, uh, the methods portion of the paper and also um, the true abundance were given uh, in these small community data set. So the main task and the main objective of this study is to use raw abundance and your features to get a better prediction of the true abundance, which is how you uh, correct for the bias. So with this metadata set, what we did was we first look at uh, the relationship between bias and each of the various features and also ultimately um, construct a model that can better correct for the bias. So here's some of the features that we um, extracted from the literature. So you can see there's some of um, the temperature of the various stages of the PCR protocol, along with the total amount of input DNA in um, each experiment, and also the length of your sequence reads, and also the characteristic of your um, primer and your amplicon. And here we also calculated a primer binding score, which is based on a linear model that's fitted on data from a prior study that look into detrimental effects of um, uh, primary template mismatch. So um, yeah, and also uh, library prep methods, sequencing platform and tag polymerase. These are um, categorical features, which means they're non-numerical. Uh, and to extract quantitative information from these, we had to one how encoded these feature. Uh, for instance, if an uh, experiment use uh, library prep method A, it will have a one in that column and zero everywhere else and so on for the other two um, features as well. So first what we look at was uh, whether this task is actually predictable. So we're trying to see whether um, uh, there's actually any shared information between bias and features. And here, from here on, uh, we define bias as the difference between your raw abundance and your true abundance. And by measuring uh, the mutual information between uh, two variable, so it basically measures um, the amount of information you can obtain about one variable through observation of the other. So here we see um, it is expected that the reads will hold the most information about bias because it's uh, inherently in the definition of bias, which is why we kept it as a control group. But we're, what we we're really interested in was this amplicon GC, which is the GC contents of your amplicon. And it seemed to share a lot of information with the bias. And that tells us that um, it could be a really important feature predictor down the line. So next we're looking at how similar does your uh, training data have to be for this type of modeling to work. So recall that um, what I was referring to as global data set or um, the other eight literature that didn't really use uh, spiking. And, all these analysis down the line are uh, centralized around the Toulouse data set because they have, um, they have spiking in their experiments. So first we're looking at data set specific scenario where 
you're given the data from the A literature and you're trying to predict the um, uh, predict the Toulouse experiment. And under uh, the experiment specific scenario, you get um, the rest of the experiments in the Toulouse data set and you're trying to predict one of the experiment from that Toulouse data set. And the hybrid basically combines the previous two scenarios. So you get both global and Toulouse um, data and you're trying to predict the experiment from the Toulouse data set. And here we see that you really need um, experiment specific information for these type of modeling to work well. And uh, if you're looking at the, the hybrid scenario, you can see it performed slightly worse than the experiment specific. And uh, uh, our best guess is that um, these global data set is not really uh, providing any value and instead is introducing some additional noise into your training data, which is why the hybrid performs slightly worse than the experiment specific. So next we look at uh, the importance of various feature in, um, in the optimally performing um, experiment specific model, which was um, actually boost. And here we see that um, the same two features um, emerge as the mutual information analysis. So, which tells us that uh, Amplion GC is really important feature in these type of prediction. Where do you know reads are really important because that's what we're trying to correct the bias for. So, um, next we're trying to incorporate um, the spiking construct into our modeling. So here is a realistic, I guess, simulation of uh, application of spiking. So um, under a realistic scenario, you wouldn't really get experiment specific information because it's less likely that uh, whatever experiment you're performing ha has been done before, unless you're replicating some type of prior study. So here we first just provide the model with global, um, with global samples and along with spiking in each uh, Toulouse experiment. And we're trying to predict for the non-spiking um, sample in the Toulouse uh, experiments. So under the global uh, approach, we treat all the spiking as just uh, any other sample in the global data set. So there's not really emphasis on the spiking. However, under the experiment specific uh, approach, um, we use a weighted loss function. So the, the model is penalized more for incorrect prediction on these spiking samples, and they're penalized less for uh, incorrect prediction on the global samples. Uh, we did this because um, theoretically, we are more confident in uh, these spikings being more indicative of your experimental dynamics than um, global samples from other literature. Uh, however, we see here that most of the modeling uh, doesn't really improve from the vanilla. The vanilla is um, basically without any modeling um, on the raw abundance. So you see that you, you see really uh, minimal improvement from the ones that actually um, uh, has any improvement in them. And this is consistent with the, with the previous experiment where we see that, um, where we see that you really need experiment specific um, information for these type of modeling to work. So next, uh, we thought of trying to rescue the performance of various models by actually adding experiment specific uh, uh, samples from this Toulouse data set. And basically trying to re repeat this um, experiment, but with Toulouse uh, specific data. And we see that it indeed uh, rescues the performance of our models and the trends are pretty similar to the granularity of stratification um, experiment. And from here on, we can summarize that um, uh, in any sort of uh, metabolic cleaning study in the future, it is uh, really helpful to, um, I guess, construct some type of um, model to correct for bias because we did show that this is a predictable um, task and indeed improves your um, um, the accuracy of your um, assigned taxons. So if the experiment specific data is provided, it's optimal to start with the XGBoost model. Otherwise, uh, uh, you would be better off starting with the EdaBoost model to get slight uh, improvement from the baseline. However, there are multiple questions that we 
um, that still remain to be answered. For example, one is um, global level prediction of these sort of uh, metabolic coding study too difficult simply due to um, the noises in the data. And um, whether we have figured out the best way to incorporate these spiking into our model, whether uh, weighted loss function was the way to go or perhaps there's more creative and innovative uh, approach. And um, the other question is, would it help to increase the number of spiking samples per experiment? Because currently we have um, 10 spiking per experiment. Uh, for comparison, you have above 3000 uh, taxon assigned per experiment. So perhaps these spikings are not powerful enough to um, uh, provide information about the experimental dynamics. And lastly, um, could we extract any sort of quantitative information from tag polymerase? Because currently um, the structural, I guess, characteristic of these tag polymerase remain business secret from um, all the biotech companies. So they don't really disclose any sort of structural information about these polymerase. And perhaps in the future, we could uh, quantify these characteristics. And lastly, I just wanna thank um, everyone for um, attending my talk. And also I wanna thank Professor uh, Rasmus Nielsen and uh, Professor uh, Rosemary Gillespie for the mentorship and guidance. And also thank uh, Pittsburgh Super Computing Center for providing the computational resources for this study. Thank you. Well done, uh, Jason. Unless the judges have any clarifying questions, we will sk skip to Cassandra to keep on time. You have a question, Lynn? Go ahead. Feel free to unmute. Gosh. Um, Jason, I enjoyed your talk. It's very interesting. And I may have missed it at the very beginning, still getting used to juggling all these forms I have to deal with. But what um, what ha what is this ultimately part of in the larger sense? If you were going to explain it to your family or somebody, how would you explain why you do this? Um, yeah. So um, recently, there's been a lot of... Um, um, studies on, for example, microbiome or your, yeah, so for example, your gut microbiome. And um, a lot of these study relies on the relative abundance of the microbes that are present in your, your gut. And um, a lot of time the study just take these um, as relative abundance of these uh, assigned taxon as uh, representation of what your, um, what the realistic microbiome is. However, um, we found that they're actually some biases and our modeling can actually correct for those bias to give a more uh, realistic representation of the of the environment. Thank you. Excellent job, Jason, and very clear presentation. Uh, we do not have time for questions because your presentation kind of encompassed the whole uh, uh, time slot, but we are happy to follow up in the chat. Welcome, Cassandra. Gendron, our next presenter presented her thesis. You have the floor for 10 minutes plus and minus a standard deviation. <laughs> Feel free, go ahead and welcome to your family. I saw a last name in the attendee list. So you have fan club in the house. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm Cassandra. Um, my thesis focused on investigating the effects of Batrachochytrium dendropatitis on neuron populations in the Cordillera Vulcanota. So Batrachochytrium dendropatitis, or BD, is a chytrid fungus that infects the keratinized layers of amphibian skin, often leading to death in highly infected individuals. So chytridium mycosis, the disease caused by BD, has been the cause of mass amphibian die-offs worldwide, and it continues to pose a major threat to amphibian biodiversity. So susceptibility to BD varies among host species, with a number of resistant amphibian species acting as reservoirs for the pathogen. So this figure from Scheele et al. shows that one, the pathogen is distributed globally, and two, that there is immense variation in the severity of population declines among different species. Another important note is that BD infection in tadpoles is typically non-lethal, as it can only infect their, their keratinized mouthparts since the skin on their body hasn't become fully keratinized. Our three species of interest in this study were Pleurodema marmoratum, Telmatobius marmoratus, and Renella spinulosa. These three species are some of the highest living anurans in the world, and P. marmoratum is the highest living frog species on record, having been recorded at up to 5,400 meters above sea level. 
This map shows our study site in the Cordillera Vilcanota, which is a mountain range located in the tropical Andes of southern Peru. So the points on the map indicate our sampling locations, with black circles representing points at which we did not detect BD, and red triangles representing sites at which we did detect BD. The Cordillera Vilcanota is a very interesting study site because not only is it home to the highest living Anuran populations currently recorded, but this area has also been undergoing rapid deglaciation as a result of climatic warming, which is allowing the Anuran populations there to further expand their range upwards, as well as opening up an ecological corridor between watershed habitats to the north and south that had previously been isolated from each other. So we are very interested in learning more about how these factors affect the dynamics of VD and its effect on local inurin populations. So my study focused on three major questions. The first is if VD is present at a given site, does that affect the body condition of frogs at that site? The second, does elevation and or intensity of chytrid infection have an effect on body condition, specifically in P. marmoratum? If BD is present at a site, does that affect the population density of adult frogs at that site was the last question. So to answer these questions, we began by sampling. So at each sample site, individual frogs were collected and their skin swabbed or their mouth part swabbed for tadpoles. And supplementary data for each individual was also collected, including their age class, weight, length, and elevation. We then took the swabs back to the lab and extracted the DNA. And then we performed quantitative PCR on the swabs, amplifying the ITS1 region of the BD genome. And this served to quantify the amount of BD zoospores in each swab, which we then used as our metric for infection intensity. And then since we were interested in the body condition of the frogs, we used data collected on each frog's weight and length to calculate the scaled mass index or SMI, which is an indirect measure of body condition. So a lower SMI means a lower body condition means a less fit or healthy animal. So to preface our statistical analyses, we first designated sites as either BD positive or BD negative. So a site was designated as BD positive if at least one individual swabbed at that site was found by qPCR to have at least one BD zoospore in their swab. So to compare the SMIs of individuals at BD positive sites and BD negative sites to answer our first question, we performed 2A ANOVAs and general linear mixed models. And in all of our analyses, we incorporated site number or sampling site as a random effect in order to control for any variables at the site itself, such as food availability, climate conditions, land cover, etc., that may also be affecting SMI. And we had hypothesized that individuals at BD positive sites, since they are likely in contact with the pathogen, would have lower SMI than those at BD negative sites. However, for P. marmoratum, we found no significant differences in SMI between BD positive sites and BD negative sites for adults and tadpoles. For T. marmoratus, we found that adults at BD, plus, at BD positive sites generally did have lower SMI than at BD negative sites, but the difference was found not to be significant. However, this lack of significance is probably due to our small sample size. A lower SMI at BD positive sites fits with our hypothesis and it does make sense biologically since we know that T. marmoratus are susceptible to BD and have previously experienced declines. And then for tadpoles, despite a much larger sample size, we did find no significant differences in SMI. For our spinulosa, we found no significant differences in SMI for adults or tadpoles and although this doesn't fit with our hypothesis, it does make sense given that many believe R. spinulosa to be a reservoir species. To answer our next question regarding the effects of elevation and infection intensity on SMI, we constructed general linear mixed models with SMI as the response variable and infection intensity and elevation as possible fixed effects. And again, site number was incorporated as a random effect. And we found that the best fitting model as determined by AIC contained only site number as a random effect and contained neither of the fixed effects. This means that site number was the most significant determinant of SMI for P. marmoratum. The next best model as determined by AIC was that with infection intensity as the only fixed effect. So this model, although just marginally insignificant, shows a slightly negative relationship between SMI and infection intensity as expected. So as infection intensity increases, body condition tends to decrease. Another model that showed a significant effect was the model with the interactive effect of elevation and infection intensity 
as a predictor of SMI. So this plot has SMI on the y-axis, elevation in meters on the x-axis, and infection intensity is split into four bins, each with its own line on this graph. So the white is no infection, light yellow is low infection, orange is a mid-level infection, and right is a, red is a high infection. And this map uses the same color legend and shows us the mean infection intensity at each of our sample sites. So basically what this figure is showing us is that frogs with no BD generally are not affected in terms of body condition by high elevations. However, frogs with BD not only have generally worse body condition, but their body condition is more negatively affected by higher elevations than for uninfected individuals. In other words, the stresses of high elevation and high infection intensity are interacting to negatively impact a frog's body condition. And then to answer our last question regarding the effect of BD on population density, we again use general linear mixed models and we compared the proportion of adults sampled out of all individuals at BD positive sites versus BD negative sites. So because BD is often lethal for adults, we had expected to see a decrease in adult density at BD positive sites. However, contrary to this hypothesis in P. marmoratum, we found a significantly higher proportion of adults at BD positive sites. And in T. marmoratus and in R. spinulosa, we found no significant differences in the density of adults between BD positive and BD negative sites. So these results, although unexpected, may be indicating that the pathogen is only able to persist in populations with a high density of adults, which makes sense given what we know about infectious disease dynamics. So to summarize, I recapped my significant findings here, and I just wanted to emphasize two important take-home messages. The first being that rebounding populations are not necessarily more resistant to a given pathogen. So populations that have previously declined due to disease but are now rebounding, which is something that we see a lot in populations affected by BD, it is not necessarily true that this rebounding population will be more resistant to the pathogen. So it may not be that susceptible individuals are succumbing to the disease and leaving the more resistant individuals to proliferate, resulting in a more resistant population, but rather that the populations are declining to a level at which their density can no longer support the disease, and so less animals are dying and the population starts to grow again. But this means that the rebounding populations are not necessarily in the clear, and once they reach an acceptable density, the disease will begin to return and begin to reduce the population size again, so that these populations can never rebound to the density they were at prior to ever coming in contact with the pathogen. And this is actually corroborated by local testimonies from the Cordillera Volcanota. So although our, dense, our adult density analyses show what appear to be stable populations, locals do say that the populations of all three species are significantly lower than they were 10 or 20 years ago. And lastly, I wanted to emphasize that stressful changing environments, which may be the result of range expansions, climate change, habitat destruction, etc., ultimately increase the vulnerability of wildlife to disease. So the anthropogenic changes that we're seeing are not only affecting wildlife directly, but they're also opening up this whole cascade of many indirect effects that are multiplying the negative impacts on wildlife populations. And this is a major conservation concern, and it should always be kept in mind, mind when we're making any sort of conservation decisions. And I just wanted to say thank you to my research mentors, Emma, Dr. Gillespie, and Dr. Nielsen. And thank you so much for listening, and feel free to um, ask any questions. Do you have time for one question or okay. comments? Yes, Lynn. Well, I'll give somebody else a chance, but if nobody else wants to ask one, I'll ask one. I will then ask Emma to speak a little bit, but go ahead, Elaine. Me? Elaine? Oh, you want me to ask? I didn't hear. Okay, so, you know, I've heard of this fungus for a long time. I'm very committed to frogs and I really appreciated your talk. It was Thank really you. interesting, or toads, or, you know. Anyway, <laughs> um, I, I thought it was much worse than it seemed in your presentation. And I also don't know about the testimony because it's my understanding that frogs are kind of declining everywhere from all kinds of reasons. So I don't know if we can pin, to me, it would be hard to pinpoint this disease as the main cause of decline, even though the locals agree that it has declined. But, you know, I don't know. Um, what do you think? Do you, is it, is it something we can, should do a lot about? I don't know how it gets transmitted between these bodies of water 
Um, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, um, I think it's definitely something that we should be paying a lot of attention to. Um, I mean, it has been shown to like the spread of the disease has been increasing over the past few decades, which we're seeing like because of a lot of amphibian trade and a lot of human travel. Um, and so although there are other things that are affecting the frogs and causing population declines, I think BD is definitely a major player in that. And as I said, even if it's just a small part in the decline, it is adding onto the stress and making the declines that much worse. I guess I don't know how you fight it. Yeah, um, I'm not <laughs> super sure about that. I think there aren't really um, a ton of conclusive studies on that. It's like, it's very hard to kind of go into a wildlife population and eradicate a disease. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Emma, Yeah. you want to give some words of wisdom for your mentee? Yeah, I would like to say that it's been such a pleasure to work with Cassandra, um, not only this year during her thesis, but also last year. Um, and she's been incredibly meticulous and also incredibly, you know, um, self-driven, as I think so many of you um, honors thesis students have had to be throughout this last year when in-person interaction has been reduced so much. So uh, Cassandra essentially, you know, has taught herself how to code. Um, throughout the last year and a half in a really incredible way. And so I would just say that, um, you know, you are absolutely able to go out and conquer the world. And I know you have some things you really care about. Um, and uh, I know you can make those things happen. So that's it. Thank you. Where are you going next, Cassandra? Um, so I'm actually also very interested in sustainable fashion and I have my own sustainable fashion business and I'm like really interested in how we can use biology and biotechnology to um, make the fashion industry more sustainable. So I'm actually going to be going to fashion school in New York City for the next two years. Fantastic. Do keep in touch with Berkeley. Maybe we'll change of course. All, our attires, all our attires to be done. <laughs> um, welcome. Uh, Andriana, and welcome, Professor Wal Walsley. Sway. Sorry, I probably assassinated your last name. Um, welcome, Christine. Um, uh, uh, Andriana, you have the floor to present your thesis, and we're delighted to listen to you. Thank you. I hope you can all hear me all right. Um, hi, my name is Andriana. I'm a fourth year MEB major, but I did my honors um, research in a lab that is located in the UC Berkeley School of Optometry um, with chicks and their eyes. So my thesis project investigated the effects of daily short-term blue light exposure on eye growth and myopia in young chicks. And I was also particularly interested in whether the timing of this blue light exposure had any different effects. So some of you may be myopic or nearsighted. Um, this happens when your eye is too elongated and it makes it difficult for you to see things that are far away very clearly. Um, myopia is very common and can actually progress or get worse throughout one's life. So it's been very important to understand how myopia progression occurs and what we can do to prevent it from happening. So a lot of research has been done in chicks, which are a widely used model for myopia. Um, several studies have shown that eye growth can be influenced by the visual environment, which includes light exposure and the focus lenses. So the focus lenses, as you can see here on the right side, um, can alter the refractive state of the eye, um, depending on what type of lens you place in front of the eye. So in my experiment, I used a negative lens to elongate the eye and induce myopia in my chicks. Another driving concept in my research is the fact that we spend a lot of time in front of blue light emitting screens. Um, you may have heard of how blue light at night can disrupt our sleep-wake cycles, and you may have also noticed like an uptick in the use of blue light filtering features or blue light glasses. 
And a recent human subject study in 2018 found that um, young adults' um, eyes responded to daily blue light exposure in the morning. So the findings from that human subject study motivated me to look into whether the same effects could be replicated in chicks and whether timing the blue light exposure to occur in the evening would have any different effects. So my experiment consisted of three groups of chicks, um, the control, morning, and evening. Um, all the chicks received 12 hours of white light to ensure that they were kept under a diurnal light cycle, and they wore negative 10 diopter lenses over their right eye to induce myopia. Um, this, will be, this is a way for us to see whether the blue light exposure had any protective effects against myopia development. So when I present my results, the lens eye is a term that will be used to refer to the right eye, and the fellow eye is a term that will be used to refer to the uncovered left eye. So the control chicks were kept under normal laboratory lighting of approximately 74 lux, and the morning and evening groups were housed in a light and soundproof chamber um, separately so that they could receive 30 minutes of blue light a day. Um, this blue light source was from an LED light that emitted a wavelength of 461 nanometers. So the morning group received blue light the first thing in the morning when their white lights turned on, and the evening group received blue light at the end of their day, but right before the white lights turned off. The trials lasted for five days, which meant that the experimental chicks received four doses of blue light. I took the baseline and final measurements at the same time of day and in the same order of chicks. And these measurements included um, using streak retinoscopy to determine the amount of myopia and ultrasonography to measure the axial ocular dimensions. So in addition to the degree of myopia, I looked one of the ocular dimensions I looked into was the chorate, which you can see on the left-hand side. It's this dark band that's located behind the retina. And several studies have indicated that the thickness of the choroid seems to be sensitive to visual cues. I also measured the axial length. As you can see in the right-hand image, it's um, shown by this maroon arrow, as well as the vitreous chamber depth um, as shown by this bright red arrow. Um, this is particularly because vitreous chamber, change, chamber changes um, generally account for um, changes in the eye length. So moving on to the results, um, all of my results will be presented in the similar slide format with um, all the statistically significant differences listed below, as well as the figure on the left um, demonstrating the mean um, baseline and final values across the eyes and across the groups. Um, however, I will be focusing more on the figure on the right, which depicts the average refractive error changes across the groups. Um, in this slide, refractive error, um, the slide depicts um, the refractive error or the degree of myopia. Um, you can see here that the lens wearing eyes became more myopic or that their um, refractive error became more negative, which was expected. Although there are no significant differences across the groups for the lens wearing eyes, um, you can see here that the evening group seems to have um, more myopia than the control in the morning. In the fellow eye group, there actually was a significant difference between the evening um, refractive error and the morning refractive error in that the evening group had significantly more myopia. Um, these results um, suggest that blue light, evening blue light might increase myopia progression. You may also recall me telling you how myopic eyes are longer than normal and the optical axial length represents this. Um, we can see here that the lens wearing eyes tended to have longer optical axial lengths compared to the fell eyes. Um, and the final and the lens eye groups had a significant difference based on blue light presence. Um, we can also see here that this um, descending um, trend in the optical axial light changes do not exactly correlate with the trends that we observed in the previous slide with the refractive error changes. Um, you may also recall how I told you that um, the vitreous chamber um, contributes um, to the axial length. Um, however, we did not find any significant differences across the groups with, regarding vitreous chamber depth. Um, the changes observed in this um, right-hand figure also um, do not follow the same trend that we saw in the previous slides with the axial length and the refractive error. So the human subject study that inspired this focus, focus this experiment focused heavily on the choroid, and they observed significant choroidal thickening by the end of their extreme, 
by the end of their experiment. Um, this is interesting because myopic eyes typically have thinner choroids, whereas hyperopic eyes typically have thicker choroids. In my experiment, however, um, there are no significant differences across the groups um, in regards to bullet presence or timing, um, but you can see here that the choroidal thickness actually decreased in general for um, the majority of the groups and in particular for the morning lens wearing eyes. So there were two main questions um, that I sought to answer in my study. One, whether short-term blue light affects the eye growth or myopia of chick eyes and whether the timing of this exposure affects um, the results. Um, while the preliminary data that I had did not have many significant results that would have indicated that the presence or the timing had an effect, um, we did find an interesting trend that blue light in the evening seems to promote myopia development. Um, the intensity of the light also differed between the control and experimental groups, with the control group being more dim. Um, however, it is unlikely that the, this difference influenced the results because previous studies on bright light and chick eye development used upwards of 10,000 lux for their bright light conditions. Um, this is approximately 10 times brighter than the peak um, intensity in my experiment. So in this pilot project, there were definitely limitations, which included the small sample size, um, the noise in the data, and my proficiency with some of the subjective measurement techniques. But the limitations and the lack of significant findings does not necessarily mean that um, we shouldn't consider the timing of our exposures in future eye research. Um, Follow-up studies should definitely use larger sample sizes, manipulate the blue light intensity, address the timing and duration of the blue light exposure, and even take into account um, when they are taking the measurements. So this concludes my presentation on my honors research. I want to really thank um, Professor Wilset, um, Jose Torres, Judy Zhu, and Professor Harmon for their involvement in this project. I'm really thankful to have had the opportunity to conduct independent research, especially when a lot of labs on campus were affected by um, pandemic restrictions. And I hope you all um, learn a thing or two about ICE today. And thank you again for being here today. Well done, Andriana. Um, we have time for one question. I have I have a very uh, question that oh wait Christine do you have a question or a comment you you are muted let me unmute you wait I will leave my comment to the end so no. I won't steal the flow please please do so I, I just um, would like to say that given the very challenging conditions that we we're working under um, I think Andriana did a great job ultra patient um, with changing circumstances all the time. Totally, Thank you. <laughs> totally agreed. Was there anything that you found surprising? That was my, my, my only question um, uh, in, your, in your findings. Yeah, so the surprising aspect was how the um, choroidal thickness actually seemed to decrease across a lot of the groups I can switch back. Um, you can see here a lot of the choroidal thickness um, decreased across the groups over the course of this study, and it was very different from the human um, result from the human subject study. Um, there were definitely um, several differences between my study and the human subject study that included um, the way that they measured the choroidal thickness. They used a different imaging technique. Um, they also utilized a slightly longer trial duration, about a week of daily exposures, whereas mine was limited to about four days or of daily blue light exposure. Um, they also, the type of light they used was blue, but it was also of a, a higher wavelength. Uh, it was around, um, I believe 500 nanometers, whereas um, the light source, the blue light source for my experiment was 461 nanometers. Um, so there were definitely differences and this was something that did surprise me um, in regards to the previous study that inspired this. Excellent job. So what are your plans for the future, Andriana? 
Yeah, so um, I'm definitely interested in working with animals um, in the future. I was planning on taking a gap year um, before really figuring out um, what type of path I wanted um, in regards to animals. Very good. Well, I hope you consider Berkeley for grad studies if you ever want to come back. <laughs> oh, well, congratulations. Thank you, Christine, for attending the and uh, supporting um, our students and mentoring. And I will turn the floor now to Silverdew. And um, uh, are you around? Yes, you are. Silverdew, she, uh, you have the floor and you're going to present um, your work. I, I don't know if Mary is going to show up, but uh, if not, we'll send her the video, right? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Can you see and hear me? <laughs> Sounds good. Ooh. Yes. Um, so hi, everyone. This is Silverdu Shi. Um, I'm working in Professor Rudimuk lab in PMB department. So the topic uh, is um, the spray induced silencing of great power module genes to reduce power module growth. So um, power module have a great economic impact on California agriculture. They in fact a great variety of species. Um, Polymodule will reduce, will, will cause reduced photosynthesis on these plants, which will result in lower yields and off color. Um, and specific polymodule, in fact, specific types of plants. So to develop six methods, which I will introduce later, we turn to this uh, Raptopsis Glovinomyces or real time model system to optimize for our target model, which is the grape, a racified nectar model. Um, so grape produced in California fall into three main categories, wine grapes, table grapes, and raisin grapes. So these three categories make up an industry that contributed over 3.9 billion in California. And powder module is responsible for nearly 89% of pesticides use for grape growers in California. So uh, powder module is the most significant disease of grapes. If left untreated, it will cause uh, dramatic losses in yields and grape quality. Uh, and powder module can be controlled to a certain extent by fungicides, but there are also some caveats about the fungicides that are currently being used, such as the great cost of the fungicide application, and fungicides needs to be applied regularly to prevent the disease from emerging. And Pabrimadu resistant is right now developing against current fungicides. And there are also the environmental and health concerns due to the sulfur in the current fungicides. Um, so uh, innovative uh, new drugs to combat fungal infections are urgently needed. And so let me first introduce different stages of polymodule infection quickly. So polymodule fungi are obligate fungal biotropes, meaning that they can only grow on the living plant tissues and they obtain their nutrients from living cells of their host plants in order to complete their life cycles. So the life cycles begins with a spore landing on the leaf surface and within a few hours it germinates and they pierce through the plant cell wall to entire tissues and develop a specialized feeding structure called hostorium. And then they reproduce on the top of the plants and make this reproductive structures. So spray-induced gene silencing, or SIX, uh, is an emerging technology where we introduce uh, extrogenous double-stranded RNA by spraying directly on the plants to inhibit gene expression in target organisms. So SIX has been shown to be infected against diverse organisms, including fungi, in laboratory settings. And commercial products are being developed, but nothing is available yet. So how does this work? So this works by RNA interference, where we make double-stranded RNA product that spray and goes into the polymodule. 
and it is chopped up by this smaller RNAs and forms a complex, which then results in cleavage of messenger RNA. And then because the messenger RNA is cleaved, it cannot make protein. Thus inhibit the growth of polyimidule we're targeting. Um, so how do we do this? As I told you, we have to have the grip bind and the powder module. Uh, so we start with hard cutting um, and after and place them in the mist bench for six weeks. And then we plot them in this pots and um, place, the in, place them in greenhouse for eight weeks. And then they will be ready for infections. Um, so I have also been really involved in the maintenance of this, which includes constant pruning, applications of pesticides and fertilizers. And also remember that the polyimidule are obligate biotropes. So in order to maintain this polyimidule, we have to keep infecting the plants and keep them isolated. So we have the polyimidule for infections for our experiments. So once we have healthy plants and polyimidule, the first step of the experiments is to select gene targets and design double-stranded RNA. So we select genes based on, on comparative genomics, which we, we use the online database, JGI Microcosm. And we also have expression data that our lab has sequenced. And also we select based on the known uh, metabolic pathways and biological processes. And now we are ready for, once we have the target genes and RNAs, we have, now we are ready for the experiment. So for assessment for of double-stranded RNA impact on power module, we will first inoculate the plants or detach leaves with power module spores. And then we will spread the plants or the leaves with double-stranded RNAs. And after two weeks, uh, we will evaluate polymodule growth and reproductions by either uh, by visualization and counting the spores on the microscope. So here's my results. So this whole protocol is, uh, is being optimized by Jyoti Dr. Taneha um, using CYP51 against known genes that is required for protein module development. Um, so CYP51 is a key enzyme of the sterile biosynthesis pathway. Uh, it has already been shown that after spraying with double-stranded RNA targeting, targeting this CYP51, the plasma membrane integrity will be disturbed, resulting in leaky membrane and lead to the death of polyimidule. So C51 protein is a target for widely used fungicides. And, and we have also predicted these others, as you can see in our experiments. So there's in early development and um, the and involved in modification of plant processes have the most dramatic impacts in their spore production, resulting in like a great reduce in their spores produced. Um, so for this early development, these two genes that are expressed at early stage of infections and predict to have functions in supporting early development of polymodule. Um, um, for this uh, modification of plant processes, um, so these are predicted to go into the host plants and manipulate the host immune system and plant metabolism to support its own growth. So, so in general, six out of seven polymodule genes targeted via six resulted in significant reduction of polymodule infection of group Y. So our final goal is to develop a fun new fungicide to control polyimidule in group one using six technology via RNAi. So the new fungicide since only got RNA, which is a natural component of the environment. It is not toxic and can, can be readily degraded in the environment. This is also a biological and non-transgenic. And since we can design specific RNA fungicides, the, since the sequence is specific, 
uh, thus we are very limited of targets, even no of targets. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Spur, for funding my project and Professor Wildermuth for a uh, mentor. Uh, and let me thank uh, particularly my mentor, Dr. Taneha, for directly supervising me. Yes. And let me know if you guys have any questions. Congratulations. Excellent project and very well presented. We have time for one quick question before we turn to Chloe for closing a little bit the session before a break. I'll unmute you, Lynn, if you want. I can actually, but anyway. Um, Silverdew, thank you. That was really great. I enjoyed it. And I, I have lots of powdery mildew that I'm willing to donate for absolutely no charge if you'd like it. You know, you read the things and they say, put milk on it, put this on it, put that on it. It makes you crazy after a while. But I'm wondering, could this easily be incorporated into a product that I might find at Home Depot in a couple weeks, you know, someday, not in a couple weeks, but someday and how long, what else needs to be done before it could be marketed or incorporated into a product? Yeah, that's a good question. Thank you for your questions. So we're actually in the process of, um, I believe we just got the, um, um, the, oh, we're currently in the field research, the field trials we're working on. So we will get the results from that, um, like in a few months. Um, I'm also currently involved in that. And uh, we're also getting the, um, sorry, I forgot the name. Uh, so, uh, the, um, uh, the, the law that, that, uh -huh. yeah, yeah. So I forgot the, oh, the, I, yeah, you're getting approval from whatever does that. Yeah. So we are <laughs> on, on the process of that. So, yeah. So we have some genes we are, we, we're sure that we have. Uh, definitely have the results, have good results on. So yes, so it's in the process. Do you think, and do you, uh, do you think this technique will be useful for making products for a wider range of plant diseases like this? Yes, definitely. I believe there are also, uh, there are also other research uh, being involved in tomatoes that are, uh, I think they're also mm -hmm. like working on it for getting the getting the commercial products for that, also using this RNAi technology, the six technology. So yes, I think it is Thank coming. You. <laughs> Excellent job. <laughs> Thank you. Any plans for the next steps for your <laughs> career graduation? Yes, I'm actually going to UPenn for uh, another program. Um, Yes, so trying to uh, work to the, um, yeah, I'm in the pre-health path, so yes. So All still best trying. wishes. <laughs> Thank you so much. We're, welcome to the floor, Chloe, and uh, we are excited to, to listen to your um, uh, research. Yeah. Great. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Chloe, and today I'll be presenting on agroecology and traditional farming knowledge as an alternative to, pest to pesticides. I'd just like to start off by saying a huge thank you to Professor Bowles for his mentorship the last two semesters and his guidance through this whole process of remote research. Um, so first, I'll provide a little bit of background and motivations for my research. Uh, globally, we've seen an increase in population, food waste, and supply chain disruptions like the one we saw at the beginning of COVID last year. Um, in response, conventional production has increased mechanization and chemicalization, including the use of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. And at this point, annually, about $40 billion worth of pesticides are used. And this has led to a lot of consequences, including environmental health issues, such as the loss of biodiversity, groundwater contamination, soil damage, pollution, and increased pest resistance, all of which will have long-term negative effects on agriculture. Human health is also a major concern. Pesticide residue can be found on produce that's purchased at the grocery store by everyday consumers, 
Additionally, farm workers and their families are at higher risk of pesticide poisonings and other chronic health effects, which has a lot of implications for overall rural community health and development. So with this in mind, what can we do differently and how can agriculture be different? So when considering alternative management practices, we can turn to agroecology, which is a science practice and movement that can guide alternative management practices. As a science, it's the application of uh, ecological techniques to optimize naturally occurring interactions in agricultural landscapes. As a movement, it's a, uh, it's a socially conscious approach to food systems that also dives into issues of food sovereignty, sustainability, gender, land access, and resilience resiliency in addition to production. And finally, agroecology incorporates thousands of years of indigenous and traditional farming knowledge with current research into farming systems. The main component of agroecology that this research has focused on um, addresses the issue of pesticide use um, and is known as ecological pest management. Practices um, include habitat management and diversification to provide food and shelter resources for natural enemies of pests, um, crop management for greater innate resistance, as well as soil management for overall healthier crops that are, less, that are more resilient to pest damage. And so the overarching question of my research is how can agroecology and traditional farming knowledge serve as a framework for pesticide-free agriculture? There are two main components to my project to investigate this question. One is a literature review of three case studies of agroecological systems. And the other portion is a data analysis on the effects of management and landscape factors on pest populations in the Bay Area. The following case studies also serve to illustrate how biodiversity and ecological interactions can be optimized to pro provide natural pest control, as well as ecological, social, and economic benefits. So an example of a traditional farming system is the rice duck and rice fish system in China, where rice paddies have been a historically important farming system for nearly 2000 years. But there are also a number of rice pests that um, attack these crops, including the rice plant hopper, leaf hopper, and leaf roller, which are pictured on the left here. Uh, farmers have actually introduced ducks and fish into these rice systems as natural predators of these insects, which provides pest control without the use of pesticides. Um, additionally, their excretia serves as a source of nutrients, which replaces the need for synthetic fertilizers, and they can also be an important protein and income source for smallholder farmers and their communities. The increased, bio the increased habitat diversity also supports natural enemies, including dragonflies and frogs, all of which further enhance these biological pest control interactions. And these multiple benefits of increased biodiversity will be a recurring theme throughout this research. Another example of applied agroecology is the use of alyssum intercropping throughout the central coast of California in lettuce and broccoli crops. Alyssum is an insectary plant, which is a plant that attracts beneficial insects by providing nectar, pollen, and habitat resources, thereby enhancing biological control. Uh, forms of biological control can include predators such as surfeit fly larvae, um, the adult surfeit flies, which are pictured on the top right here, are attracted to floral resources and will lay their eggs on leaves near aphid colonies. And then adult parasitoid wasps are also attracted to floral resources. These wasps lay their eggs inside of insects pests where the larvae will develop inside until the adult wasp emerges, leaving the pest dead and the new wasp to go parasitize another pest. And just a little side note, since I've now made these insects sound really threatening and people get scared when I say I work with wasps, Here's a funny little snippet about surfeit flies from the quote, comprehensive guide to stripy yellow things, and a disclaimer that parasitoid wasps are tiny and completely harmless to people. And a final example of agroecological pest control is the push-pull system in sub-Saharan Africa, which takes advantage of naturally occurring plant compounds. The pull component, uh, such as napier grass, is planted around the field and emits chemicals that pulls pests away from the crops, Additionally, it can serve as a habitat for natural enemies and secretes a, st a sticky substance that can actually trap pests within it. And the push component, such as desmodium, is planted within the crop and emits chemicals that repels pests away from the crops and can also attract natural enemies for further biological control. And like other agroecological systems, push-pull systems um, provide benefits beyond just pest control. Other benefits can include high quality fodder for livestock, as well as nitrogen fixation and soil erosion control by desmodium.
As I mentioned in the introduction, agroecology extends far beyond just the ecology of agroecosystems, and it also has a lot of social and economic implications. Agroecology is rooted in traditional techniques such as the rice fish duck system and has developed through farmer to farmer and farmer scientist networks. These networks have allowed innovation in farming practices as well as the rise of movements surrounding food sovereignty and rural community building. These movements push to create fundamental structural change by placing power back into the hands of farmers, including landowning and decision-making rights. Economically, agroecology can also deliver a number of benefits for farmers. One main benefit is the reduced reliance on expensive chemical inputs like pesticides. Additionally, the biodiversity of these systems allows for increased sources of income, such as the fish, duck, and livestock fodder produced in the previous cases as well as higher valued crops that can be marketed as pesticide free. Overall, agroecology provides greater economic security and resilience for these farmers. And next, we'll move into an analysis of a data set collected as a part of ESPM PhD candidate Josh Arnold's project. The goal of this project was to understand how management and landscape factors impact aphid pest populations and to use the findings to collaborate with farmers to establish best practices. The field data was collected from urban farms and community gardens throughout the Bay Area in the 2018 and 2019 growing seasons. And some important pieces of data collected at each collection event were the plant species, leaf number as a proxy for plant size and age, aphid count and biodiversity measured as the number of unique crops within a transect. After some initial data visualization, we can see in the top right that aphid counts varied by site suggesting that localized, localized and regional solutions would be the most effective. And also in the bottom left, we see um, after plotting the aphid count data, we saw that the observed data in black closely followed the theoretical distributions for a negative binomial in red. With this, I went ahead and fit a generalized linear model with site as the random effect to account for those inherent differences between the sites that were unrelated to measured variables. And the coefficients in the model are shown here in this table. And there are significant relationships between aphid count and date, leaf number, and biodiversity indicated by the asterisks. And biodiversity will be the main variable of focus as we move on in this presentation. Um, to illustrate the negative relationship between biodiversity and aphid count, I created this partial regression plot, which you see in the bottom right-hand corner, to draw out um, the variable of interest, in this case, biodiversity, while still accounting for the other ones um, included in the model. And we can clearly see that as biodiversity increases, aphid counts decrease. From this analysis, we see that increased biodiversity is associated with decreased pest counts, which is consistent with a lot of these ecological pest management practices involving um, practices that increase biodiversity to improve the availability of food and shelter resources for natural enemies to restore those pest predator and pest parasite interactions. Uh, directions for future research include understanding specific interactions between pests, crops, and natural enemies to develop individual best practices. Also climate change poses a huge threat to production by potentially worsening pest damage. Uh, pesticide use also feeds into a loop of pollution and exacerbating climate change. So finding alternatives are, is essential. And finally, agroecology serves as a reminder of the broader implications of agriculture. The agroecosystem is a part of the natural environment, but it should also be socially, culturally, and economically conscious, since it has a lot of implications for farmers, their families, and their communities' livelihoods. With agroecology and traditional farming knowledge as a foundation, there are ways to transition away from the reliance on pesticides that will make the food system more ecologically and socially sound. And finally, again, a huge thank you to Professor Tim Bowles and Josh Arnold for being amazing research mentors. Thank you to Tiffany and Brian for their statistical support. And finally, thank you to everyone who makes the honors program possible and my CNR peers for always being such a welcoming community. Thank you all for listening and I can take any questions that y'all have. Well done, Chloe. I open the floor to questions and especially if Professor Joshua Arnold wants to say a couple of words, that would be great. Actually, there's a question from guest two. Uh, I wish I knew who that was, if you can identify yourself. Uh, congratulations and well done, Chloe. 
You've done a fantastic job on this project. And speaking of resilience, you bounced back so strongly from a disappointing set of challenges with your intercropping experiment in Sacramento. This is Tim Bowles. <laughs> your statistical analyses are very complex and you took them head on with excellent results. So you have a proud mentor here. Uh, thank you, Tim. I would I would like to chime in too about uh, about Chloe. I, I think she uh, shorted herself in the amount of um, hands-on activities that also went in on this research as well, uh, because she was in the field counting insects and uh, counting transects and uh, and did a significant amount of, of laboratory work identifying parasitoid wasps. So uh, Chloe has really got uh, the statistical skills and, uh, like Tim said, some some pretty complicated modeling, but uh, also did a lot of data collection analysis herself uh, and identification of parasites, which is not easy. Gosh. Any other questions? What are your plans now, Chloe? What are you up to? Yeah, so I'll be starting a part-time internship as a writer slash researcher at the Lexicon, which is like a science communication nonprofit in the food system space. Fantastic. Make sure you promote Tim's research <laughs> and your own and all of ours. <laughs> Will do. Tim is actually, he knows of this group. <laughs> Super well done, Chloe. Awesome thank presentation. You. Thank you. Well done. And thank you for coming um, and supporting our students, everybody that's attending. And I saw also a last name, uh, the same as Chloe. So shout out to family related fan club. Lynn has a question. Oh, I was trying to do the clapping hands. <laughs> but your presentation was pretty calm. So I, um, I guess I, 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 okay, on the aphids, how did you measure aphids? Was it aphids per plant, aphids per acre, aphids per, when you have a mixed crop, mixed yeah. crops, so we do you would, measure the aphids? Yeah, so we randomly sampled plants from a, a plot from the brassica family, so either kale, broccoli, collards, or tree collards. And okay. we would randomly select three leaves from that plant. And then with the clicker, we would go ahead and count our aphids. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that in a mixed crop, you had less, whatever your main crop was, wouldn't affect your measurements. Like, so yeah, we were looking at comparing like the, the biodiversity of the whole plot versus aphid counts. So if we saw more biodiversity oh, okay. from the model, we saw that there were fewer aphids. Okay, thanks. Thank you. We are off for a little break. Um, wait, there's a question from Marsha Ishi. Maybe she is an attendee. That's why she cannot talk. I was going to read it. Congratulations, Chloe, unless you can see it. Um, yeah, I can see that. Do you want to read it out loud and then respond? Sure. Um, it says, congrats, Chloe, your dedication, resilience, and insights are excellent. Here at PAN, we have been so fortunate to have Chloe as our science fellow all year. Besides her academic stellar, her stellar academic work, she has been a huge force and contributor to the PAN International Agroecology Workgroup's many projects and to our grassroots science department. Stay tuned for her science brief on the impacts of climate change on pests and natural enemies. Yeah, Marsha has also been a huge supporter this year and also geeks out with me about wasps. So that's fun too. <laughs> well, no one has to leave. Um, we are just going to um, take a break for the attendees and whoever needs a break. But um, if you want to just socialize, we are still in a Zoom meeting and you can chat with your mentors until 2.40, then we'll start again. <laughs> uh, what, what Chloe didn't say was that she had also started fairly pretty ambitious intercropping experiment in Sacramento that was you made valiant efforts to save from from ground squirrels yes yeah squirrels ate my homework essentially <laughs> so Blake um, is um, 
is Blake, sorry, Ben Drake is uh, giving you a feedback. I think it's to Chloe. Uh, ben, I'm going to try to make you a panelist so that you can actually talk. Let me see if I can do that. I just promoted you, so I think it may work. Thank you. Hi, Meta. Blake, if you, uh, Ben, if you want, just feel free to ask the question. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the, for the presentation. Um, I, I I would like to say that um, I found it extremely interesting that this um, uh, agroecology is not talked about more as an alternative to um, pesticides, big industrial complexes. And so I just want to make a comment that I found it really fascinating, um, especially given all the uh, monetary input into large industrial pesticides as opposed to agroecology. So thank you for uh, educating me. All right, 2.40, it's the start of our last three uh, presenters of the Honor Symposium for Spring 2021. Welcome to all the attendees. Um, we are delighted to welcome first Meta Nicholson and her mentor is in the house, Professor Robert Rue. And um, we are all years. You have the floor. Thank you so much, Sophia. Um, is my screen share working all right? Excellent, okay. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my symposium presentation. Um, my name is Meta Nicholson, and I am mentored by Dr. Robert Rue from the Geography and ESFM departments. Um, and before I begin, I'd like to extend my sincere thanks to Professor Rue for his guidance on this project, as well as Dr. Leah Carroll in, and the entire UC Berkeley Haas Scholars Program for making this work possible. And um, without further ado, here, here is my project titled Analyzing Methane Emissions from a Restored Bay Area Wetland. So first I'd like to begin with some definitions. You may be wondering what exactly is a wetland? Well, a wetland is an ecosystem in which water covers the soil for at least part of the year and the surface of the soil tends to be saturated as a result. Wetlands may be coastal such as estuaries, salt marshes and mangrove swamps. And they may also be situated farther inland, as is the case with wooded swamps, marshes, floodplains, and wet meadows. And a fun fact is that vernal pools can even be considered wetlands, since water does cover the soil of these ecosystems for at least part of the year. Um, wetlands are valued for their many ecosystem services. For example, they protect coastal areas from flooding, reduce heavy metals such as nitrogen and phosphorus in water, serve as biodiverse habitats for many species and act as a carbon sink by sequestering carbon dioxide. However, they're also one of the largest sources of methane emissions, accounting for about 32% of global methane emissions according to the Global Carbon Project, which analyzed methane emissions between the years 2008 and 2017. And this is actually the second largest source of methane that was considered in this study. Um, second only to emissions from agriculture. So why do wetlands emit so much methane? Wetlands, as I previously mentioned, are characterized by waterlogged soils, creating anaerobic conditions. And to cope with these conditions, microorganisms use a metabolic pathway that does not require oxygen. So this pathway leads to the production of methane. And some wetlands, particularly freshwater wetlands, emit enough methane to nearly offset the carbon sequestered in the form of CO2. Um, although there's been a lot of past research completed in this area, there's still many gaps in our knowledge. Firstly, few studies have looked at the long-term methane emissions from restored wetlands, and there also haven't been many long-term studies analyzing the effects of draining and reflooding processes that some wetland managers in the Bay Area have implemented. And finally, not many um, studies have looked into varying soil compositions and whether these variables correlate with methane emissions. So now we're left with this overarching question. How can we best manage restored freshwater wetlands to maximize carbon sequestration potential? So to address this question in my research, I first broke it down into three subcategories. First, do different wetland soil compositions contribute to variations in methane emissions? Second, 
How do managed flooding events implemented by wetland managers in the Bay Area affect methane and carbon dioxide emissions? And then finally, do the different vegetation compositions of restored wetlands affect level of methane emissions? For the purposes of this presentation, I'll be primarily focusing on this first question. So to address my research questions, I conducted field work at Sherman Wetland about one hour away from Berkeley, as you can see on the map. Sherman Wetland is a recently restored freshwater wetland that was for formerly used for agriculture. And this was the ideal site for my research due to its varied soil and vegetation composition, changing hydrology and status as a restored freshwater wetland. Um, and I'd also like to pause here to acknowledge the assistance I received from Professor Dennis Baldocki's lab and particularly Daphne Sutu um, for allowing me access to this site. So a little bit of background information on Sherman Island. Sherman Island was formerly an agricultural area, but was restored to its wetland state in 2015 and now contains 650 acres of restored wetlands, which provides improved habitat for wildlife and in addition provides a system where carbon sequestration, air quality and water quality impacts of restored wetlands can be analyzed. It's also hoped that the restoration of Sherman Islands could provide a blueprint for restoration of wetlands in the entire Delta region. So moving on to my methods, I collected nine soil cores from Sherman wetlands, um, two from a wet channel environment, four from what we call the moist channel environment, which did not have standing water covering the soil, and then three from a dry flat environment to compare these varying um, emissions from different wetland microenvironments. So I then took samples back to the lab to measure emissions from each soil core using the greenhouse gas analyzer, which is the instrument pictured here. Um, this instrument uses laser absorption technology to provide one concentration reading each second of both methane and CO2. So here's how it works. Um, the soil core is pictured here enclosed in an airtight mason jar. Um, the air that is emitted is then carried through this tubing and into the greenhouse gas analyzer, which will dis then display a concentration reading one time each second for methane and CO2. The air is then returned back into the mason jar, creating a closed system. So using these measurements, I can then calculate changes in concentration over time, which I use to calculate methane flux out of the cores. And when I say flux here, I am referring to the movement of gases, in this case methane, into or out of the soil core, and it is expressed in units of concentration per unit area per unit time. And just a quick side note here, um, I primarily wanted to look at methane, but I also included CO2 in my um, calculations because methane and CO2 tend to be produced in opposing circumstances in wetlands, and I wanted to see how this would play out um, in the different microenvironments I was looking at. So here are a brief summary of my results. Um, for methane fluxes, I averaged all um, emissions or the fluxes from cores that I um, ran in the incubation chamber that I showed earlier. Um, and I averaged them by environment. So here I have dry flat, moist channel and wet channel as my three environments. And as you can see here, the highest methane emissions by far came from the wet channel environment. And although there's a huge error bar here because of um, very different fluxes from the two different cores I collected from the same environment, um, these results were still significant despite the um, high degree of variation. And here are, are my results for carbon dioxide. Um, the highest carbon dioxide emissions came from cores collected from dry environments in contrast to what we saw on the previous slide. Um, and this again has a very high degree of variation, but was still um, si significantly different from the two other environments, the moist channel and the wet channel. So um, this is in contrast to what we saw on the previous slide when the wet channel was the highest producing methane environment. Um, which provides some support for the idea that these two gases are pro um, produced in different circumstances in wetlands. 
So I just wanted to provide a brief overview of um, what I'm looking at doing with this work in the future and what the lab will hopefully be doing as well in the future. Um, so if you think back to my research questions, you'll remember that I also wanted to test the impacts of flooding and draining practices at Sherman wetlands on methane and carbon dioxide fluxes. Um, the contrast between carbon dioxide and methane fluxes on the previous two slides indicated that there may be a sweet spot for the frequency and intensity of managed flooding events that would both maximize the storage of carbon dioxide and minimize methane emissions. So that future, res uh, so that future research could be done to test this in a controlled environment. Um, I'm currently working on constructing a fluctuating redox system as shown here. Um, that would allow the soil core to be flooded and drained in a controlled manner in the lab while being constantly monitored by the greenhouse gas analyzer, as well as both oxygen and carbon dioxide probes to, cons to confirm measurements and test for aerobicity. Um, and although this particular experiment has not yet been completed, I hope that future experiments will be able to use this design to further elucidate methane producing processes in um, freshwater wetland microenvironments. So to conclude, this research shows that both carbon dioxide and methane fluxes are moisture dependent and suggests that there may be an optimal point of soil saturation that will maximize the carbon sequestration capacity of a restored wetland such as Sherman wetland. I'm also hoping that this will allow future wetland restoration efforts to implement management practices, especially with regard to the frequency and intensity of managed flooding events that will maximize the benefits of wetlands. And finally, I'd like to end by emphasizing that although the, um, there's like, I've been talking about methane emissions from wetlands, um, the benefits of wetlands far outweigh the negatives of methane emissions, but we can further maximize the benefit by delving into this research topic further and see how periodic flooding could help further maximize the carbon sequestration potential of wetlands. And that is the conclusion of my presentation. Um, thank you so much to everyone for listening, and I would like to open it up for questions. Well done, Lynn. You have the floor, too. Unmute, please. I just need sort of a... Somebody's got to give a talk on research on devices that unmute you just when you start talking or something. Mm -hmm. AI, so AI. You don't constantly have to suffer. To yes. be AI. So, um, yeah, Meta, um, uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Really nice and very clear. And I'm, uh, I just read an article earlier in April from in the Economist where they make a pretty strong argument that methane should be an immediate priority, you know, for uh, combating climate change. Not because it's stronger. Everybody knows it's more has more warming effect than carbon, but because its behavior and the potentials for impact are greater with methane. Do you have any idea why that might be? Um, I don't know like the very tiny like molecular um, basis of this, but I believe methane has a long um, like residence time in the atmosphere or like relatively long. Um, and it also has, okay. yes. Um, and it has certain like radiative properties that um, make it like more like heat absorbent as a greenhouse gas. Um, yeah, I don't yeah, know if Professor Rue has any anything to add. It is definitely more powerful, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah. it's about 20 to 30 times more powerful. Yeah, okay, and then, well, it's in the April 3rd, April 9th issue, you might want to take a look at it. And they also mention that, and a lot of people when they're talking about, uh, you know, climate change, they exclude natural sources like wetlands, but of course, they're manipulated now, so they're kind of anthropogenic sometimes, right? Especially the ones you're talking about with the flooding and and um, but they said that um, about that fossil fuel extraction in causes almost as much methane emission as agriculture. Um, but I so I'm wondering if that was maybe a mistake or if there's I don't know. What do you think about that? Um, I think that fossil fuel the fossil fuel industry definitely contributes a very significant portion of methane to the atmosphere and like the natural gas um, industry as well. Um, yeah, I, 
I think that maybe that is an overlooked topic and maybe we should talk about that more. Um, especially like every, every time I talk about my research to someone, they're like, oh, cows produce methane, right? And that's like the first thing that every, um, everyone goes to immediately. So I think there does need to be more talk about the other sources of methane. Yeah, because they point out that 500 million people live off of livestock, you know, and nobody lives off of leaks. You know, <laughs> as far as I know, they're just waste. And so maybe that should be a target. Yeah, definitely. Rob, Rob, do you want to say some words of wisdom for uh, Meta, and then Meta can share where she's going next? Uh, you've, sorry, the words of wisdom regarding the methane or regarding the project and research overall? Um, well, uh, I'm not sure words of wisdom, but I, you know, the, the reducing methane is, is really important because it, it has a, a big bang for the buck. So it's a, it's the relatively shorter lifetime of the excess methane versus the really long time lifetime of excess CO2. It's, it's, it can be to immediate uh, results for global warming potential. But I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, Meta did a great job uh, in transitioning to the, uh, to the COVID-19, uh, um, situation, you know, we had intended on doing a lot of field work for her project, uh, and, and she was excited to do so. And we were, um, you know, and she was able to go out to the field to collect the, the measurements. So she really did a, an amazing job in transitioning uh, this research project from a field project to a lab project. So great job, Meta. Thank you so much. How can can we keep up with you? Where are you going next? Um, yeah, so I'm planning on taking, well, I was planning on going to um, grad school eventually, but um, this upcoming year, I'll be working at a lab in Stanford, um, working on actually methane emissions from households. So um, going on to do some very similar work. We'll forgive you that you're going to the farm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Remember, you're a bear, huh? <laughs> All right. Um, next, we have, we are delighted to open the floor to Alexis and um, go ahead. And you have a fan club also. And thank you, uh, Eileen, for being here and um, for everything you do. So go ahead. Awesome. So yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexis, and I'm a fourth year molecular environmental biology major. And so before I start, where are all my shy people at? Some of you might be dealing with a little anxiety now that things are going back to normal, and we are starting to interact with people again. As a fellow introvert myself, I definitely understand the struggles of socializing. Well, did you know that non-human animals also display anxiety-like behaviors, especially when confronted with new, unfamiliar individuals? In my talk today, I'll be discussing what affects social anxiety in juvenile female colonial tuco-tucos, and spoiler alert, it's the body weight. Okay. And so, unlike social anxiety disorder in humans, which can be detected by describing low self-esteem, inferiority, and other self-reported symptoms, we can only observe and measure indirect indication of anxiety in non-human animals. And so we represent the non-human animals with an unfamiliar individual and observe them while measuring any behavioral changes. And in previous studies conducted on rodents, anxiety has a substantial impact on their social interactions. And there have been further evidence that individuals, including those of the same species, displaying varying levels of anxiety. And so the next step is to wonder, what is the reason for this disparity? While tests have related anxiety to different genetic background, age, time of maternal separation, and sex have been done. However, little is known about how body size relates social anxiety experienced by rodents. And I believe that body size is important because size may influence social interactions, particularly agonistic interactions. And for those who are unfamiliar with the term, agonistic interaction refers to behavior that occurs during social conflict. And this include avoidance, aggressive, dominance, and submissive behaviors. And so according to preliminary data from Tuco Tucos, the more anxious a Tuco Tuco is, the more active it will be. And since body size is often linked to how successful an individual is at winning a fight, I predict that the smaller, lighter individual would display greater anxiety-like behavior as evidenced by increased activities when paired with a stranger. 
It might seem a little counterintuitive because at least with humans, when a person suffering from social anxiety meets a larger, unfamiliar individual, it's more likely that they might feel threatened and they'll avoid all contact. However, my prediction is based on the idea of them going like, hey girl, what's up? I'm okay, bye. What's up? What are you doing now? Oh, let me just back it up a little bit. Hello? And so yeah, since it's their first time meeting each other, it might be that the higher activity is just them trying to scope out the bigger individual due to their social anxiety. Also, we must be careful not to exhibit any anthropomorphic bias when examining an animal model. And so, I'm sure that by now you've seen those photos provided by my fantastic mentor, shout out to Professor Lacey. But before I go any further, let me introduce you guys to the adorable subjects of my studies. And so this small subterranean rodents of the genus Tenomus can be found from Peru to Terraria del Fuego. And um, most species are solitary, but the Tugo Tugo of my study called the Colonial Tugo Tugos, also known as Tenomus sociabilis, differ from other species in that it prefers to live in groups. And this is where they are found. And so a group often consists of several adult females and a single adult male. And occasionally, the adults may engage in aggressive interactions. And so now taking aggression into account, participation in social interaction now has a cause and benefit. And I believe that social inter and I believe that social interact, sorry, and I believe that social anxiety may be a key determinant of social interactions in this species. And so now I'll be telling you guys how I measure social anxiety in my study. And so anxiety disorder is hard to even diagnose in humans. You can imagine that I'm dealing with very limited behavioral repertoires in rodents. And of course, my tuko tukos can speak to me about what they're feeling. And so a variety of tests were established to measure anxiety in non-human animals. And the one which I use is a behavioral test called social interaction test. So in my study, I placed age match, unfamiliar, unrelated females together and monitored their behavior. And so I have one of the juvenile female first placed in a box before introducing another individual from a different litter. They were then left within an open container for 20 to 25 minutes while being filled. And so here's an example video that I've been sped up by four times and trimmed to give you guys a sneak peek as to what I've been watching. And so now with all this video footage, I went back, watched the video, transcribed it between the animals, ordered the between them at second interval. And so to record the distance from the video, I used the ruler against my screen and measured something like this. And then using the ratio of the distance on my ruler to the measurement of the container, I calculated each of the distances. And so a total number of 16 trials of different pairs were done. So now onto um, some of the variables which I measured to find any indication of anxiety-like behavior. First, we have the average distance between two go two go per trials. And so to calculate the average distance, I summed up all my 30 second interval distances, divided them by the number of intervals, and then repeated this for all 16 trials. As you can see, there are variations as to how far the individuals are related to each other. Then, based on the calculation of the maximum distance possible in the arena, as indicated by the red line, we see that no pairs were so repulsed by each other that they were at total opposite ends of the arena. Next up, we have the total number of contacts made by both Tuko Tukos. And I define contacts here as a direct contact between the individual, regardless of whether they are facing each other. And as you can see, the total number of contact initiated by both rodents changes across the trials. And finally, I also measured the percentage of time that the members of a pair spent in direct contact with each other. And so to do so, I first measured the total amount of time the pair was in contact and then divided it by the food duration of the trial. And like the previous graph, you can see that there are variation in how likely the females are to be in direct contact. So now that we have established that there are variation across trials with respect to distance and contact, let's examine some relationships. And so here are the difference in relate, relative frequency at which members initiate contact as shown in the figure on the top left and terminate contact across the 16 trials as shown in the figure on the bottom right. And so for initiation, a higher difference will indicate a stronger tendency for one individual to initiate more contact. And so we can see here that there is a greater tendency for one individual to initiate more in these few trials. And similarly for termination, a, difference, a higher difference indicate a bias for one individual to terminate more often. And once again, in these few trials, there was a bias for an individual to terminate more frequently. And so now with both analysis revealing similar variation, I wonder next if the relationship between frequency of contact initiated and contact terminated was significant. I conducted a linear regression test and hooray, yes, there was indeed a significant positive correlation between the two variables, which suggests that the same member in each pair tend to both begin and end contacts. 
And so to follow up on the difference between initiated initiation and termination of contact, I examined the weights of the tuco tucos. And here are the weights of all 32 tuco tucos in my study. And because the animals were age matched, body weights varied, but not to a huge degree. And so I calculated the difference in body weight and tried to see if there was a correlation between the total number of contact and the difference in body weight. Unfortunately, there was no significant relationship between the two variables. Therefore, we cannot say that a greater difference in body weight means more contact. I also then went on to um, examine if there was a relationship between the percentage of time spent together and the difference in body weight. And once again, it was a non-specific relationship. So we cannot say that a greater difference in body weight really, uh, means that there's a higher percentage of time they spent together with each other. And so I was really bummed out about like finding those statistically insignificant results. However, what happened next is where it gets interesting. So in the next step, I examined the relative frequency of initiating and terminating context related to the body weight. And in this graph, there are the weight data again, represented in another weight, so that you can see the difference in body weight more clearly. As now, you can see that the heavier, larger one is on top and the smaller, lighter one is on the bottom. And so next is to put the information obtained of the relative percentage of contact initiation and termination on this graph. And so the individuals who initiated a higher percentage of contact are circled red. And here are the 13 trials where we see an occurrence in the lighter individuals. And so using a binomial test, I was able to show that there was, there was a significant tendency for the smaller, lighter individual in each pair to initiate a higher percentage of contact. And so due to the positive correlation between percentage of contact initiated and terminated, I would also expect to see that the lighter individual would terminate more contact. And indeed, as you can see with the blue circles, there was also a significant tendency for the smaller, lighter individual in each pair to terminate interactions more often than expected. And here are the 12 trials where we see that. And one thing strange that some of you might already notice is that there isn't a blue circle in trial number nine. And that's actually because both members terminate contacts um, equally. And so now, all in all, my findings suggest that in colonial tuco tucos, the frequency of contact initiated and terminated with an unfamiliar conspecific vary according to body weight. And specifically, smaller individuals initiate and terminate more interactions, which suggests greater, uh, greater social anxiety. And so some potential future research could include examining other aspects of social anxiety in the colonial tuco tucos and relating it back to why social interactions amongst female vary. This may contribute to our understanding as to why some females disperse while others do not. Thank you all for listening. And before I take any questions, I would just like to show my gratitude for my mentor, Professor Lacey, for her guidance and patience with me, as well as for providing me with all the videos and data. I would also like to thank Professor Elias for being my faculty sponsor. Finally, I would also like to give a shout out to my friends and family for keeping me sane during these difficult times. And now that that's done, I'm open to any question with respect to my research. Well done, Alexis. I'm going to start with a question from the audience. Um, Alexis, why tucotucos? What? Why not study mice since they are also social animals? Yeah, that's actually a really excellent question. So before I answer that, I just give a background as to like how I got into um, this research. So I first um, started out as a freshman, uh, as a freshman taking a freshman seminar by Professor Lacey, and that's how I got to know Professor Lacey. And after taking the class with her and learning more about the Tuco Tucos, I decided to um, you know, be part of our lab. And then ever since being part of a lab, I became just interested in studying these social animals. And so partially why to go to go is because I just, I just find this, um, this animals really amazing and just so much, um, so little is known about them. So I just wanted to explore more in terms of like, um, this species directly instead of other, like more commonly studied species like mice. Eileen, do you want to ask a question or Lynn? Can't tell if Lynn's trying to unmute or not. I'll ask. So Alexis, what was most surprising to you in terms of all your findings? Like what's going to stand out or what are you going to take away as like the most amazing thing you found due to your work? Yeah, for sure. So yeah, like I mentioned in my presentation, I was um, initially thinking more of like the um, smaller, lighter one would, um, who is more anxious would actually not be 
you know, be so active. However, like um, thinking more about it and like just um, rethinking about it and making my um, hypothesis once again, the way it is right now, like it definitely surprised me to find such a relationship. And yeah, like also struggling with um, those non-significant data like kind of bummed me out. So when I found that there was a significant uh, relationship in terms of body weight and um, the social anxiety, it just really just like brought joy to me. Um, and yeah, I guess the major takeaway um, from this experience is just like um, conducting research is just such an amazing, um, like it's just such an amazing opportunity to be able to conduct conduct my own research and the whole like mythology and planning things out and everything has just been a really like great experience overall. Well, it sure showed you had fun and thank you for a very, very um, well delivered. And we, we all like were holding on to what you were ne telling us next. So thank you. Awesome, yeah. Any uh, plans for the future that you wanna share? Yeah, so I'm a intended pre-vet major. So hopefully, I mean, I'm going to take a gap year to prepare and apply for vet school. Um, but yeah, I'm also hoping to maybe investigate more in terms of like having a dual degree in like research as well as getting uh, the, the veterinary like uh, license. So yeah, like research has just been really fun for me. A very quick question that you may also answer very quickly, also from the audience. What did this project teach you about the research process? Oh yeah, this is a great question. Thank you for asking. So yeah, like research, um, I guess the first instance of really planning out our research has been back in bio, when I took biology, one of the intro to bio class where they forced us to write our own research paper. And then ever since then, like it's just been, um, a childhood dream of mine to just like do my own research and so um yeah forgive me if i'm going off course and i'm hoping i'm still answering the question but um yeah the biggest takeaway from just doing research and the whole like the whole procedure has just been like um it's okay to not know certain things and yeah That is an excellent okay. and Lynn you quick question because we have our last people so yeah, insignificant results too when I'm doing research. <laughs> it's so terrible. Do you think that um, with some different methods you might have been able to pick up more significant results? Yeah, that's a great point. Um, so yeah, with, with what I did that got me an insignificant insignificant result was I specifically looked at the difference in body weight and so since um, my two goals they are age match and so the difference in body weight is already expected to not vary that differently it might be interesting to look at maybe more like um, more difference in like body weight and seeing if like maybe um, having more samples might change the results but yeah all right Last but not least. Thank you. Least. That was great. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, oh, there's a comment from Eileen saying, I cheer wildly anytime Tukus do anything significant. <laughs> 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 All right. I would like to um, introduce our last speaker, our last honors. Um, you are the number eight, 822 honor from spring. 2021. Um, and then with the environmental science majors, that puts us at 840. So that's your honors number, Alexandra. Uh, Alec, I, I am totally probably butchering your name, so I apologize. You have the floor and we are delighted to hear your um, research. And I'm so happy that you have three of your mentors in the house. Thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, so the title of my honors thesis is Air Quality and Pulmonary Function in San Francisco Bay Area Women with and at Risk of HIV. And my three advisors that are here are Stephanie Holm, John Balms, and Erica Rosenblum. So some background and significance. Respiratory dysfunction is common in people living with HIV, even in the era of antiretroviral therapy and HIV has been shown to be independently associated with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, also known as COPD, and impaired diffusing capacity, which is the ability to transfer gas from air in the lung to red blood cells in lung blood vessels. And this is independent of smoking. 
And so women with HIV may be at greater risk because they tend to be socially marginalized and have high rates of smoking. And the specific aim of my thesis was to determine the association of neighborhood air quality with pulmonary function measured by spirometry, which is forced expiratory volume in one second, FEV1, so taking a deep breath in and then blowing out as fast as you can. Um, and then forced vital capacity, FVC, and diffusing capacity, DLCO, um, measurements in women with and at risk for HIV. And my hypothesis was that poor air quality will be associated with worse pulmonary function in women with and at risk for HIV. And so a bit about my methods. My study population was a group of women from the San Francisco Bay Area site of the decades long nationally representative prospective Max Wise combined cohort study, also known as MWCCS. And the full um, study contains both men and women with and at risk for HIV. And on the right, I have a figure that is a heat map of HIV prevalence and the MWCCS sites. So you can see that where there's more hotspots, there are max wise sites there. And so the study design of my project was a cross-sectional study of 184 San Francisco um, site women, 115 who were HIV positive and 69 who were HIV negative. And they participated in the MWCCS pulmonary function ancillary study that took place from April 2018 to November 2019. And so a bit more about my study design. The predictors that I used were monthly air quality fine particulate matter PM 2.5 data that came from a public data set that I got online. And then with that data, I categorized um, that into an annual mean PM 2.5 value in the year prior to when these women came in for their pulmonary function testing. And I chose to use PM 2.5 since there is, there is literature that associates um, adverse health outcomes with increased PM 2.5. And PM 2.5 refers to the fact that these fine particles are two and a half microns. And for reference, the human, a human hair is 60 microns. And so these are very, very small um, particles. And then the covariates that I uh, had were age, race, ethnicity, education from census tract data, height, pack years of smoking, and HIV status. And the outcomes I was looking at was um, pre-bronchodilator FEV1, FVC, and FEV1 to FVC ratio, along with DLCO, the diffusing capacity I mentioned earlier. And then the analysis I did was in R, and I did multivariable linear regression to examine the association of annual mean PM2.5 with pulmonary function. And so um, some characteristics about my specific um, data set was that the median age of these women was 51 years and over 50% are African American, about 40% reported being current smokers, and the majority of women are in the overweight to obese range based off of their BMI. And two thirds are HIV positive, which, is, which matches with the MWCCS study design. And so here are some of my results. I have four scatter plots here showing annual mean PM 2.5 versus pre-bronchodilator FEV1, FVC, FEV1 to FVC ratio, and also DLCO with the whole cohort. And so I found that there was little correlation of annual mean PM 2.5 and lung function measures. And then the adjusted mean estimates and standard errors are shown in red and show that there is little association of increasing annual mean PM 2.5 with worse lung function. And I showed the whole cohort because when I did um, the HIV only subset, I also found similar findings, little correlation between PM 2.5 and lung function measures. And here I have a histogram showing annual mean PM 2.5 exposure in the whole cohort. And so you can see that there's little variability in annual mean PM 2.5 in the San Francisco Bay Area cohort. And the peak PM 2.5 appears to be around 11, and that's lower than national average and possibly California state averages. And 
for reference, the national standard PM 2.5 levels, they were at 15 for a number of years. And then as air quality has gotten better, it's gone down to 12. And in the Bay Area, um, the exposure that these women had is even lower than 12. And so my summary, the annual mean PM 2.5 air quality matched to the participants' residential address was not associated with decreased lung function, um, which was spirometry and diffusing capacity in women living with and at risk for HIV in the Bay Area. And reasons for our findings could include that we had a small sample of only 184 women, um, lack of variation in air quality, and the Bay, a Bay Area air quality could be better than the national average. And so a future study direction would be to examine longitudinal changes in lung function and also include more site locations because there is um, pulmonary data for various sites across the country. And so that would help increase the sample size and include greater variation of air quality. And so thank you very much. And I'd like to acknowledge my amazing advisors, John Balms, Stephanie Holm, and Erica Rosenblum. And also a big thank you to all of the participants who have been a part of this study for years. All right, um, any questions from the audience, from the mentors, feel free to chip in. Well done, Alexandra. Thank you. First of all, awesome job. So excited to see all of this coming to fruition after all of your hard work. I'm curious to hear a little bit about what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced bringing this to where you got it? Um, I think a challenge and one thing that I learned more about the research process was learning how to submit a concept sheet and like how to get data since this is such a large national cohort, having to communicate and figure out like data use agreements and um, how to like get and use this data, especially since there is so much personal like health um, information with the data. So I would say that was, that was a challenge. That was something that I had not learned before. Um, and so that was, that was new for me. Um, yeah. <laughs> if I could say something, um, John Balms, um, first of all, excellent job. Alexandra. Um, one thing you did learn uh, from Stephanie uh, Holmes' mentorship was uh, how to do some programming in R. That's an important skill. Uh, yes. And, you know, even though you had null findings for the reasons you mentioned, you know, lack of air pollution, uh, variability across the Bay Area and a small sample size, um, the uh, Folks that are uh, involved in the the project, the, the overall study, have spoken to Stephanie and me about uh, a, a larger study, kind of climate change and outcomes. But specifically, we were talking about trying to do that future study that you described, the PM 2.5 uh, exposure and lung function across all the study sites. Um, so, you know, you've you've done some important preliminary work that you know may lead to uh, a grant application and, you know, maybe you can participate in that future study. Picky, 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 Sophia. She always wants me to unmute. Um, Alexandra, I, um, I'm wondering how the, the measures of air quality that you used, and if I miss this, I'm sorry, take into account things like these huge pulses of horrible air we get in the Bay Area. You know, we go along, today it's crystal clear and gorgeous, but then last October I really got pretty fed up with the air quality. Um, are they sort of averaged in in this data or, or what happens? This kind of makes for an average? Yeah, I believe it was all averaged together. I know because I originally, my idea was to look more with wildfires since the wildfires, of course, would affect the air quality. But then 
when it came down to, okay, what is the actual data that I can get from online? Like what I used, I wouldn't be able to tell how much of that like poor air quality is coming from say pollution from traffic or like wildfires. And so that's how it turned into more just general PM 2.5 air quality. Yeah, I was just wondering how that, if I just was wondering if it was an average or something else. So that, right. yeah. When they say the wildfires take years off your life, I mean, <laughs> maybe well, you it's know, true. The other issue is that we didn't have lung function every day. You know, we only yeah. have lung function, oh, yeah. you know, at one time for this, this group. So we couldn't associate a wildfire ex, uh, exposure with the lung function. Well, you might miss some too. I was just wondering how the pulse phenomena get caught in the data. And so you, you might miss some because if it may only last three days at a time, right? So that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful job, mm -hmm. Alexandra. Do you wanna um, share some of your new plans post-graduation? Um, yeah, post-graduation, thanks to Stephanie and John who, forwarded me the information about an internship. I'm going to be doing an environmental health sciences focused internship over the summer. And then in the fall and spring, I'm hoping to go abroad to Europe to go to cooking school. <laughs> yeah, kind of unrelated to air quality, I guess, but yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. There's lots of cooking related air pollution. We can talk about it, Alexandra. Oh, that's true, that's true. <laughs> I guess learning to cook, but. <laughs> Wonderful. Make sure you go to Condo Cordon Bleu. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Again, congratulations. Thank you all for attending the 2021 Spring Honors uh, Symposium in the Rouser College of Natural Resources. Uh, we are so proud of you, our students always and very um, excited to always see your research and especially your creativity during this year. Um, thank you for bearing with the Zoom presentation and being a sports about it. Thank you to Anna for putting this all together. Sorry, I have to speak louder because the kid is doing something else in the same room. Um, thank you, Anna, for uh, your continuous support for this program. And uh, the students can all attest how much you bring to all of this. And again, take care of yourselves. Um, keep uh, motivating, get a vaccine if you haven't already, lots of drop in anywhere and um, go bears. <laughs>